Good afternoon. Am I mic'd? I have a sister who uh, spent her career as a, I don't know whether I'm mic'd or not. If I get closer, no. Is that better? I don't think that I'm mic'd. Good, good afternoon, everyone. And now, uh, thanks to whoever turned my volume up. Um, uh, we agreed that we would start right on time. I'm sure people will continue to drift in. I'm Mary Bassett. I direct the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights, uh, which houses the Roma program. Uh, this afternoon has been the work of many people in collaboration uh, with entities within Harvard, across Harvard, and beyond. Uh, and I uh, am very appreciative for all of our co-sponsors. Uh, uh, the FXB Center is dedicated to the idea uh, that everyone has the right to health and that our ability to achieve health is affected by our ability to obtain our rights, that people who don't have rights have difficulty surviving and being healthy, and people who are not healthy can't fully enjoy their rights. Uh, we are now around for over 30 years, and we're here uh, because of a bequest by our founder and benefactor, Albina de Bois-Rouvray, who named our center, which stands for Francois Xavier Bagneau, for her son, who died tragically at the age of just 24. So I uh, want to acknowledge the, how unusual it is to have this kind of space that allows us to tackle difficult topics, like the question of confronting state violence. We're in April. It's hard to believe, but it was 30 years ago that Rwanda experienced an orgy of violence that was triggered by the dehumanizing remarks aimed at the Tutsi minority population that resulted in the death of probably about a million uh, Tutsis and moderate Hutus in Rwanda. It's been four years since the death of George Floyd. Um, who died at the end of May uh, in 2020, and whose death videotaped on camera at the hands of police, agent of the state, uh, resulted in a global response to the enduring racial hierarchy in the United States that has permitted so much violence. It's unfortunate for me to say that the number of people who die as a result of police encounters has continued to rise every year in the United States. Um, so that the number that died in 2023 now surpasses 1,300. It used to run about 1,000 a year. In 2023, there were only 13 days in the entire year where nobody died in the United States as a result of a police encounter, 13 out of 365. So I say that to point out that the issue of state violence is a global one and includes the United States. But there's nowhere that's suffering more at the moment uh, than the territory of Gaza and the people of Sudan, where the levels of humanitarian, um, uh, the assault on people's ability to live um, has been quite staggering. So I'm sure that all of these issues will be referenced in the course of the day, but my job um, I'm going to break with tradition, uh, is uh, I want to be sure to thank everybody at FXB. We usually do that at the very end, uh, but I want to make sure that I thank them all at the very beginning because people may come and go. We might have a, a, a core audience right now. Uh, so let me begin by acknowledging Professor Jackie Baba, who, gosh, um, it's been about 10, is it 10 years? Well, this is the 12th annual Roma Conference, so it's more than 10 years ago, um, had, uh, had the perspicacity to decide to cultivate um, the Roma program. Everybody needs an advocate, a uh, mentor, uh, and, she, and she has put out her wings to protect this program. So 
she has uh, enabled the emergence of a fantastic scholar activist in Magda Mataki, whom all of you know. And working with her, I'm gonna run through a whole list of you. Some of you are here, others of you are not. And that includes um, Naringa, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mangle your last name, Tuma, Tuma Nati, um, Keisha Bush, who I haven't seen in the room yet, uh, but is our director of communication, so there she is. Um, then I'm McCready, Claire O'Donnell Street, Gerlinda Munshi, Vlad Ver Vepriev, you can see that, um, and, and Amy uh, Takanama. So you can see that it takes a lot of people to make a day like today happen, and I'd like to ask that you give all of them a round of applause. <laughs> and then it falls to me uh, to make a disclaimer, which I hope will cover the entire program. We have gathered and put together an incredible program for the rest of the day. The people who are participating are here because of their scholarship, their skills, their experience, and their commitment. And none of the people who will be speaking with you today represent the views of Harvard University. So with that, let me turn it over to the next speaker. Uh, uh, who will say a few words of welcome. Uh, you know, uh, Black History Month just ended in February, uh, and this year it focused on the importance of the arts to liberation. Please uh, come up to the podium to make some remarks. Who's, next? Who's going next? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's why I was looking at you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, I hope you can hear me all right. Thank you for this warm welcome, and uh, let me first express, oh, you put the mic down, thank you, I'm vertically challenged. Let me first express my gratitude to Magda and the entire team here at the FXB Center for giving me this opportunity to just share a few words with you uh, prior to the conference begin. My name is Ralf Yusuf Gavlik. I am a pr professor at Boston College and a composer the composer of the oratorio, which is going to receive one of his two years premieres tomorrow evening at Boston College. Olungu Drom, or The Long Road, sets the words of 13 different Romani authors and poets worldwide in 10 different languages. These languages include English, German, Italian, French, Serbian, Macedonian, Spanish, and three Romanist dialects. Olungu Drom is a road of remembrance and a road of hope. And it is a road which for the first time allows the Roma themselves to speak. Not being spoken about, but by me setting their text, they speak from within, not from without. The cast who you'll be hearing tomorrow are the same performers who are featured on the recording of Olungu Drom, recently released just in March on DECA. For those of you who may not know, for a composer and for performers, this is the Mount Everest. There really is nothing higher, especially for an international label such as DECA Universal, to put its weight behind a work on an ethnic minority which generally has been sidelined if we are lucky or just simply ignored. I'd like to actually use this opportunity if I could. Magda, if you could please come up here. The CDs just arrived a few days ago and I actually count down <laughs> which CDs I've given. This is the sixth copy. This is yours. Aww. Magda, Magda. <laughs> Just on a personal note, the work was written in 2019, and the first year was just gathering texts. Magda was absolutely instrumental. Please, let me just emphasize this, a work does not write itself. Texts are not just found, and Magda in helping me locate poets, authors, opportunities to find these texts. Thank you, from the bottom of my heart. Olungu Drom is organized in a 
tripartite narrative that tracks the story of the Roma, Ascent, Nadir, and Vista. I do hope you can all make it tomorrow to this concert, um, and I actually apologize ahead of time, right after I finish my few words here, I'm heading out to Worcester, to the College of the Holy Cross, where one of the premieres is taking, uh, is taking place already. I'd like to close with a very personal connection. Olungu Drom is also my personal Drom. I was born in 1969 in Germany, and I was adopted four months after my birth into a German family. And it was not until 2018, after about a decade-long journey, odyssey of discovery, that I met my biological mother after 49 years for the first time. At that time, I also learned that I was ethnically Roma, which compelled me to write this work. The recording, but especially these two performances, are a tribute to Sinti and Roma worldwide, but particularly also on a very personal level, it's a tribute to my two mothers who just recently actually passed within a month of each other. One who gave me life, and the other who gave me life. I hope to see you tomorrow, um, if at all possible. If you can't, which I completely understand, please join us in Ulungu Drom by listening to a recording at some point. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keisha Bush. I am the head of communications at FXB, um, and I work with Magda um, and the entire team to bring the Roma Conference to you, and I'm your MC again this year. Um, uh, just sort of real quick, I would like to add how today's conference um, our theme of violence and state violence uh, resonates with the acknowledgement of stolen ancestral lands um, from the indigenous people of the Americas and specifically the people, the Massachusetts people. Um, also, it's in line with the forced enslavement of African people and the legacy of violence, injustice, and marginalization of people not only in the Americas, but globally. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I'm not sure if we went over this, but we have two panels today with a Q&A that will follow each panel um, with a small 15 minute coffee break in between. Um, then we will have a book talk and we will conclude with the reception, which is right outside the doors to your right. Um, next, I would like to introduce Naringa, who will give us our framing for the conference. Naringa is a PhD candidate at SOAS, University of London, and a visiting Fulbright Schumann Fellow with the Roma program here at FXB. Um, her research delves into the role of youth participation in advancing climate justice. In addition, Naringa is the Director of Human Humanity Consulting and a co-founder of the Erasmus and Global Partnerships Collective, which engages in dialogues, youth civic society in Southeast Asia, Europe, and North Africa. Please um, welcome <laughs> Naringa. Good afternoon and happy International Roma Day. Um, this year, April 8th, marks the 53rd anniversary of the First World Roma Congress, um, a historic occasion when the Roma Day and the anthem and the flag have been created. Some have turned this anniversary into the occasion to celebrate the rich Roma heritage. Others, including activists and academics, took this as an opportunity to address the continuous racism faced by the Roma people, as well as 
as a chance to take stock and evaluate the progress in the socioeconomic, cultural, and uh, political areas. This year, we mark the International Roma Day with the 12th annual Harvard Roma Conference. Um, and we will use this as an opportunity to reflect on the racialized history of Roma people and obstacles to Roma's health and well-being, setting this in a broader context of global injustices. Although this conference is hosted by an alliance of universities, we have to say that multiple experts here wear several hats. We have academics, practitioners, policy entrepreneurs, and even musicians here. Um, and together we hope to co-create a day which is rooted in acknowledgement, mourning, but also in coming together and building a sense of solidarity and hope. And we hope you find the enrichment in the discussions that are to follow. So this year, as you know, the conference is not only intersectional, uh, but also interdisciplinary and global in nature. Um, and it will interrogate the manifestation of state violence experienced by racialized and marginalized communities around the globe. We will start with a keynote panel, uh, which will question the hierarchies of human lives, some being grievable and some being ungrievable. Um, it will also interrogate the manifestation of state violence. Um, during the first panel, we will explore uh, and hear further case studies. This panel will unpack both specific um, and similar experiences of oppression <laughs> faced by Roma, Dalit, Black, and Palestinian people. And the panel will also address the enduring racial logics of whiteness, gadgetness, and caseism. The second panel will add a lens of cases of health um, and death. It will zoom into how institutions um, and states perpetuate violence and uh, mitigate it. Um, and it will also offer an intersectional lens, um, such as intersections between state violence and environmental racism, as well as reproductive injustices and health and supporting health disparities. Despite the heaviness of issues tackled today, um, we also hope to build a sense of solidarity and a call to action and building international alliances to hopefully transform the systems of oppression, even though this is a tall ask. Um, finally, uh, on behalf of the Roma program, we wish to thank the FXB Center for the continuous support and hosting the annual Roma conference, this time for the 12th year. So it's quite an occasion. Also the organizing team, uh, Danai, Claire, Keisha, Amy, Gerlinde, and Vlad, uh, and all of the partners of the conference who have allowed different pieces of the event to come together. And finally, we wish to express our heartfelt thank you for all of you, those experts here in the room, as well as those who are joining us online, for sharing us your time and your energy in exploring these highly important and um, critical issues. We hope you enjoy the program today. So I'm an interesting person where I need my glasses to see you, <laughs> but I can't read with my glasses on. <laughs> so I absolutely apologize because I could not read my little list here, my agenda. Um, so I would like to, let's see, I know how to do this. Introduce Mohammed Zaman. All right. And then I'm hitting. Play? Is it playing for me? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mohammed Zaman. I am a professor of biomedical engineering and global health at Boston University and also serve as a director of Center on Forced Displacement at the university. Uh, first of all, welcome to everyone at the 12th annual Roma conference. Um, and my sincere apologies that I could not be there in person. 
both as a researcher and also as a director of the center. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of this conference and the conversation. Um, in my own research, the question of state violence, particularly um, associated with stateless communities, um, the Bihari communities in Bangladesh, the ethnic Bengali communities in Pakistan and elsewhere is a major topic of interest. Um, and, and that violence manifests itself in myriad ways. And there's very little attention that is paid to it. Of course, there are important and urgent questions that need to be asked about the challenges in Gaza or in Sudan or elsewhere. But there are also long-standing challenges that often do not get attention at the Roma community in Europe, uh, the Bengalis in Pakistan and elsewhere. And I'm glad that this conference is really addressing that issue head on. As part of our central force displacement, this issue is absolutely important. When we talk about forced displacement, oftentimes our attention is limited to refugees and internally displaced communities. And of course, they are of tremendous, tremendous importance. But stateless communities or state violence is often ignored. So we are very, very excited that Magda and colleagues are really sort of uh, pushing our conversation and discussion and bringing such an extraordinary group of scholars, uh, researchers, practitioners, students and postdocs to this conference. We are delighted to be a part of this. We are honored to really support it in a very, very small way. But we are really excited about the conversation that will happen and look forward to continuing that conversation in many ways and providing whatever support we can. Once again, thank you for coming and my sincere apologies that I'm not there in person. With my very best wishes, I hope you have a wonderful, rich, productive, and engaging meeting. Wonderful, thank you. So, it is my pleasure, let's see. All right, glasses off. It is my pleasure to introduce Magda Matache. She is the chair of this conference and also the director of the Roman program at FXB at Harvard University. Um, she is also a member of the O'Neill Lancet Commission on Racism, Structural Discrimination, and Global Health. Dr. Machache's research focuses on the manifestations and impacts of racism and other systems of oppression in different geographical and political contexts. Please um, join me and welcoming Magda to the podium. Oops. Lacho Dives Romalen, Bachtalo Romale Dives. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy International Roma Day. Um, I would like to, to echo Mary's and Naringa's uh, sentiments and uh, expand a warm welcome to each and every one of you to, to our conference. As we convene for our 12th Roma conference at Harvard, I think it's important to underline that traditionally, this conference has uh, had a dual focus. First, Professor Jacqueline Baba and I have tried to shed light on, on the struggles of the Roma people uh, across the world, but also to co-center Roma voices into global conversation, varied uh, disciplines, and also uh, social movements. And second, we have strived to foster solidarity with other oppressed and, and racialized groups uh, acknowledging and recognizing that there is an interrelated, interconnected nature in our fight against uh, oppression and in our fight against systems uh, of oppression. This year, our conference uh, takes place uh, in a very painful and difficult moment for the world, um, marked by global crisis, wars, and, and genocide. And I think it is in, in light of these circumstances that we have decided and chosen to broaden once again the scope of our Roma conference and um, have a conversation about state violence and injustices uh, everywhere. During the conceptualization of this conference, 
as we are considering um, how to use various methods and invite various people to delve into and also uh, uplift and uphold the principles of uh, solidarity, love for humanity, and parhesia, as Professor West has long taught us. Um, our, uh, our team has immediately thought about Professor West. So, and I think that it, it is not surprising to anyone here in the room because for a long time, Professor West has uh, pushed this idea of solidarity and love for humanity and has helped us and reminded us, reminded us that these are principles that we, we should all be guided by. Um, Therefore, Cornel West will kick uh, off this conversation and our dialogue concerning the prevalence and continuity of man-made hierarchies, and I say intentionally man-made, <laughs> maybe white man-made <laughs> uh, uh, hierarchies of lives, uh, but also the line drawn between lives deemed ungrievable and lives deemed grievable through the means of power through the, the, the ways in which power uh, functions in, in the world, and also to see the role of these uh, human hierarchies uh, in what Michel Foucault calls the, the murderous function uh, of the state. So Professor West, um, you have long been a moral compass for me, for my friend Suraj Yende, uh, and for countless people here in the room and across the world. So I'm so uh, deeply grateful to you and thrilled to welcome you back at Harvard, even if only for one day. <laughs> I will, uh, with, with your permission, I will not read your bio. <laughs> uh, as you truly need no introduction. But uh, I would like to offer a few thoughts and feelings about you, uh, ideas seen from the, from the eyes and the lenses of a Roma scholar who has been lucky enough to benefit from your generous support, trust, and, uh, and kindness. So I met Professor West maybe seven or eight years ago when he was teaching this uh, highly popular and also very important course at Harvard titled Introduction to African American Studies. The course was primarily designed for, um, for Harvard undergrads. But upon entering that large classroom in the Emerson Building in Harvard Yard, one would encounter not only hundreds of college students and renowned, uh, renowned uh, Harvard figures, but also a consistent group of 10 or 15 individuals, including myself and Suraj Yende, um, who have uh, been auditing his course for maybe year after year. So we had become the familiar faces, or if you want, the, the usual suspects in, uh, in, in that room. And this was the place where we learned the value of solidarity. This was the place where we built friendships, not only between individuals, but more so between struggles and more so between social movements. So Professor West, I must say that it's such a bless for your students at the Union Theological Seminary to have you there, and it's a bless to have you here today. Uh, so with that, I'll pass the floor to you. You have about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll uh, have a conversation. It is indeed a blessing and joy to be here at the 12th Annual Roma Conference. I have very precious memories of the dialogues of my dear sister Magna, learning so much. You remember that wonderful piece we were able to do February 20th, 2018 in the Guardian newspaper on precisely this challenge and this issue 
And any time I get a chance just to set eyes on Brother Suraj, it adds years to my life. <laughs> he is a towering freedom fighter and public intellectual coming out of the rich tradition of the precious Dalit peoples. And Sister Mary, I'm telling you, 54 years ago we entered as freshmen, and I want the world to know that Mary Bassett was the major intellectual and spiritual force focused on the condition of oppressed people at Harvard between 1970 and 1974. She had a leftist circle of engagement. You had to read Marx, you had to read Lukács, you had to read Luxembourg, and you had to read Du Bois and a little Claudia Jones too. And when I heard the sister Adrian pass, my dear sister, she just told me that last night. But just, just to see you though, we still here for a half a century later in our right minds, at least I'm in my right mind five days a week. I know you and your mind seven. But uh, uh, it, it is moving for me and Sister Jackie, I don't know where she is, but uh, she has been uh, a similar force. When we first met at Princeton with Brother Homie, with Tony Morrison and a whole host of other Arnold Rapper said and others, oh, what rich, rich memories we, we have. And I appreciate you all allowing me to walk down memory lane a little bit this morning because I think we have to have a deep sense of connection of the best of the past to intervene in the present and try to authorize a better future. And I begin by trying to first situate myself in relation to the dynamic practices and doings and sufferings of Roma people, especially in the belly of Europe making the migration from India, but in the belly of Europe. I want to begin on a low note. I want to acknowledge just how wretched we are as a species. I think of the wonderful chorus in Sophocles' Antigone, how wretched and how wonderful we are simultaneously. Why do I begin that? But anytime you talk about state violence, that's just a moment in the history of a species whose history has been dominated by organized greed and institutionalized hatred and routinized indifference to the vulnerable. Hegel said history is a slaughterhouse. And Hegel's not right on everything, but he's right about that. Edwin Gibbon had put pen to paper at 39 years old, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire said history is little more than the register of crimes, follies, and misfortune of humankind. Yes, when we're talking about confronting state violence, we're talking about how do we muster the courage, the Socratic courage to think critically, the prophetic courage to act courageously, and the artistic courage to still muster what is required to laugh and smile and have a little style before the worms get our bodies. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be modern? That's what is unsettling and unnerving and unhousing in looking, confronting, honestly, candidly, any form of violence, state violence. And so we begin with ourselves, there's a spiritual and an existential dimension to this conference. It's not just the typical abstract academic one. We're trying to wrestle with how do we become stronger, more courageous, more visionary? How do we sustain our fire in the midst of the wretchedness institutionally manifest, in the midst of the various forms of evils enacted and empowered? How do we analytically and intellectual, intellectually, but also morally and existentially buoy up ourselves? Or in my black church tradition, 
put on the whole armor in order to be in the language of John Coltrane, a force for good. What kinds of weaponry are available to us intellectually, conceptually, analytically, morally, sport, spiritually? And we all have to answer that question within the chambers of our own souls. What traditions do we come out of? What kind of family shaped us? How do we define ourselves in relation to our intellectual ancestors or our biological relatives? Yes, those are questions of vocation, not just profession. Those are questions of what is your calling, not just your career. This is not just a moment for your career to be manifest. It's a rich context in which we can be vulnerable enough to wrestle with what our callings are. And for me, of course, I always situ my, situate myself in the history of a great black people who've been hated so chronically for 400 years and keep dishing out love warriors every generation. From Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth all the way up to a brother who was shot down like a dog 56 years ago yesterday in Memphis, Tennessee named Martin Luther King Jr. And we haven't even got to Malcolm X or Angela Davis yet. What does it mean for them to be wind at one's back? To be terrorized for four centuries and keep dishing out freedom fighters, calling for freedom for everybody rather than just terrorizing back. No accident, there's not a black version of the Ku Klux Klan in the history of the barbaric American empire at its worst or the sunshine elements of it, which is the freedom movement in the belly of the American imperial beast. The best of America and the worst of America. But when we talk about Roma, we got to come to terms with Europe. We got to come to terms with March 31, 1492, the Edict of Expulsion. Ferdinand and Isabella pushing out Jewish brothers and sisters. They had already been pushed out 15 times, going back to 1290. In England, Europe. And the Europeanization of the world beginning in 1492 and ending in 1945. And we're still dealing with the blowback. We're still dealing with the underside. Or we're still dealing with Malcolm X called chickens coming home to roost. All of the great breakthroughs of Europe. Absolutely. And who wants to put Beethoven down? Man, it's good to see you. You haven't recorded this. I haven't seen you recording in four years now. You got to look exactly the same, same hair and everything. Same ball too. <laughs> Looking well though, brother. In that same 1492, October 12th, here comes Columbus encountering, not discovery, encountering the new world. So Tisha, Keisha, you're right. The Europeanization of the world, those few nations between the Euro Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean would reshape the whole globe in its image and in its interest, best and worst. I'm not trashing Europe. I'm trashing the forms of institutionalized hatred and organized greed and, and routinized indifference to the vulnerable shot through Europe, but it's shot through every civilization, every through every empire that we know, given the wretchedness of our species and the wonderfulness of our species. Now it's true, after 1945, we got to come to terms with the Americanization of the world, the American empire, almost uncontested. For a while, the Soviet empire is gone by 91, 1991, and here we are, now dealing with the underside and the blowback of the American empire, the largest, most unprecedented military power in the history of the species. Neil Ferguson says it's been about 70 empires since we emerged from the caves of precious Africa. United States number 68. When you talk about the Roma condition today and going back to those last 30 year war period of the end of the age of Europe of 1914 to 1940. Five. Yes, the centrality of history, the centrality of genealogy, but also preserving a moral and spiritual dimension, which is to say, how do we create the moments of interruption, of disruption, of eruption in the dominant 
history of the domination, subjugation, oppression, exploitation. Countervailing forces, counter-hegemonic forces against the exploitation, domination, subjugation. And one of our problems is that we're so deeply disarmored by our educations, by our colleges and universities, given the very narrow, often in parochial, disciplinary divisions of knowledge, because we don't have what it takes to conceptually and spiritually and morally and politically begin with catastrophe. That's one of the reasons why our artists are so important. The artists, at their best, begin with catastrophe. In the academy, you begin with problems. Even Du Bois, as you know. How does it feel to be a problem? As I've always said for the last 45 years, there's never been a race problem in the history of America. There's never been a Jewish problem in the history of Europe. There's never been a woman's problem, never been a working class problem, never been poor people's problem. There's been catastrophes visited upon them. That's the starting point. Billie Holiday sings strange fruit, black bodies swaying in the southern breeze. She's not singing about a problem. She's singing about a catastrophe. In an academic discourse, if you begin by reducing the catastrophic to the problematic and reduce catastrophes to problems, you're going to have a managerial orientation toward the world. You're going to fit in so nice with that milquetoast neoliberal sensibility of thinking you dealing with problems when other people out here visited with catastrophes and you've already separated yourself from what they are dealing with and what's coming at them intensely. So that intellectually we haven't been true enough to what is really going on. And Marcuse is right. The condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak all of it. But the suffering never has the last word. What has the last word? Well, I'm a blues man. That means love has the last word. The love of truth. The love of beauty. The love of goodness. And I'm still a revolutionary Christian. The love of God. Some distance from the overwhelming catastrophes. Some distance from the effects of Nakba, of Shoah, of genocide, of crimes against humanity, of war crimes, of psychic violence, of spiritual murder, all of those things that go into the making of each and every one of our lives. Nobody sitting here is in any way distant from the various forms of catastrophe. My brother just left, the artist talked about the death of both of his loved ones. That's a catastrophe, deep catastrophe. Roma people, how do they equip themselves intellectually, morally, politically, communally to deal with the catastrophic consequences of living in a Europe that thinks so highly of itself? but can't come to terms with its underside. And inside of Europe, Roma, Jews, those Turks and Arabs and Muslims who decide to live therein. Outside of Europe, most of the world, colonialism, imperialism, predatory capitalist processes in every corner of the globe preoccupied with profit, crushing poor people, crushing working people, and carrying with it, of course, it's patriarchal, homophobic, transphobic, and a whole host of other things. Now, also coming out of that same Europe are discourses and figures who are critical of that. The Karl Marxes, the Diderots, the Simone de Beauvoirs, and others. So we always want to keep track of the ambiguous legacy. The problem is, is that that second strand is usually so weak and feeble vis-a-vis -vis that first strand 
of organized greed and institutionalized hatred that reinforce the structures of domination, even as those structures of domination are challenged. Even as we attempt to resist, they refashion themselves, they recast themselves, and make it more and more difficult for us to even believe that it's possible for fundamental transformation of them. That's part of the challenge, I think, that we, we have today. Uh, how do we confront the most powerful ideology of European modernity, which is nationalism, what people are willing to live and die for? And all the talk about race and gender and class, there is no international manifestation of that comparable to nationalism. And yet the paradox is the people's voices is manifest through the nutshell of the nation state, and yet that same nationalism is inseparable from the imperialism and the colonialism and so on. How do we deal with that? Well, we're going to have some discourse on paradox today. Yes, indeed. And anytime you have a discourse on paradox, what happens? You get the fusion of humility and tenacity at the same time. Because there's no rational resolution. As Brilke says, you got to live the question. And the answer to the question is the life you live. It's not just the abstract theory you have. But that nationalism is killing us. And so when we begin at looking at the underside, and we can begin to make the connections between indigenous peoples who very much like precious Roman brothers and sisters, too often have their indescribable suffering rendered invisible. That's been true in the history of the American empire. From the very beginning, early Europeans arrived and sent back letters. There's no people here, just buffaloes and Indians. See how deep the white supremacy cut. And it's still at work. 400 year war, 500 and some year war against indigenous peoples. Roma suffering rendered, for the most part, invisible in the center of Europe, disproportionately maybe Eastern or Central. How do we generate ways of talking? ways of acting, ways of organizing, ways of listening, ways of seeing that are embracing enough to shatter various forms of invisibility. Now, it's true in my own black tradition, Ralph Ellison's great novel of 1952, Invisible Man, talked about black people as invisible, but he had a different conception. We were hyper-visible, not just physically and biologically with our beautiful melanin, but he was talking about the humanity invisible, even when they were enslaved for 244 years, even when they had neo-slavery for another 100 years, even when they're dealing with police violence facilitated by an indifferent state. And Rabbi Heschel is right about indifference. Indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. Part of the invisibility of it. So we had to be very Gramscian in terms of historical specificity. We talk about the relations and connections of various forms of subjugation, be it Dalits, be it Palestinians, be it black folk, be it Roma, be it Jews in the history of Europe. I mean, one of the paradoxes right now in the Middle East is what? How are you going to end up with the people that have been hating terrorized for 200 2,500 years, and they end up hating and terrorizing another people. Human, human, all too human. What kind of morality and spirituality do you have? Which means that people can choose, like the Chomskys and the Stanley Aronowitzes and others. They can choose. Or an African Russian like Alexander Pushkin can do what? Write that wonderful poem about the Romas in 1820. Pushkin, what's on your mind, brother? We thought you obsessed with St. Petersburg. 
No, I'm choosing integrity, honesty, decency. I'm trying to be the human being in such a way that I have an international and a universal scope, even though I understand my R-O-O-2, R-O-O-T-S, my roots, my R-O-U-T-U-S, embrace everybody. My dear brother, Harry's got a magisterial book he just, just published on the reign of ash, and he's got a wonderful treatment of old brother Avram, such Kyver in poetry, talking about the encamped gypsies, connecting Jews and Roma, overflowing international universal embrace rooted in his own tradition, his own community. That ought to be true for each and every one of us. Even though we're highlighting particular four, we know there's a whole wave of oppressed folk on the underside of modernity and late modernity. And I'm going to end this on a blue note. And the blue note is, given the ecological catastrophe, given the unbelievable economic catastrophe of grotesque wealth inequality, given the escalating gangsterization, not just of the American empire, but of so many parts of the world, be it in Hungary, be it in India, and so many other places. What makes us even think that we have a chance? What makes us even conceive of a possibility that our moment of interruption at this particular time, given the depths of the spiritual decay and moral decadence of the American empire that has disproportionate impact all around the world so, so they can turn its back on actual genocide in its very face. And the only answer to that question is like the conclusion of a practical Aristotelian syllogism. It's the life you lead. The, organizi the organizing we do, the solidarity we enact. That's all we got as a species. That's all we have ever had. That's why our connection to the great towering figures of all of our various traditions are to inform us and on that deeper existential level, the love of those who loved us that poured so much love and integrity in us, mamas, daddies, aunts, uncles, and then the intellectual ancestors who helped shape us, be they the boys, be they Ann Becker, be they Rabbi Heschel, be they Muriel Rook Kaiser, be they Edward Zaid. We can go on and on and on. And a few of them actually went to Harvard. <laughs> they took Verity Toss so seriously that they got marginalized. Thank you all so very much. Thank you very much, Professor West. Your brain is so fast. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to, to keep up with you. It's hard to keep up with you, but I'll do my best. Oh, uh, uh, so uh, you, you, you have already brought in this conversation so many topics. And I'm not going to talk about vocation, calling versus right. career, right. and, um, um, uh, and um, some other aspects uh, of Harvard's life. Because I hope that our students here will uh, engage more in this conversation about our calling, our work, solidarity, and courage, especially in this environment and especially today at Harvard. But I, I do want to continue a little bit this conversation about being a problem or being stamped a, as a problem um, and in the context of, of history and in the context of European history more so because I think there is a tendency for many of us in the United States, in Europe, to think about racism as an American problem and often we forget that racism was born on the other continent uh, in Europe. Um, and I think you, you bring this into conversation in, in such, a, such a powerful way and in a way, if you're thinking about history and perhaps also Ari's book, who makes history, who makes the archive? Right. Uh, in uh, in Trio's words, right? And it's, it has been made by mostly by 
people in power, the West, white, uh, white scholars. And in that context, we see the power of coloniality. The oppressed is the object of research. Uh, um, the, the white man is the subject uh, of, of that. So perhaps in that context, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more um, about the murderous function of the state today in our contemporary time. We are not in the times of the sovereign, when the sovereign decided who will die and who will live. But we are in a times of nation states where we have human rights and we have international laws, but some people are led to die and some people are made uh, to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to die. So I wonder how do you see the murderous function of the state today and how we work in solidarity against it? And I promise this is my only question, then I'll just open the floor for a conversation with, with uh, particularly with, with our students whom I know that are here and are willing to, to ask you questions. Oh, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Oh, you got a lot in your rich formulations and <laughs> challenges as well. I mean, one thing, we, I think we've got to uh, make sure that we don't define the state too narrowly. You see, if you follow Clausewitz and Weber, then you think of the state primarily as the, uh, the institutional network that has a monopoly on the instrumentalities of violence, 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 and they're right about that. But as I said before, you see, the state, almost as a last resort, was that which was appealed to by poor and working people who were organized and dealing with private power especially in the capitalist economy, and especially with the xenophobes in civil society, so that we ended up with a discourse of rights. That was vis-a-vis -vis who? The monarchs. That was vis-a-vis -vis who? The kings and the queens. And that was a liberal tradition. Now, too often, you know, the liberalism can be as weak as pre-sweet and Kool-Aid, you know. But it's very important. That was the only thing you had. So the state is also the network of the public administrative activity. So the state itself becomes a site of contestation. Very important, very important. I, I'll challenge my anarchist brothers and sisters who always see the state as that agent of violence. I say, you're absolutely right, but you're not fully right. You see, where would poor people and working people be without appealing to the state? How come? The only thing we got, other than God, we won't get into that right now. The <laughs> only thing we got is a state. And yet that same state, criminal, same state, linked to lies and propaganda, that same state, authorizing white supremacy and male supremacists and, 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 and various kinds of hate-driven practices in their laws. And so you have that ambiguity again in the state. Uh, I tend, I've had, you know, Brother Chomsky is a serious anarchist, and I love my brother. But uh, I've always felt that uh, as critical as I am of the state, I want to be as jazz-like and improvisational and flexible as I can be in terms of how we use the forms of weaponry available to us in order for poor and working people to live lives of decency. That's why even Franz Fanon, one of the greatest critics of nationalism and wretched of the earth, and I know Sister Mary Brooke remembers that she had us reading that text over and over and over again, that classic, that pitfalls of national consciousness chapter. Nationalism itself, the nation state itself, is a first step against the forms of colonialism outside of one's territory. But once you get that, here comes the bourgeoisie, here comes the middle classes, here comes the professional managerial classes concerned about their interests and often turning their backs on the poor and working peoples in that new, supposedly post-colonial state. It's usually neo-colonial. I remember Guy Spivak asked me about, what do you think about post-colonialism? I said, where is it? That was a long time ago, that's 40, 40 years ago. Where is the sister Gayatri? Did she give me an example? I said, that looks neo-colonial to me. Well, I see what you said, I see what you said. So you don't just float out these categories for a new academic discipline, you know what I mean? You got to stay on the ground in terms of the experiences that people are wrestling with. And, and uh, that's probably too long an answer. <laughs> 
this at all. But uh, now I would like to to invite uh, our guests to um, raise their hands and ask questions or make comments. Uh, my only hope is that your comments or questions will be very short, uh, uh, because we only have about 15, 20 minutes left. So. appreciate that question, though. See, I think part of the challenge, my dear brother, especially growing up on the chocolate side of town, that it's not fully in your scope of responsibility because people are going to look at you. People look at you and say, he from Brazil? He from Egypt? Is it? Exactly. So sooner or later, it's, it's, it's not like you can just define yourself. It's like Tiger Wood called himself a Belasian. And then he gets all of these letters saying they're going to put a Bullet in his N-I-G-G-E-R. He says, oh, I'm blacker than I thought I was. Because people are viewing you that way. You can't just define yourself and make your way through. The, I'm a unicorn. No, you're not. You, what people say you are. And you didn't have to respond creatively, not allow their definition of the last word, but it has to be incorporated as part of the weaponry that I'm talking about. It's part of the phronesis, the practical wisdom that all of us have to have as human beings. The beautiful thing, I was, it's good to have you on the black side of town now. But I don't want you to think that, uh, I don't want us to romanticize anything. We got a whole history of black cowards and thugs and gangsters. I got a lot of gangsters in me, actually. We won't go into that right now. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but the fear is still there. I mean, black folk wrestle with fear all the time. But Aristotle's right. He said, but courage is not the absence of fear. See, that's fearlessness. That's something different. See, courage is the working through fear. You see, just like there's no... Hope without despair. Anybody never had despair don't know what hope is. Never had a deep heart broken? Do you really know what love is? You see how they paradoxically interrelated to each other? So it's a beautiful thing to have you here. You look strong as ever, so it worked out well. I can see that. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> OK, let's, uh, let's get a few more questions. Anyone? Hi. Um, as students and scholars in the heart of the academic institution, um, what does it mean to, what would it mean to re-escalate the problem into the catastrophe? Ooh, say that again, to re-escalate. Re yeah. yeah. wow, that's, that's a nice word. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any, uh, there's no place to hide, though, man. It's not as if you can just go to academy and go somewhere else and not have similar challenges. You just can't. Every site, every sphere in our empire presents its own kind of distinctive challenges. So the question is, how do you fortify yourself? How do you become connected with various communities of solidarity? How do you ensure that you have mechanisms of accountability and an answerability that's part and parcel of your quest for truth and goodness and beauty and so on. That's why these communities and networks that we have, the various kinds of friendships and, 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 and sisterhoods and brotherhoods and siblinghoods and so forth make such a big difference, very much so. So that, you know, when I critique the university as, as, as excessively corporatized, commodified, marketized, too often tied to big money and raw power rather than the quest for, for truth and goodness and beauty and, and love with the life of the mind and the world of ideas. That's not saying, well, somewhere else something is better. No, not at all. You go to business, no. Go to your mosque, your synagogue, your church, no, you got the same struggle going on there. Go in the music industry, even with the artists. I was telling my brother when he left, 
I mean, historically, the artists have been the vanguard of the species in terms of them being able to hold up levels of courage and freedom and style and dignity in their sound or portraits and so forth. But they're still ensconced in the same market-driven relations and connections that have to be negotiated and navigated with. So there really is nowhere to hide. It really is in space and time. You know, Kafka said we got a death sentence in space and time. The question is, what you gonna do with your life? He didn't say that second part. I added that, but but I think he had that in mind. You see, very much so. So even our indictment of uh, of the corporatized, commodified university, which we've seen, you know, operating, my God, since October seventh, it's just so raw. My God, is that what's really going on with this raw power and? being enacted like that, but it was always, it's always been there. It's always been there. So you stay strong, as you re-escalate. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, and I, I think you are right. It has always been there, but it feels that it's more, power is more naked today oh, than uh, uh, in the past. Uh, but I would pass the floor to, to Mary, and I would also invite our students to, don't shy away from asking questions. Uh, Professor West likes to be challenged Absolutely. and critiqued, so please uh, go ahead, but let's start with Mary. Well, thanks, uh, and thanks for your, your brilliant riff, if I may say, <laughs> that was really amazing, and for all your kind words. What, I, you know, until I um, encountered the Roma program, I really, all, all I knew about the Roma people was that I shouldn't use the word gypsy. That was about it. And, uh, and I want to make sure that people know that this is the li largest minority group in Europe um, and one that has faced enduring, um, uh, you know, almost disdain. Uh, it has an emotional component, not just impact on educational attainment and economic security, uh, but a cultural assault. And it just has always struck me, and, and this is my question, um, if you could just uh, talk a little bit more about solidarity, because it really struck me how this program, at least, has always um, entered with the notion of solidarity, uh, lining up the struggle of Roma people with the struggle of other marginalized groups, including black Americans. Um, if you could just talk about the importance of solidarity a bit and uh, maybe, Magda, this is also for you. I know we're not supposed to ask you questions. Uh, but, but it's so striking that a group that fights to be acknowledged and recognized, much like the indigenous people of this country, uh, would begin by saying that we find, our, we find solidarity um, with others as part of our struggle. Oh, those, uh, those are powerful words. Absolutely. No, I appreciate that, though, Sister Mary. You're absolutely. That's why I, I, I began really talking about being hated. You see, even if that, that's deeper than being othered. Let Levinas have his discourse. Hated is more intense and it's more real in terms of experience of folk. Because that is psychic and spiritual. Spiritual murder is told you are a nobody from tomb to womb and womb to tomb, you see. And therefore that spiritual and moral uh, weaponry is required and solidarity is one of the ways in which we gain access to moral and spiritual weaponry in space and time given the kind of organisms that we are. I think the one reason why this is not just the most important, not just the largest, most significant Roma, uh, 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 I almost call it a program, it's because of our dear sister. See, leadership matters. Martin Luther King Jr. matters. There's a whole lot of black folk, a whole lot of Roma brothers and sisters. But if you are a leader that already have a moral and spiritual weaponry that allows you to embrace all these other people without losing your own people's sense of who they are, then you got a solidarity that cuts very, very deep and very, very beautifully. And it goes far beyond just being an ally, far beyond being an ally. You see, when Bill Evans is playing in Miles Davis's quartet, the white brother playing the piano, he didn't, Miles doesn't turn to him and say, now we're gonna hear a solo with our, by our white ally. <laughs> you know, the mother is in the band, you know what I mean? He's in the band. 
he's earned being in the band. Well, you see, when I'm a sister magna, I don't feel like I'm just a black ally to the Roman. No, we in the band together. We in solidarity together. That makes all the difference in the world. Because if she's ever in the foxhole, I'm going to be there. If I'm in the foxhole, she's going to be there. When I'm having controversy, she checks in. Somebody messing with her, not in a, not in a pater paternalistic way, but in a way of, hey, don't mess with my sister. <laughs> Is that right, Brother Surat? So, so we, we, we're in solidarity together. We brothers and sisters coming to different colors in different countries, but we're in solidarity together. We're in the band. Listen to this music with this group. That's what we're talking about. So, but I know that one. That one too no, th th thank you so much for that. And I would never dream uh, to be uh, in a band with you, particularly because you have already released an album. <laughs> <laughs> so I would not go there, but perhaps uh, shortly, Mary, to, to also answer your question. I think that in my work, what I've seen uh, for over two decades is that while our histories, the histories of the oppressed are so different and our struggles are so different, the slavery of my ancestors is not the same, or was not the same as the slavery of other, um, of my black sisters and brothers and sisters, or the violence against the Roma people is not the same as the violence against my Palestinian brothers and sisters. Uh, but at the same time, the tools of oppression and the mechanisms of oppression are so similar that it would be um, unfortunate uh, and we will lack strategy if we didn't come together to, to, to fight against oppression. But I'll stop there, although I, I, um, I, I have quite a few more thoughts to, to add. But I, I, I really want to um, have one more question, and this time around, I'm not gonna use cold call on the students here, but we would love to, to hear your voices. Thank you very much, Professor. That's wonderful, insightful lecture. I'm very inspired. I'm aware of your work and read your work. I was contemplating on this question or oppression for a long time. What I call in my paper the cosmogenic corruption. Very, your very sort of origin is corrupted, and that is covered by the divinity, God, or uh, your very sort of existence is denied in the name of divinity or in the name of religion. Mm -hmm. Often we handle the problem in society and politics as an indicator and symptoms. So how do we correct those cosmogenic corruption that has been conditioned in human mind where I feel however I grow but I'm low, wherever I reach but I'm not there. Mm -hmm. So that very existence is questioned whether we speak in universities, power, conferences, or on religious platforms. Mm -hmm. So since long time I'm pondering on this question and you provoked me this after listening your insightful lecture, I'd love to know your response to this. Like Dr. Ambedkar called is, is, is divided by your birth. Whatever you become, you ultimately remain oppressed in the name of divinity. Your origin story is corrupted, which human can't correct, therefore you have to be slave forever, which leaves us in an eternal slavery. Yes, yes, yes. Wow, that's a tough one, too. We need a seminar on that one, though, brother, because the, uh, the dominant forms of any religious tradition tend to be those that accommodate themselves to empire and, and other structures of domination. There's no doubt about that. We're just talking about the prophetic slices of religious traditions, whatever they are. And so once you sacralize a certain hierarchy and sacralize a certain status quo, and then try to convince people that they are ontologically catastrophes. So the, the sense of any kind of alternative, any kind of future is radically called into question, you see. And we do see that at work among oppressed peoples, be they Dalit, black folks, Roma, we can go on and on, women themselves under vicious patriarchal uh, discourses and practices and institutions and so on. And the question is, how do you fight it? How do you fight it, you see? And the only way you fight it is to, uh, two, twofold. One is that you have to be in contact with folk who've already fought, because we're never the first one to do it. 
So you situate yourself within the tradition of resistance, tradition of resilience. But the second thing is, there's usually something inside of our own experiences that give us a sense of just how possible and potential our humanity can be, no matter how much our humanity is called into question. That's where the arts play an important role. You see, just feeling just down and out, down and out, completely given up as a dollar brother, let's say. You just listen to some of that rich dollar music where they get all of that freedom, all of that delicacy and sophistication of sound and rhythm. I know that's true in my situation. I just listen to Aretha Franklin, I'm all right. <laughs> that's, that's about all I need, little Curtis Mayfield. That's about all I need, you know what I mean? Because I know it didn't come from the sky. It comes from a tradition of a hated and terrorized and traumatized people that could take you to the sky and play among the, scar, the stars, even as they're trying to keep you in the gutter. No, quit lying about me. Quit criminalizing me. Quit demonizing me. And the same would be true for the Roma's rich tradition or the uh, uh, violet poetry and so forth. That takes you to a place and say, oh my God, these arts are telling deeper truths about me than these elites are. You don't say. so much, Professor West. It's uh, been really an honor. It's been an honor to, to, to have you here today. And while listening to you and sitting next to you, I remember some of uh, our conversations while walking to your classroom. And some of us would say that we are going to the church. Um, and in, in fact, in, in many ways after you left Harvard, you realized that it was indeed a sanctuary for us uh, at Harvard. And it wasn't the classroom, it was you who, who were your, uh, our sanctuary at Harvard. And, and I'm deeply grateful to you for, for everything. And I think that I'm most of all grateful for, for your partnership and support for all of us to shift from this idea of being a problem towards focusing on the oppression on the catastrophe and the oppressor more so. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, I will invite uh, Kisha to, to introduce our uh, second or first panel. Um, thank you so much. That was astounding. Um, Next, we are going to go into our first panel, which is titled Facets of State Violence Across the Globe. This panel will explore varied organ, origins, mechanisms, and manifestations of state violence that impact racialized and oppressed communi communities across the globe. And um, the chair of this panel is Dr. Jackie Baba who is a professor of the practice of health and human rights at the Chan School, um, and a lecturer in law at Harvard Law School, and an adjunct lecturer in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is also the director of research at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights here at Harvard. So please join me in welcoming the first panel um, up to the front of the room. Thank you very much, Keisha, and thank you to all of you who are in the room. Uh, before I introduce uh, my, uh, the members of my panel, I just wanted to say um, what a privilege it has been to listen to um, Professor West. I think we very rarely get exposed to um, a radical thinker who combines 
an enormous vision with um, an enormous heart. Uh, in the academy, I think we are exposed to lots of stimulating ideas, um, maybe too narrow, maybe too sectional, as you say, Cornell, not sufficiently broad or interdisciplinary, but, you know, lots of stimulating, provocative ideas. What's often missing, and what I think you bring to the table, and what's so moving, particularly at this very dark moment that we find ourselves in, is your combination of radicalism, unflinching radicalism, and your unflinching uh, commitment to mark the presence of injustice, but also your deep belief, I belief in solidarity and humanity, just from the very way in which you call all of us brother and sister. It's not just a, a figment of speech, it's a, a deep commitment you have. And I think the fact that Magda mentions um, the solidarity and the sanctuary is no coincidence, because I think in the academy now we lack that. We lack the sense of safety and trust. We are now um, lining up against each other, and we are making enemies, even when there are potential areas of commonality. And I think the example that you, as a wise and, um, you know, and very distinguished scholar set for us could not be more important. So a big thank you to you, and a thank you to Magda for bringing you. Um, <laughs> So uh, happy Roma Day to everybody, to all the Roma and non-Roma people in the room. It's really a privilege for me to be chairing this panel and to be part of this annual um, meeting, which brings together friends and new comrades um, for um, a day of, of uh, instruction and enlightenment, but also, I think, a regeneration of our, of our advocate um, and uh, combative energies as, as people who are committed to, to the fight for social justice. Um, our conference has a very ambitious title, Confronting State Violence Across the Globe. And my colleague, um, um, Dr. Bassett, already mentioned some of the instances of state violence, past state violence, which enduring presence today. I think she mentioned the genocide in Rwanda. She mentioned the murder of George Floyd. She could, of course, have mentioned many, many other um, examples of enduring state violence, um, many of which we won't have a chance to talk about, the enduring persecution um, meted out by the largest countries in the world. You only have to think of China and India to start with. The presence of, of state violence against minorities in both those enormous countries. And it's not just on land that there is state violence. Also on the water, there's state violence across the world as people are forced to drown uh, in order to seek safety. Um, and we see this not only for nationals of one country, but for indigenous people across many different countries. So unfortunately, the scope of our conference is vast. Um, nevertheless, we've had to make choices, and I think we've made very good choices. And so I am delighted to be um, chairing this panel with um, three very eminent panelists and a very um, eminent discussant. So what I'm going to do, and I think you all have seen the program, but what I'm going to do is simply um, introduce my uh, panelists. Um, is that me? Oh, it probably is me. <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce my panelists. Oh, wait, no, you want to open it. Oh, I need to open it. Okay, sorry. Well. Um, so I'm going to introduce my, uh, uh, the members of, of, of this first panel one at a time, just so that you have a very short concept of their bio in your mind before they start uh, talking. So let's start with um, Caetano Fernandez. So Caetano is going to join us online. Okay, Caetano is the co-founder um, of the anti-racist collective Cale Amenge, which is an autonomous Roma political initiative that over the past decade has focused its work on the self-organization of the Roma people as a political subject. I'm not going to read his whole bio, interesting though it is. I'll just say 
that he is an activist scholar, as many of us, I think, identify ourselves, and that, I would say to the students in the room, is a very noble calling, being an activist scholar. So don't let anybody tell you that if you're a scholar, you can't be an activist, because some of us, I think, try to prove the contrary every day. But anyway, this um, um, uh, Caetano Fernandez calls himself an activist um, scholar, and amongst his latest work, he's co-edited a book called State Racism, a Collective Overview from the Perspective of Autonomy and Racial Justice. So Caetano, thank you for joining us virtually, and um, I hope, hope we're going to see your, your face on our screens, and welcome to our conference. Thank you very much. Can you listen? Um, we can't you listen to me? see or hear you yet. Um, do we need to take another? Just give us one second, please. OK. Excellent. Thank you. Pleasure to see you and, and welcome to our conference. And the floor is yours. And I think you all have your marching orders in terms of timekeeping. So please try to respect that because we do want to have uh, some discussion at the end of your I presentations. Thank you. OK, thank you. OK, la uh, di be, Sarinenge. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation. I feel very, very honored to be part of this uh, panel with such a remarkable a scholar and an activist, and especially thankful to our sister Magda Matake, so we are tied in the, with, the, with, uh, with time. I will just uh, try to address uh, a few points that uh, I consider key, maybe very telegraphic, but some issues that I consider key in our current struggle for, for emancipation and, and political self-determination and the main obstacle that we are facing as a, as a collective. No? And I uh, think that one of the uh, first things we need to, to address, the matrix of all this uh, domination and uh, political violence that we are suffering has a lot of to do with, with what uh, we call integrationism. No? Integrationism is a very multifaceted phenomenon that uh, is design and build to ensure domination and violence uh, toward our people. Uh, fairly, it is a, an ideology that is uh, meant to, to never be achieved. Uh, as we all know, no matter how much uh, you behave as a gadget, speak as a gadget, or, or try to fit in this uh, gadget uh, design society, at the end it never affects this idea, this construction, this uh, white artifact that is what they call the gypsy. No? This is always in place wherever you are in front of a police or you are in a courtroom or even in a school. No? Then this uh, integrationist uh, uh, approach has also provoked a very deep uh, damage in the moral fever of our people. No? So in very early uh, age, in a school, we are always listening that we don't fit, we don't belong, that uh, we, our ancestors, were not enough to be part of the society, that we need to be reformed. And it's also is affecting in many ways our uh, people as an individual and also collectively. But most importantly, integration is saying is have created a political framework where we are designed, we are uh, defined as the problem to be fixed, to be corrected, and at the same time, integration is presented as the only possible uh, solution. So at the end, if we go a little bit deep to try to understand what uh, this integration is approved through public policy, uh, strategies for integration, uh, plan for Roma integration have been, is mostly based in a civilizing project, in this idea that we are not civilized enough, that we are saving people, that we need to be corrected to be part of this society. No? And this uh, have, a, uh, is, have a huge political impact in our, in our struggle, as it's built through 
two different uh, mechanisms to control and dominate our political will. No? On the fair hand, we, have, we can see an entire narrative, a semantic narrative, built in the idea of inclusion, integration, multiculturalism, interculturality, you name it, that uh, mostly consists in when we uh, see this, what we call the Roma expert, no? the white uh, expert on Roma designing and defining public policy for our own good, between quotation, without actually taking into, into consideration our own agenda, we listen all these discourses for to fancy uh, notion like human rights, rule of law, democracy, political participation, and so on, that we listen actually understand that when it comes to Roma, it's just empty war. It's just a part of this semantic framework that actually doesn't affect uh, really our people. No? In this sense, at the same time we are listening to this discourse, we are witnessing and facing a permanent uh, situation of violence the state. I wanted to share uh, my, uh, I cannot share my screen, I think. Okay, I just wanted to bring three three uh, cases to comment very briefly. As I cannot share the the, the screen, I just uh, wanted to speak about the death of uh, our brother, uh, Daniel Jimenez, with a 30 year old, who died in 20, 10, 10 June 2020 in the police station of Algeciras in South Spain, where I am, from where I am speaking to, to you. Uh, the official discourse say that he hung himself in the in the cell when the day before he was calling the family that in next Monday he will be released. In the same uh, police station, a few uh, months earlier happened to say to a young Moroccan uh, a guy who died in the same in the same condition. When the body was released to the family. When they made the uh, independent autopsy, they found a plastic globe in the trunk. This case still doesn't have, uh, didn't get any any justice. We are still uh, waiting for justice with the with the family. In 2022, in Pierre de Becerro, also in South in South Spain, in in Jaén, there were a conflict between Juan Gallo and Juan, and Jan Roma. After this uh, conflict, the council uh, uh, organized a protest. The protest ended up attacking most of the family in the town. They uh, need to leave the, the town. Seven families are still waiting for solution out of the, of the, of the town. And uh, more recently, just a month uh, ago, on the 6th six, six of March of 2024, Antonia, a 10-year-old uh, girl, died in a fire in a Roma, in a well-known Roma ghetto in, in Linare, in South, in South Spain, where police and, and uh, uh, police and authorities were present there and they didn't uh, uh, provide help to this family because they belong to this uh, uh, Roma ghetto. I wanted to bring these three cases for two reasons. The first one, it is because they are very close to me, they are in the same area where I live in, where my family is settled for for uh, centuries, and when I am raising my my small two-year uh, daughter, Sophia, what uh, as you can understand is very is very scary, and I also wanted to share this case because, of course, I'm guessing here, but I don't think I'm wrong if I'm telling to you that nobody, or most of us, are not surprised that these cases, when go to the court, don't get any justice. And this is part of this, uh, of this system of the permanent uh, violence, of this uh, bill on this idea of integrationism that I was speaking. Because I'm sure that after all these cases, there will be more program, more project, more uh, uh, official discourses on this, uh, on this idea that are not going to address the main problem of our people. No? As integrationism have created this white agenda that I was speaking, but also have created a very dangerous phenomenon. Is a, a, an artificial political subject controlled and fundraising by institution and the state 
mostly uh, formed by NGO and not political organization that is spitting our behind, but actually doesn't bring solution to our people, you know? So in this uh, uh, situation, I think this is where we need to to set the main question, you know, that for us, how we can confront uh, anti-Roma racism within an structurally, an systematized structurally anti-Roma. And there we need to be, we don't need to be naive and we need to be very sharp analyzing politically how this trap of integrationism have uh, blocked our political uh, uh, voices, our political way to self-organize and to bring a solution to our people. Because at the same time that the system with one hand is inviting you to join the table, with the other hand is obliged you to be part of this integrationist approach and because of that betray our people. No? So I'm very happy that this uh, conference is focused in the violence created by the state, because at the end of the day, when we're speaking about anti-Roma racism as a system of racial domination built on the on the logic of modernity that dehumanizes our people, all the things that we know, at the end of the day, the fair uh, face, the fair characteristic of anti-Roma racism that is, is a state racism. And in order to get emancipated, uh, we need to understand that through collaborating with the state, we are not going to achieve any political uh, solution. No, I just wanted to raise the question here. Do you know any case of a collective uh, human group that have been emancipated by negotiating, by sorry, by collaborating with the state, with the same oppressor, uh, that, with the same oppressor that keep them in this solution, no, in this situation? Sorry. So. I'm very skeptical about this uh, this uh, uh, political uh, approach uh, of collaborating with the state, but uh, I'm also very aware that sadly many of our brothers and sisters are still decade after decade trying to find solution in this uh, collaboration. No? So in my view, and I think we'll bring some of the idea that I think that could be useful for the for the debate with uh, with us. We need to move away from this uh, state, uh, this level of collaboration, and actually to build a process of confrontation that hopefully one day can take us to a, a place that we can negotiate with the with the state and to and to get uh, and to get transformation. But of course, for that, this requires a prior war. This requires to invest in our autonomy at all levels at political level, but also conceptual level, in the way that we think about ourselves, in the uh, in the knowledge that we produce our, about uh, our people, and uh, also to cre in creating our own uh, organization, our own political autonomous organization at all, uh, at all level. You know? Also, uh, this demand to rethink in this so-called Roma movement what is the uh, alliance we have built and with uh, with outcome if I can because this artificial political subject that I was speaking about have been always focused on looking at on uh, uh, creating ways of communication and collaboration with a uh, white power center with institution with administration and not really looking around and to understand that uh, we are sharing our faith with other racialized people in Europe. It is not just a matter of creating coalition, just thinking that because uh, we go in a coalition, we are going to be more in number. It is about understanding that our faith, our collective faith, are tied together. And we need to invest in this in this line. No? And I'm going to finish with, with this because I'm spending maybe the, the time. But I just wanted to, to mention, like, I'm I pretty convinced. I think we're just about out of time, Caetano. So if you can wrap up, thank you. Uh, just, yes. just, you know, I maybe one more minute. Last sentence, and I finish here. Uh, I'm just, uh, thinking about this idea of the LSA, I'm pretty convinced that the Roma contribution can be crucial in this uh, potential uh, ally. As we have uh, accumulated a very 
vast uh, ancestral knowledge about our oppression. It is uh, quite uh, interesting to see how Gajay people usually are demanding that they want to know more about us, that they want they need program in their school, in their institution to know about Roma, but we, to the opposite, we know very well the uh, the system that is oppressing, oppressing us. We know very well how they act, how they speak, how they settle the trap for us. And also, we are coming with a long uh, memory of more than 600 yeah. years of resistance. And I think this can be turned into, into a weapon that to defeat uh, structural racism for, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, a very uh, clear and compelling um, account of how uh, solidarity does not mean integrationism. I think this is an extremely important point you made um, to set at the outset that you need to organize, you need to keep your own sense of what you're struggling for in solidarity with others. And does that, that does not mean that you have to submerge what you are fighting for or who you belong to. So thank you for that very important um, initial contribution. Our second, and, and I'm setting my timer for 10 minutes, so when you hear the timer go off, please, please realize that your time is, is coming to an end. So our second panelist is Dr. Chelsea West Ohweri, and she's an assistant professor of Slavic and Eurasian studies and anthropology and black studies and population health um, uh, based at the University of Texas, um, Austin. Uh, and she has appointments across a range of different faculties, which really, I think, captures the point that Professor West made about how important interdisciplinary ties and scholarship um, are to, to really develop the themes that we are concerned about. Her work is primarily concerned with the study of race and racialization, belonging, marginalization, and medical anthropology. And she's published extensively on a range of different issues, including comparing whiteness and blackness amongst Albanian, Romani, and Egyptian communities. So really fascinating ethnographic studies. So Dr. Uh, Westoheri, thank you so much for, for, for joining us today. And, and um, uh, your, your title is Racial Logics of Anti-Romani Racism and Anti-Blackness, a Relational Analysis. Thank you so much. I'm going to set a timer because I always talk over. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. And I want to just start off by um, thanking um, the, um, the organizers and particularly thanking Magda for the invitation to join you all today. <clears throat> I also want to give one point of clarification um, because, and I can't, ex I don't have time to explain it all today, but um, the, when I use the word Egyptian, there is a Balkan Egyptian community, and particularly in Albania, Kosovo, and Macedonia, who do not identify as Roma, but they're often grouped under the category of Roma, but this is not Egyptian nationals in the contemporary nation state of Egypt. And the best I can tell you is that if you have more questions about that, we can talk after the panel. Um, or you can read my book when it comes out. Okay. <laughs> so taking a lead from um, black feminists and Romani feminist scholars, I begin this paper by acknowledging from where I speak. I am a black woman scholar, a descendant of enslaved black folk from states known today as Mississippi and Texas. A black woman who was raised in Mississippi, Mississippi got damned, to quote the great Miss Simone, a place notorious for its interlocking racist past and presences, a place so backwards that the racist atmosphere seeps into the lungs of its residents, a place that many in the United States and throughout the world herald as the exceptional rather than the mirror, the mirror of the everyday racism that shapes nearly every facet of white supremacy and anti-blackness that permeate life in the United States, but a site where lush meadows produce the fertile ground on which racial reckoning and fights against racial oppression take root. I am a black woman whose first travel experience outside of the United States was to the high mountains of northern Albania, where my immediate encounter centered on my black woman otherness, where every day I was inundated with questions about my blackness, my body, the size of my hips, where I recognized, by, where I recognized my own American academic and class privilege, a person whose first questions arose out of a study abroad project 
where I always name that this, all of my academic work and research, I can always go home. But I began with these. I began asking questions about my encounters, about race, and was immediately told by many white and Western scholars and Albanians as well that the questions um, were simply that and had nothing to do with race. Do not worry yourself about race because there is no race here. A repeated retort to my inquiries. But what if these questions about race could provide an opening into the concept itself? I'm a black woman who has spent more time in the Balkans studying articulations of whiteness, of blackness, of those who feel othered and, multi and racialized in multiple ways. A black woman who came to see the ways that some Roma and Balkan Egyptian women felt a shared sense of identity with me because they would call me sister or cousin. An ethnographer who was puzzled about the articulations of whiteness and blackness made by Albanians, and I wanted to study why. I am also a black woman who's tried to be careful about these associations and the assumptions that I know what it means to be in their position because of these shared and relational bonds. I'm a scholar here today with these lines of inquiry. And so my guiding questions for my research are always kind of are shaped by why race, where race, and how race. I'm teaching a class right now, a graduate course on global race and racism. We actually read an article from you, Siraj, just yesterday. And I'm asking these questions about global race and racialization. So this is a very opportune time to be having these conversations today. In particular, the why race, because everybody often asks me why Albania. Also, we can talk about that in the Q&A too and how I even got to this place. But here are two maps which show you where Albania is, um, where it's located. I began my research in the high mountains just north of the city, pronounced Shkolder, or Shkolder as it's written here. But most of my research is taking place in, in Tirana, in the capital city of Albania. As you see here, um, it borders Greece, North Macedonia, Kosovo, Montenegro. It's just over the Adriatic from Italy. And my key questions have always, um, or not always, are, but are shaped by um, that which asks, what are the racial and race imaginaries that shape Albania and the Balkan region? Or what imaginaries are constructed and, um, and how are these constructed imaginaries shaped by history as well as global processes of racialization? I study the conceptualizations of whiteness, blackness, and othering ethnographically, and I trace what I call, think of as the racial logics of race making. That is, um, what is race and how does it get its meaning and its shape and change across space and time? How is race a global process but shaped by local and, um, and, and um, or locally and historically shaped and contextualized. And one facet of this work that I do focuses on how Roma and Balkan Egyptians in particular get racialized locally as black, with an Albanian term called Dor de Zez, whereas Albanians get racialized as white with a category, a category um, Dor e Barth. And again, I do not take these to be um, the direct translations from white and black as we would understand white and black in the United States, for example. And I feel that one of my lifelong projects, um, as was said earlier by um, Dr. West, is to return race to Europe. That's one of my lifelong projects, one of my friends, Ione in the audience. I say that every talk I give. Just trying to give it back. Just give it back. Okay, but um, but so when looking at the dimensions of anti-Romani racism and anti-blackness, this is not just a matter of individuals who um, or individual acts of racism, um, individual prejudice, um, issues. I love what um, Dr. West said about problems. Problems are issues of diversity or cultural inclusion or even issues with recognition, but rather these racist sentiments draw attention to the deeply embedded racial logics whereby state racism and structural inclusion become entrenched. The raciality that underpins who receives full humanity and who is denied it. Anti-Romani racism is pervasive. It smothers. They treat me like an animal here. An interlocutor once told me, I am an, Al I am an animal in Albania, Yamkafshkatu. In my book, I discuss Roman Egyptians in Tirana who speak about the forms of racism, this anti-Romani racism that squelches their ability to be. I write and think about anti-Romani racism in terms of who is constructed as the other and re continually reproduced as outsider. And then along these lines, and thinking with scholars who've studied um, anti-blackness, anti-black racism, I'm also trying to think through the ways that these, um, the logics that generate oppression, um, thinking about what Magda said, these similar forms, these tools of oppression, how anti-blackness and anti-Romani racism are shaped um, in parallel yet divergent ways, but also interlocked ways. 
Um, and, and often, too, in ways that go unnamed, um, and, um, but yet continually, continually operating. And so in doing so, it really draws attention to whiteness, as whiteness is pliable, yet very obstinate. And, and going back to what I shared, those earlier encounters that I had um, when I first traveled to Albania were ones in which it wasn't just that race wasn't present, but there was an insistence on racelessness for a variety of reasons. But East Europe broadly is often constructed outside of race. And while the last maybe five years has seen a turn to examining race and its local formations, I shaped by histories and shaped by global formations, there's still often a lot of resistance to the idea of race. And so I'm happy in the Q&A to talk more about conceptually how we think about this um, and, and really to the points of agreement as well as those points of divergence. Um, but also, this has informed quite a bit of my work because it was, in fact, the experiences um, not just of Roma and Egyptians and articulations of blackness, but also Albanians who would articulate what I call a peripheral whiteness and the ways that they did not see that they they were racialized as white or racialized outside of white, or at times were articulate a blackness. And so I got very curious about that. Um, and so in this way, too, began to think more about whiteness itself and the ways that whiteness gets reproduced and reshaped and reconfigured, that the boundaries of whiteness stretch and they extend. Um, but then also, too, um, the boundaries are very stubborn in terms of who gets racialized as white, who does not. So they change over time, but then they're hardened, right? Thinking about what um, Scala Piero Jeppi said, that there's white enclosures that are formed and that those lines can change, those boundaries can change, but then those lines are hardened um, by various um, global processes. And so in this way, what I've been thinking about is how we can think of race through, and the experiences, um, or really the concepts of anti-blackness and anti-Romani racism, but the experiences as well of black folks, um, of Roma folks, not necessarily just as comparative, as comparative work is very important, but thinking relationally too. Like, so what does this analysis look like in terms of a relational analysis? And as I'm uh, running out of time here, what I wanna open up for conversation is thinking about how we examine this historically, structurally, as well as um, thinking of embodied racisms. And so um, some of the work that I've done um, and, and work that has shaped the way I've engaged particularly race in the body and thinking about my, the role I've done in, in health too is looking at how racism itself is embodied over time. Looking at the body as a site of racialization and how that plays out in terms of our health and you know familiar categories like health disparities or health inequities, but then also too how that shapes our bodies over time not just within the dimensions of, um, of health. And that is one site where I think of thinking about the compare, I'm sorry, the relational analysis of how anti-blackness and um, anti-Romani racism operate as a particular uh, generative site. Um, this is also something that uh, work that Magda has done, for example, um, in looking at health as a lens and the body as the site for doing so. And so the last point I'll make is my timer also just went off, um, was that and as we talk today about confronting global uh, racism and global racialization, I look forward to the opportunity to have these conversations as well and continuing that relational analysis and not necessarily that comparative analysis, which can really get us kind of trapped and, and stuck in our ability to build um, collaborations and, um, and to think um, collectively. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Another wonderful presentation and so interesting to, to um, think with you about um, the pliability of these categories of black and white and how they are differentially applied across time and space. So thank you for sharing your, your fascinating research with us. Um, our third panelist is um, Zaina Jalad, uh, who is um, a graduate of Columbia Law School, was actually the first um, Arab uh, person to, first female, Arab to get um, SJD from, from Columbia Law School um, and has many years of experience um, as a legal practitioner and consultant working uh, with a range of different organizations including UN Women, um, UNDP, uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, UNFPA and the European Commission. And she is now a residential fellow at Harvard Law School where she specializes in international law. 
and has been working on issues related to um, to the Middle East and in particular Palestine, Israel. And the title of her talk today is Israel's Non-Territorial and Psychic Annexation of the West Bank Samaritans in the Occupied Palestinian Territory. So um, I'm really delighted to, to welcome you, uh, Dr. Jalad. Thank you for joining us and for speaking about your topic. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, especially at the time that uh, different forms of violence are happening all over the world, in particular in Palestine. So what I'd like to do is to share with you a case study where um, I'd like to talk, to talk a bit more about a different form of a less visible violence that happens in a contested place, which is the psychic violence and the psychic annexation. Um, international law deals a lot with the illegal acquisition of land, the wrongdoing around the grabbing of land, but the international law doesn't really look into other forms of violence that happen. And one of them is the identity annexation and what I called in my work identity annexation. Let me start by asking you a question. How many of you know of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, how many of you know that the, and had an idea that the Good Samaritan was uh, a lawyer, a tax lawyer, apparently? <laughs> so <laughs> it was a colleague, maybe. <laughs> um, so the, and how many of you had an idea that um, the Good Samaritan was uh, from the land of Palestine, the historical land of Palestine? Um, so so now I, I'd like to take you actually on um, a tour, a virtual tour to Palestine, and talk with you about the story of the contemporary Samaritan, today's Samaritan. So um, um, Samaritans in Palestine are a religious minority, one of the smallest minorities in the world. They are less than 1,600 people today. Um, they are divided between the city of Nablus in the West Bank and Holon on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. Samaritans are Arabic speakers. They believe that they belong to the Samaritan religion, which is a variation of Judaism. They uh, believe that they are the true Israelites. The name Samaritan is from Shemronim, meaning the keeper of the truth. And they believe that they are the ones who were enslaved in Egypt for years and years, they were lost in the desert for 40 years and made their way to Nablus. All of this is relevant because of the contemporary story that I'll share with you about the today's Samaritans. Samaritans, they think that they have more than 6,000 differences between their version of the Torah and the contemporary Hebrew version of the Torah. If you ask a Samaritan, are you an Israeli today? Samaritans will say, no, we are the true Israelites. And they make a distinction between the Israeli of today and the true Israelites. So the Samaritans, they eat Arabic, they li listen to Arabic music, they go to Arabic schools in the city of Nablus. For them, there is absolutely no significance to the city of Jerusalem. The holy site is atop Mount Jerzim, Har Habaracha, uh, which is the Mount of Blessing, and Jerusalem has no religious meaning. So now we know a little bit about the Samaritans. Let's go to what happened to the Samaritans. Um, recently, Samaritans around Oslo Agreement in Palestine, that, that created the Palestinian Authority, the Samaritans, they saw a moment of aspiration, a promise that all of us Palestinians lived through. And they thought that with this promise, there will be a realization of a Palestinian state. So they joined, they are only in the West Bank, they are only 600 something, because the total is 1,600, less even. Um, so they thought there is a moment of opportunity. They went on a delegation with the Palestinians to negotiate and join forces with the Oslo Agreement. 
trying to realize something of the promise of a Palestinian state and the pursuit of sovereignty. So in also agreement today, there is an annex that deals with the area of the Samaritan community. That one. With the first Palestinian elections, the 400 something people, there was a reserved seat in the Palestinian parliament, the Palestinian Legislative Council for the Samaritans. So we have a Samaritan representative. Fast forward, what happened? The Israeli court and the Israeli government decided, although in Israel, Samaritans are non-Jews, the kosher food of a Jew is not the same as a kosher food of a Samaritan. If a Samaritan wants to marry a Jew, they have to convert. So Jews do not recognize Samaritans, and Samaritans do not recognize Jews. Um, when, uh, so the court decided in Israel to extend the Israeli citizenship to the Samaritan people. So in, um, nine, um, in 2002, Samaritans became Israeli as well as Palestinians. So they became the only people on this globe who are part of the occupied nation and part of the occupying regime. And what happened? They became in a place where they are using the different applicable laws and they are using the Palestinian laws, the Israeli laws. Today, if, you, if I, as a lawyer, try to bring a Samaritan before the Palestinian justice system, the Samaritans will tell me, sorry, we can't be tried before the, the Palestinian court system because according to Oslo agreement, Israelis need to consent and I am an Israeli. And when they want to issue a bank check, they go to the Palestinian banks and they do a form of forum shopping. So they became from a small minority, actually an empowered minority, that became able to negotiate the different applicable law. Now, Israel, and what I'm arguing here, Israel has been propagating its, its system as the only democracy in the Middle East and trying to project a facade of democracy. The, this facade of democracy recognized this minority for civic rights. But at the heart of it, it's not really a recognition. In the name of recognition, a form of misrecognition happened. And a form of a collective identity has been distorted and re-narrated. So if for me, the way I'm arguing what happened to the, uh, to the Samaritans is a kind of uprootedness, an appropriation of their narrative in the name of recognition, a form of dual psychic territorial mode of annexation happened that went beyond the land to the rootedness, selfhood, identity, and belonging to these people. So today, as a result, if you look, if you visit the city of Nablus and you go to the Samaritan neighborhood, you will see you have, they became Israel citizens. Accordingly, the Samaritan neighborhood in the city of Nablus has a, has a big major checkpoint. Samaritans, um, are protected by the Israeli army. The archeological site became under the Israeli uh, governance. The Samaritan community became um, a, in a position where when we are asking them, are you, do you feel, how, what do you feel? How do you identify? What's your self-definition? They became more of people who would identify as a bridge of peace or positioned in between. So my argument that there are forms of, this is the, um, city of Nablus, and what I'm arguing is that um, in, a, in the name of recognition, other forms that the law fails to capture happen, and there are other modes of, um, of annexation that happen that international law alo alone is incapable of capturing, and the, and the bestowal of an only uh, immigrant uh, status on a, Jewish, a non-Jewish minority that are not Jews and an indigenous people who are neither immigrant nor Jews, who never left the land and never returned, the bestowal of this Israel citizenship to them is a form of an identity annexation. Because what Israel did, and I will end with this note, what Israel has been doing since the creation of the state of Israel is doing two things. Majoration, augmentation of the number of Jews on the land and minorizing Arabs. 
And there has been so many laws that have been operating in that space since the 40s until today that if anything complicate the access of Palestinians to rights and citizenship and facilitate the access of non-Palestinians to that contested place. So in the name of expanding expansion, they, uh, they annex this, uh, this minority because there is a strategic um, there's a strategic interest in annexing this minority. It's not a Muslim minority. They, the Samaritans are known that they've never left the land. So there was an, a strategic interest in annexing a minority to solidify claims over the land and empty also the Palestinian narrative from diversity. So Palestinians, by, uh, by emptying, and this is a form of creeping annexation, creeping that annex the land and the people who are on the land to create a mono-religious Palestinian community. Um, so I just want to show you in one picture the um, uh, Samaritans. So here, if you can see on the road in Nablus on the left side, there is one side of the road is the Palestinian uh, plated cars, and on the other side of the same road in the city of Nablus, the Israeli cars. So when we're talking about forms of violence, forms of apartheid, this form in the name of recognition solidify claims over colonialism, apartheid, and other forms of violence. And I will end with this. Just some more. Questions. Thank you, Dr. Gillard, for that uh, presentation. I'm sorry we are so short of time, but hopefully there'll be some questions. I think it's very interesting to see these case studies, which really um, force us to think more subtly about terms that we use normally, like annexation, belonging, citizenship. So thank you for that. It was very interesting. Um, our final uh, panelist is um, Dr. Suraj uh, Yengde who is a W.E.B. Du Bois fellow um, here at Harvard and is um, one of the, uh, I think, better known Dalit scholars of our time. He has written uh, numerous articles and essays, and we just heard that one of our panelists has actually um, used his work in, in her teaching. Um, and I know that he's been very influential in thinking about Dalit issues and in really building a constituency of students and scholars who uh, see Dalit struggles and uh, the whole question of casteism in, in India and beyond as part of, a, of an anti-imperial and anti-colonial movement. So uh, very important work. Um, he's worked together with, with Dr. Um, uh, Cornel West and has uh, tried to build bridges as well between African Americans and Dalits. Um, so really wonderful that you're here with us, um, Suraj. Thank you for joining thank us. You. And um, we look forward to hearing uh, briefly your presentation on the title of um, The Reliance on State <coughs> excuse me, to Resist Societal Oppression. How do Dalits navigate this dependency in seeking independence? Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Jackie. Jackie, you have been a great support and help and a mentor to the Roma program. Uh, and I want to also thank you for that support you extend. Um, let's also acknowledge my dear sister Magda, who also I worked with alongside Professor West. I think that seat is also reserved for me there. I really appreciate this. Um, invitation, Magda, um, when Minority Rights International invited me to write one of their feature annual piece. It was a long 7,000 odd word piece. I decided to write on the Roma Burakumin of Japan and Dalits of India. And within the Roma, I couldn't miss but profile the excellent work of Magda which really went through several reviews, but she really deserves that kind of place and attention, and I could get a very important insight into her own work. When you profile somebody, you have to read their work. And not only reading, but also I was through the, uh, the politics of what she's doing, and I've been a member of this Roma conference for many, many years. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I'm speaking here today. And to my mentor, uh, Professor 
Dr. Cornel West, President of the United States of America. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just um, uh, I just donated it to his campaign as I was looking into my phone. I encourage you all to do that uh, because um, we really need a a moral calling uh, in our times, and and if there is a moral position, we ought to extend our solidarity. And thank you. Comrade uh, Mary Bassett for also heading the role of FXB Center. Now the question: What we have today here is, um, how how do we how do we locate state? Now one of the fundamental differences of modernities has been creation of a state, and modern state has often uh, thought through liberal values that were made in a Judeo-Christian framework. More importantly, League of Nations, 1916 and 1948 coming through the visions of Roosevelt and so forth, and the rights as a perception as opposed to perspective were always in contestation. And through these dimensions, a certain framework of liberal thought was promoted, and of course there was a divide, and Cold War was a very important segment of that divide, whereas opposed to a certain radical ideas which were considered as communist and at, and, and at one point was considered as a liberal state. And within this, and meshing was an important segment of colonialism and post-colonialism. Now, for if you look through these uh, metaphors of uh, colonization, uh, the capital C, capital, uh, then you see the idea of state and history with multiple pasts. Now, if you categorize these four and look through the perspective of India, especially Dalits, uh, the complications that we are witness to is, is really voltiferous in the sense that state, the way we manifest is, is, is historical. And there is a memory of historical, but also the idea of post-colonial is a fascist in nature. The people who oppose a certain colonial impediment, let's say 200 years of colonization, who want to go back to certain roots of pre-colonial history, are themselves trying to impose a Brahminical agenda of fascism upon the same people who are oppressed. So the idea of post-colonialism doesn't really fit neatly into what we call liberation. And that's why Dr. Ambedkar is very important, who doesn't debase the idea of state. State is very important for him to run the affairs of poor people, marginalized people. And that echoes what Professor West was, was contributing today morning, which really drastically shifts the people with enormous privileges and multiple passports and even mobilities to travel multiple locations have the ability to debase the state to contradict the state, to try to work without the state, and then locate into a certain mythical indigeneity of non-existence of state. Within the Indian context, state has to exist for poor people to claim on their own rights. And rights here doesn't necessarily mean the capital R, rights framed in constitutionalism, but rights in the sense of exercising their own dignity. And when we look at state, State is not just a monopoly of violence on its own people, but also it is, we have a classic Marxist theory about state, which is to have a monopoly over the finances, i.e. taxation on people when, from, a, from an individual becoming a state person and from state person becoming a citizen. So idea of citizenship today is your capacity to contribute to the state coffers. And when we look at this, there is an entire segment of population who is unable to contribute to the coffers through what we call direct taxes. And because they cannot contribute through direct taxes, they're of course contributing to historical taxation that was never accounted for, they are bracketed into the identity of welfareists, the people who are relying on the state for their own mobilities. These are people who are trying to demolish the state structure by becoming homeless, by creating more children, by, by the people who want to obfuscate their own responsibility by not working hard, but trying to take the social welfare policies that the state is trying to bring. And I think it is in this, we often uh, miss out that no matter a person who is oppressed in one society. Now this, my dear brother here was commenting that at the age of four, he is, a Roma, and I believe from, uh, from not America, the parents have come from somewhere else, and yet the fear from where? From the grandparents from Eastern Europe, third, second generation here, and yet the fear of being outed as a Roma continues. The phantom of this nature works what Walter Benjamin 
describes beautifully in the tendencies of four cameras looking at us, and we don't even know which one to act upon. And I think this is where what happens to a body that has been consistently put onto a vulnerable platform. If you are consistently exposed to vulnerabilities, you don't have alternative paradigms to work with. And I think this is the cause of the nations that have not been settled yet. The historicity of colonization that we are often talking about, is it colonization of the elites? Or is it the colonization of the poor people who were never part of single colonization? We have a singular narrative of colonization of almost every state, but there are layers of colonizations. The British in India for Dalits were the later part of colonization. Before them, they were spades of colonizations. They were colonizations from what we call uh, Turkey. They were colonizations from Uzbekistan. They were colonizations from Central Asian republics. There was a colonization from the Aryans who had come. And this colonial history dates several millennia, at least two and a half millennia, if we record the history of this categorization. And that's why Fanon is so important, because for him, the question of colonization is about the new elite who is going to take on the resources and monopolize its control on its own people. And that's why when we look at the forms of violence that we witness today, it is not about a violence upon one community or multiple communities. It, are, it is the community that Professor West was calling it as a band. We are part of the same musical note. This is what I think is about sibling solidarity the solidarity that is built upon like a sibling. And sibling here doesn't necessarily need to be biological or belong to geography, but it's a sibling whose parentage has been lost. It has been withdrawn from its own history. It has been usurped to create a new nation state upon its own heels. And I, for us to develop that new affairs, how do we then make a person accountable where this brother is still afraid of his Roma identity, while the oppressor here continues to be a minority in the eyes of a dominant hegemon, wasp recognition of this America. How do we account this multiple layer of minoritizations? And minorities doesn't always help with the idea of numericals. Our sister here was calling about the empowered minority. Minority nevertheless, but they're empowered. Brahmins in India are nearly three and a half percentage, but an extremely influential and empowered minority. So minority as a categorical numeric doesn't necessarily always fit the narrative. Apartheid South Africa, or colonial rule in any country, was about numerical minorities. Dr. Ambedkar makes an intervention, 1919, young scholar, 28, 29 year old, to the South Borough Commission, makes the idea that minority also has to be compared with a specificity of that culture and history. Unless and until we account to that, the minority will necessarily not give an advantage to the oppression of those people who might be in majority, but yet oppressed by the modern legal framework. And for that, I think we ought to recognize that the singular narrative of state, colonization, and violence has done more harm to our own understanding. The post-colonial elites who had a field day for a couple of decades have to now wrap their bags and clear up for new positions. The people of Roma background are here. The people of Dalit background are here. The people who are oppressed from different minority communities are here. It's no longer somebody else talking about their own history and their own regionalization, but I think it is about their own identities that will help us to categorize what we see the today rhetoric of past which is a rhetoric of multiple histories. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, thank and thank you, you to all of you for being so uh, um, gracious in, 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 in your timekeeping. I know that you a lot of preparation has gone into these presentations and that you can comfortably spoken for double the length of time, so I really appreciate that. Um, that you've stuck to your, to your time so, so, so diligently. So we're now very lucky to have with us Dr. Um, uh, Abadir Ibrahim, who's the Associate Director of the Human Rights Program at Harvard Law School. And for those of you who don't know, Harvard has three human rights programs, but the oldest, and I think it's fair maybe to say the most venerable, is definitely the human rights program at the law school. So we're delighted to have you with us, um, Abadir. 
um, uh, Dr. Ibrahim has um, various uh, legal qualifications from both his uh, home country of Ethiopia from Addis Ababa University, but also from St. Thomas University uh, School of Law. And his current uh, substantive or research work, apart from running uh, the, the, the human rights program, which is definitely um, uh, a program that those of you interested in human rights should, should, um, should check out and, and, and get uh, listed on, because there are many fascinating events. But his current research um, is focused on the African system of human rights and uh, ways in which the um, African system relates to other global human rights issues. So really big questions. So I think you're very well qualified to speak about um, the panels we've had so far. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you. Um, I, I'll I'll uh, take I'll you know stay here um, for the ten minutes duration I have, um, and I hope to be the first panelist who goes doesn't go beyond ten minutes. Let's see if it works out. Um, um, <clears throat> let me first place myself uh, my subject position as an Ethiopian human rights lawyer, um, an act an activist who thinks about colonization about the Palestinian states, um, and about human rights from a, a particular Ethiopian point of view. And that particular point uh, will, I hope, come out. But if it doesn't, um, assume that th this is, that's where I'm coming from. Um, part of the reason this is important is because it affects how I think about the states. Um, when Magda invited me, um, and told me how this uh, event is structured, I, I thought I had to read uh, Membe's essay on necropolitics, reread necro, uh, his essay, but I didn't go beyond the first line. <laughs> um, because immediately I read the first sentence and it's, um, it is defining necropolitics as um, <clears throat> um, the power to decide, the capacity to decide who shall live and who shall die. And that just led me straight to Lin-Manuel Miranda's um, Hamilton. And the last piece in Hamilton um, is who lives, who dies, and who tells our story. Um, and now, <clears throat> um, this is the last piece where um, it's talking about Hamilton's death, all, despite his contributions, being the least known founding father because he was an orphan, uh, born out of wedlock, he was an immigrant, he was a Scotsman, he, he, was, he had a marginal uh, uh, existence despite his contributions, he's, he's not that uh, known. Uh, but I'm going to stick to who lives, who dies, and who tells our story as my structure of what a state is and what a constitution is, um, because who lives translates to me, to who lives well, mm. i.e. the state's role, the constitution, and, and by the way, when I'm saying state, I'm al also always thinking as a lawyer, so I'm thinking constitution, legal systems. Mm -hmm. um, the state um, is an outcome of some sort of a distribution of power and resources. Mm -hmm. If you look at the constitution, there's always a component as strong component of the Constitution where it is structuring power, it's structuring relations. And if you go to Hamil back to Hamilton, it's that founding moment of America does establish certain relationships and, and um, locks them in place. Um, and that gets renegotiated, renegotiated and renewed through time. And that renegotiation of the, the distribution of power and resources happens through, uh, there's always a settlement and a renegotiation. That renegotiation happens through, partly through force, through coercive means. And the state always uses coercion to maintain the status quo, to, to maintain a certain, a certain settlement was a word that was used today. Entrenchment was a word that was used today. Um, so the state is always using coercion. And part of, a big part of the state, monopolization of power, uh, uh, coercion was also used today. The big role of the state is to be that coercive force. Um, and <clears throat> however, however, 
uh, the, the settlement is also always challenged by force. That force might be civil disobedient type of force, uh, an insurgency type of force. So there's always resistance through force and also the, the sustenance of the state through force. Um, and then the third part is uh, who lives, who dies was the second part. Um, and who tells us our story is the discursive part of it. Every constitutional system is going to have a constitutional mythology behind it, whether it's written into the constitution or not, whether it's about democracy or about um, the American dream, there, there is some sort of mythology that, that it's, it could be religious. Um, there's national narratives and constitutional mythologies that are assumed. And these mythologies usually aim at justifying, uh, discursively justifying the settlement, reinforcing it. However, simultaneously, there's also going to be a discursive rule to resist that settlement, especially by those who are uh, um, disadvantaged by the settlement, are always going to figure, try and figure out how to push back physically, but how, also how to push back discursively. Mm -hmm. um, so taking this, this um, um, big picture into account, um, I turn to the panelists and I'll ask them one question. Um, i ask this question first so that they get a moment to think about it. Um, whether you use the structure I just outlined or not, um, if you could um, think about and comment the other panelists' presentations from your point of view, for the, from the point of view of, for example, psychic violence or for, from a point of view of um, a discursive violence, and see if you say, if you could say from from my experience from my research I could say I've seen some of that in my research and this is what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> then I'll um, I'll have maybe a couple of questions specific questions that came to me uh, while I was li uh, uh, listening to your presentations um, and to Caetano uh, Caetano asked a question um, about collaboration with the state. Um, he, he asked that question in a, in a skeptical mode. Um, and uh, basically, the way I understood the question was, does it make sense to collaborate with the state? And I want to ask that question uh, to you, because from, from my perspective, from what I just said, collaborating with the state is trying to be part of that settlement, trying to renegotiate that settlement so that you are included or you are less excluded. Um, and with regards to Zaina's uh, comments about psychic violence, um, it, it's a similar question. Could that also be the state of Israel offering some benefits? You could, you could say bribing a certain uh, uh, segment of the population so that they get a better deal in that settlement and therefore uh, pledge their allegiance or be less resistant mm -hmm. to the state. So uh, rather than coercion, could it be more of on the you know, uh, distribution uh, spectrum? Um, and uh, finally, maybe this could be for everyone, but, but also maybe specifically uh, to Chelsea. Um, by, by the way, there is no race here is one of the things that I quote um, <laughs> in, in, as a discursive, in the discursive sphere of you know, uh, justifying a certain state of existence because the, there's, there's going to be a certain segment of the population that, or the state that will say there is no race. We are beyond racism. And there will be another discursively challenging that, uh, another group that will discursively challenge us and say, no, there is race. This, because this is how I experience it. That, that's just one comment. Now the question is, when you think about uh, the mechanisms, uh, and mechanis when I say mechanisms, I'm thinking more at the basic sociological level uh, of how race is articulated um, in different contexts. That you, you're doing comparisons, uh, but then is that mechanism also the same if we're thinking about how uh, class is articulated? Um, and part of the reason I think about this is because I 
when I think about racism, I think about ethnicism in, in the Ethiopian context because the concept of racism wouldn't apply. So is there a sociological uh, commonality that you could point to and say, this is what we could learn um, from this or that context? And with that, I, 40 minutes early, 40 seconds early, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for that uh, set of rather um, rather daunting questions, um, but I'm glad I am just a meager chair, so I don't have to engage with them. But um, I don't know how we would like to proceed. I think I think um, in a way there was a sort of Abadi asked a specific question, sort of to each of you. So you might want to start with that, and then reflect a little bit on how you position from where you are interpreted or took away something from your, your fellow panelists, which I thought was a great way of, of linking things together. So who would like to start? Would anybody like to? Yeah, OK, go for it. Oh, no, you're talking to somebody else. Oh, okay. oh no, <laughs> I, I thought you were saying that you would like to start. Well, somebody um, was just saying goodbye. No, oh, I see. OK. Um, I don't know if Caetano is still with us. Um, is, is Caetano still with us? And if he would like to, but anyway, why don't we start, Chelsea? Well, should we start with you, sure. maybe? <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, you, you're, the, the point about there's no race and there's these different configurations of, of, of how race is, is um, conceptualized or not was really powerful. And I think um, that was raised, so yeah. Yes, that was a very good question. Thank you so much um, for that. And thank you all again for um, this panel. Um, it's been a very, um, like the dialogue has been um, very generative and just and it's an honor to participate. Um, you know, so I guess I'll, I'll start with thinking about the ways, um, so East Europe and East Europe and Eurasia, you know, this is a very big space and, and place and even the framing of what is or what constitutes East Europe comes out of, um, you know, a very American approach, um, very Cold War approach to you know, you're creating regions in the world. And so I, I really want to start there by saying that because even to say, to think about race historically in East Europe um, speaks to so many varied experiences. And then um, Albania in particular, because Albania is not Slavic, um, and Albania had a very different experience of communism um, relative to the rest of the region. And that's why I bring up this is important because um, particularly in the moment um, um, following since since following the um, end of um, the Communist Party rule in 1991, which is Albania was the last country um, where communism fell. Um, there has uh, in, in this insistence of there is no race here. A lot of this is shaped though by the country's um, communist period, um, not just because the Communist Party proclaimed you know, a fight against anti-racism, um, aligning themselves with the Soviets, right? Race was something that was an American problem. It wasn't a problem um, you know, in the East Bloc. Um, but also because there are some um, in Albania and I'll also say in former Yugoslavia as well, which is a different, a different place and context, but who felt that they were participating in building something that was anti-racist, that there are sincere beliefs, not just in terms of propaganda, but that people were trying to participate in, um, in a society where um, they were eliminating race and class. And so that is relevant, um, because a lot of my interlocutors will say, well, that was propaganda. And in particular, in my research with Roma and Egyptians, a lot of Roma and Egyptians will say there were some material benefits that came with the Communist Party that do not exist in this contemporary moment, but also will acknowledge that um, the, that the communist state was not able to eliminate um, all ideas of racial hierarchies, right? So it's a very complex story, but I think that's really important for understanding these articulations of that there is no um, race here, or, or what I call like a racelessness, right? Um, what David Theo Goldberg calls an a-raciality, um, that these um, investments in, in this are both shaped by these histories, but also too by an unwillingness to name whiteness and how whiteness operates. And so that the racelessness is shaped both by what are very genuine histories of attempts to, to think about how we could collectively be um, you know, a, a, an entity, a human race that was um, not necessarily outside, but even like beyond ra ideas of race, right? 
Um, or, or, or even to the extent that people participated in a very Marxist project of thinking about race as not biological, right? But thinking about race very differently than, say, somewhere like the United States. So that those efforts were there. But I'm also arguing, though, is that racelessness is also about you know, an unwillingness to name race, um, even though race continues to operate. Um, and class, and, and I'll, I'll wrap it up here, but class gets sometimes used as a way of, um, of participating in that racelessness, such, 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 such that people will acknowledge class. Um, I have a, a, sec a part of my research where someone says to me, yeah, well, you know, there's no race here, there's no problems here because everybody's poor. Right? And so like that, that means that we can't even talk about this because everybody's just poor here. Mm -hmm. and, and also, why does it even matter if we bring up race or not? Because again, you know, everybody's poor. And, and so like, how do we contend with these articulations um, with the material conditions, right, with the lived realities, and yet still, still try to examine these racial hierarchies that are also economic, right? Because even in a society where people might proclaim that everyone's poor, somehow Roma and Egyptians are still poorer than everybody else who's poor, right? Um, and so I think that's a really good, um, good question. I'll try to stop there. I don't know if I had more answers or more openings, no, that's, but that's I'll great. stop Thank there. <laughs> so, um, Caetano, I hope you can hear me. I, I'm going to bring you in here because I think um, this point that, that was just made by Chelsea about there's no race really goes to the question that you raised about integrationism and kind of like a colorblind assimilationism. So I wondered if you could just uh, maybe comment a little bit how you see that. Um, you know, to what extent are Roma racialized or not racialized, and to what extent does this kind of you know pragmatic flexibility affect the ability of of Roma advocates to really make demands or to to uh, to assert you know um, their own their own political agency. So, to, so I believe that this is a, one more of this trap that I was uh, trying to to speak uh, before in the in the fair presentation. Uh, I can speak, uh, for example, in my case, I'm Roma from Spain. And I always uh, have the chance, I like to, to repeat and to emphasize our collective rights are violated every day in Spain. Because the answer is always in this line. They, when, when we demand collective rights, say, so, okay, we have your, you have your right covered because you are a Spanish citizen. So as a Spanish citizen, you have all the, the right, the human rights system, the rule of law, all the right to participate. But when we want to let our political path, for example, there is no option to study Romani philology in Spain or in Portugal or in any other university close. If we want to develop a, a process of recovering our language as a part of our collective right, the answer is always the same. You know, you have your right as a citizen, but no collective right. When, as you know, I don't know how familiar you are with the Spanish political content, but they have collective right for territories. Catalonia has collective right. Uh, Basque has collective right. We are, uh, I believe, a, a nation here inside, and our rights are constantly violated. And that's why I'm connected with the, uh, you know, with the reflection that uh, Professor Abadid uh, Ibrahim was doing uh, at the beginning with the question of collaborating with the state. I mean, I, I completely understand you know, that you are pointing out that collaboration as a way to influence, as a way to, to promote change. But of course, I'm thinking for a very particular situation of the Roma people in, in, in Europe. And for me, there are two main questions there. The first one is, which space is there for collaboration with the state? Because of this, or this integration approach, as I was saying, set a political framework that decide what is the agenda. I can give you an example. Not too long ago, a brother uh, contacted me because they wanted to create a, a project to because they were some fun and they want to do something useful for our people. So when they asked me, what do you think we should do? I say, okay, for me, one of the priorities are to tackle police violence and abuse a massive uh, Roman carceration. When he tried to be a project uh, to tackle this issue, there were no category in this, uh, in this, because all the categories, as I was saying, are civilizing, are connected with, I don't know, to avoid uh, school absenteeism, for example, uh, to implement uh, European values, whatever that means. But our own agenda, the thing that are uh, 
uh, our people are worried about are always out of this agenda. Yeah. So it's so really about, this, about uh, changing Roma rather than actually changing the way Roma yes. communities are treated. Sorry, I'm going to be very rude and interrupt you because we're running short of time. But thank sure. you. That was really, really helpful. So for our other two panelists, I wonder if you could just maybe engage. Both of you talked about the state, the role of the state, the state as a, a key tool for, say, for Dalits or for poor people, um, as, as a way of, of making demands or as, as, a, as an instrument against um, marginalization or oppression. On the one hand, on the other hand, the state as, you know, um, uh, a, um, a controller of, of interests and power. I think that was the point that you were also making about, about the way the Israeli state has, has operated. So maybe each of you could just reflect a little bit on these d dual roles of state as oppressor or, or, or um, exploiter or assimilator in chief on the one hand and on the other hand that this clearly is one of the tools that those who are just empowered have at their disposal to use mechanisms that are that are present. So, um, yeah, maybe maybe um, uh, Zena, you might want to start with a few words, and then we'll end with with um, with Suraj, and then maybe have just one question. And I'm going to prioritize the question from a student. So, if there's a brave student who'd like to ask a question, that would be fantastic. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks a lot, and thank you everybody for uh, uh, this great question. So, what I would, what I'm really like uh, uh, provoked with thinking instead of the role of the state, the schizophrenic nature of the state, mm. and I think there is something very schizophrenic about the whole exercise of what a state, a modern state in today's interpretation, should look like, or could look like, or would want to look like. And when it comes to the state of Israel and its practices while propagating a very modern image of democracy on one hand, it is really based on the utter, utter denial of the mere existence of another group. So it's not only an exercise of oppression, subjugation, but also different forms of erasure. So there is the erasure of the subjectivity, the rootedness, the narrative of belonging of one people. So there is one state that is really propagating a very Western um, language that really appeals in its color and in its mode of communication to the Western world. But at the same time, there is, a, there is an exercise of utter oppression that the law fails in capturing. If we want to go back to our language of the law and the black letter law, the law really fails in capturing the nuances of the experiences and what happens to one people at the expense of others. So there we see exercises of land annexation, grabbing of land, appropriation of the narrative, erasure of narrative, but there is also another, another very violent exercise of hallowing me of my own narrative of belonging. So this kind of psychic annexation is where the state of Israel with all of its apparatus, with all of its weaponry, machinery, whatever tools we're seeing today, what is actually happening is that it really needs this very, the weak, subaltern minority, less than 400 people, to authenticate it over, uh, its claims over the land. So really, like this hegemony of a state needs 400 people and the narrative of, of belonging to authenticate its claim. And this is where I see there is a very schizophrenic nature of the modern state building that is really based on the utter denial of some people's rights. And, and this is something, I, I, I will end with this, that. The, uh, there is something that goes much more beyond divide and conquer and passing like sub, um, oppressive laws or denying the Palestinians of their right of return that we physically pack and go back to our homeland. It's like the distortion of narrative that the people in their self-interpretation, because precisely of what you've mentioned about the, these minor civic rights gains, I would start thinking twice, like do I want to be a Samaritan Palestinian or a Samaritan Israeli, but anyway, in my religion, there's I'm the true Israeli, so I can play around with this language, blurring the and conflating the lines between race, religion, identity, belonging, and rootedness in favor of the state, mm -hmm. of the state that is interpreted today because this state gives me some mundane rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Suraj, so like I'm about one minute. <laughs> no, I'm, I think uh, they spoke to some of my views, so I don't have to extend. Uh, um, you know, 
state is in many sense <coughs> ethnographic and there is a hyphen between ethno and graphic <laughs> that it is always located in certain identities and it never ends so when we think we have a state uh, then we think about the structures that manifest in the state and one of the important structures of the state is military or the armed wing of the state and so when somebody is ruling the state in the form of democratic practice or a dictatorship, we think that person is representing us. One of the pitfalls of modern nation state is it is always constructed in opposition to European colonization. And the European colonial framework, sometimes they are carried on, some frameworks and some are discarded, but the institutional hierarchies remain. And so that, and, and now there is a resurgence, especially among the people who want to get rid from the colonial structure, then what do you give? It's not that you have a very pure structure before colonial, at least in India. You didn't, you didn't have like a, a beautiful wonderland in India. It was again a very hierarchical, toxic, violent society. So now we are facing as to how do we manage it in this exclusionary dynamics, but at the same time representative dynamics. So when my head of the state is representing me at the UN, I will feel good, or, or, or when my cricket team is playing something, I'll feel good. But, but once the thing is finished, I know I have to go back to my own squalors, and I know they have to go back to their own mansions. And I think that kind of class, caste differences do manifest, and I think state is... Oh, so schizophrenia seems like a useful concept. <laughs> That's, I like that okay, word, actually. Well, thank you so much. So is there one question? Does somebody have a question? Is there a student who'd like to ask a... Yes, thank you. Great. Excellent. Do you need, here's a mic coming for you. Hi, sorry, so I'm an undergrad visiting from Columbia, um, and I'm also um, part of Jewish Voice for Peace on campus, so the questions that Suraj brought up about like this phantom of violence and trauma and persecution which manifests in people's minds and mm -hmm. follows people like through generations, mm -hmm. even if they've assimilated into a society where those structures maybe don't, haven't replicated themselves That's in the right. same way, was very timely to me and I think to many people in this room and I think it touches on this larger conversation of like psychic violence and like violence which exists inside the mind and in the psychology of people. So I was just wondering if you could speak more about what one does with that violence which follows people through generations, how, how one reckons with that. I don't, I don't know if anyone has an answer. It's a wonderful question. Um, so would somebody like to tackle that? Um, I mean, I think it, it speaks to just about you capture something that everybody spoke about in some ways, this legacy. And actually, Professor Ware started by talking about this kind of, you know, in a way, grotesque way in which past trauma is now replicating itself in a different form of contemporary trauma. But would anybody like to just say a word? Any any. Uh, any quick thought about that? Um, yeah, sure. I will okay. hesitate yeah. to speak when there are two women on the panel. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, would, would, would you like to say something? Uh, um, well, I mean, yeah. I'll, I'm going to let I'm going to let Zena have the final word on this. No, I am. I am because I also really love this, this. You've given me a lot to think about with the psychic violence. I will say. So far, the conversations today, and beginning with what Dr. West and Magda were saying, as well as what um, Suraj and Zena brought up, this um, idea of the band is really sitting with me and what it means to play in the band collectively. And so that's what I immediately was thinking about in response to your very, like, very good question. Um, and what does that mean in terms of building um, the, the collective, um, but not to make it sound so ideal. They're like, oh, just pick up an instrument. We're just going to play in harmony together. Um, but but really, what does that mean to work through and and unite and 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 all of the aspects that go into that? And so that's what I was really sitting with. Um, and, and to name and recognize one another's suffering and trauma, even when you know it's silenced or or misrecognized or unnamed. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you, Zena. Thank you. Uh, you I'm, I was thinking, yeah. Yeah, Zena, would you? Zena, you don't have to, but if you'd like to just say a word or two, that would be great. If you don't have to. Two quick ideas or thoughts. Like one is how difficult it is to continue trying to think creatively amid mm -hmm. suffering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one thing that resonates with me, and this is why I thought of the Samaritan project, is 
how difficult it is to be creative amid suffering and mm. how it how difficult it is to be innovative amid catastrophes that are happening and how to, not only like to converge on our interests or not to, to look for allies but rather like this band idea so how can we be innovative in building alliances or a bit being always constantly constantly reminded of how can we appeal to broader audience because sometimes we attempt to just be talking in silos or maybe talking in preaching to the same choir with this band. So how can this band go into different mediums and communicate in different tones and music and languages also to a broader audience? Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That's yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you for such a wonderful <laughs> panel. I used to play cello. Yes, I, what do you do? Actually, I so, <laughs> Yeah, we are going to um, pause for a break so we can have a quick co coffee break. You can bring your coffee back, and <laughs> panel two will start at that, 4 o'clock. I, I, I don't think we're going to do this. We're I've been there a long time. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so we also, yeah, let me.
Albania. I think you're being snuck on by Mr. West. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave you there. No, no, no. Yeah, I don't want to see you. It's a fascinating question. Did you write about this in anything yeah. that you have? So, so, yeah. in my, so in my book, that's what um, the book I hope. There's a whole chapter. I'm trying to you won't have a chapter. Could you, you have a whole chapter? Yeah. Can I find it? Thank <laughs> you. 
like that and then when you want We will be starting. Is this on? Hello. Can people hear me? Hello? No? Now? Can people hear me? Why can't people hit me? Hello? Hello? Can people hear me now? Is this on? Um, we're going to be starting now. <laughs> so if people can um, bring themselves back inside and settle down. I see. OK. OK. Oh, very good. Because Sawson has been working on racialization. That's great. Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. No, no. So 
Aiden. Aiden's on the job. I thought he's eating the dog's treats for a second. I thought that there was the bag of the treats. I'm sorry you got uh, relocated to that seat. Are you sure there is no other uh, seat? I think it was supposed everything to end at 6.30, you know? I think so. Okay. Okay, here we go. Back into the swing of things. Um, this is panel two. Um, facets of state violence across the globe, the case of health and, de and death. And our chair, um, Dr. Marie, where's my paper? My glass is off. <laughs> Dr. Marie um, Plazim is an FXB Health and Human Rights Fellow and National Science Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow. Her research investigates racial bias training in medical education and clinical practice, race-based medicine, algorithmic bias, and health policy. She applies critical quantitative, quantitative co computational, and mixed methodologies to detect, examine, and quantify how structural racism in medicine jeopardizes healthcare delivery, access, and quality. Um, join me in welcoming panel two, and I'm looking forward to hearing everything everyone has to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Keisha. Um, so today, um, good afternoon. Today we'll be focusing on panel two which explores the intersectionality of state violence, um, environmental justice, and health inequities. So I'm gonna run things a little different. I'll just read everyone's bio super quickly so that we can get to the presentations and have a rich discussion. Our first presenter is Sarah Albosha, the Director of Health Law Programs. She is the Director of the Capacity Building Initiative and a visiting professor of law. Her work focuses on health, gender, and human rights, and in particular, advancing accountability and justice for violations for the right of health. Our second presenter um, is Professor Asaswan Aldurim. 
um, in a, a professor at American University of Europe and a Health and Human Rights Fellow also at Harvard Ethics Based Center. Um, her work centers on human rights principles to illuminate and act upon social inequities in health across the life course and focus on refugee populations and labor migrants in the Arab region and beyond. Our third panelist today is a doctoral researcher, Sebujin Fuzula. Um, for the past six years, her work has served as a junior researcher at the Center for Social Studies in the Project of Politics, the Politics of Anti-Racism in Europe and Latin America, Knowledge Production, Decision Making, and Collective Struggles, and is cu currently pursuing a PhD in Human Rights and Contemporary Society. Um, our next panelist is Savota uh, Taro Tokoy, um, is a research fellow at Central European University. Um, uh, Simona Teratokoi is a Roma from Romania, currently a tutor at the Roma Graduate Preparation Program at CEU, and a research fellow at the Rethink Central Eastern Europe of German Marshall Fund of the United States. Our last panelist um, is Dr. Christina Dragomir. Uh, is a clinical associate professor at New York University. Um, she is an immigrant and scholar of social justice and human rights, working on migration, gender, and the environment. And lastly, our discussant, um, Dr. Mary T. Bassett, who we've heard from earlier, is the director of the FXP Center and also a professor of practice in health and human rights at the Harvard THG, TH Chan School of Public Health. Um, so with that, we'll start with our first presentation. Welcome, panel two. I'm gonna start by setting my timer as well um, so that I, I don't go over time. But I wanna say uh, thank you so much to Magda Mantake for inviting me to this wonderful celebration of Roma resilience and also a remembrance and understanding of the extent to which issues of racism, colonialism still pervade the globe and still affect uh, people's access to their human rights. And I also wanna thank the team for their patience in helping to organize this. Um, let me try and navigate the PowerPoint here. So I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about the, the work that I have done, which is focused primarily on how state violence manifests and affects health and death. Sorry, could I have a little support for the PowerPoint? So while I wait a little bit for um, the PowerPoint to come up, my work focuses mostly on making the right to health justiciable. The understanding that, um, all right, it's okay, it's, it's missing. I, I nearly succumbed to peer pressure of having a, a PowerPoint up because I heard everybody was doing one. So I think this is the universe telling me that I should never have yeah. a PowerPoint. Of the um, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to talk about uh, the Gambia, and I'm going to talk about how state violence presents itself in or manifests itself through, for example, health dictatorships and legislation and lawmaking. Um, health dictatorships is really the use of presidential powers or the powers of the state to undermine individual autonomy, which then impacts the way in which health is enjoyed and in severe cases leads to death. For me, the most recent example of a health dictatorship would be, for example, some of the things that happened in Brazil, some of the you know, uh, discussions around COVID when the, we were talking about, was it ivermectin? I, hi, yes, yeah. 
talking about that as a viable treatment when we know that the science was telling us something different. So in the Gambia, what happened is former President Yaya Jame was a dictator who rose to power after a coup in 1994. He was, of course, subsequently elected and stayed in power until 2016 when the current president uh, ousted him after an election. In 2007, he declared that he had a mandate from God that the seven herbs that he found in the Quran were actually a cure for HIV. And so he was going to begin to implement this cure uh, on people living with HIV. At the time, imagine this president who is always surrounded by military uh, personnel who uh, exudes so much power and control that anyone who opposes him is either eliminated through killing or kidnapping, disappeared or arrested. And this is really the environment that we're, we're in and the context of his announcement. And so on the strength of that announcement, he then courted or went to uh, societies or support groups for people living with HIV and encouraged them to join his uh, program. And so the first nine people that were recruited into his program really felt that because of the persona of who he was, because of the power that he wielded, there was really no option of saying no. And so they were enrolled coercively. Um, once in the program, they were forced to take bitter concoctions and they were topically massaged by him as well. And um, what he did was he, he basically then um, brought in videographers and told the victims that, you know, I'm just videotaping you for research purposes. This is not going to go anywhere. Again, he claims that there was consent, but we are understanding the situation here. Yeah. It's a dictator, a tyrant, a person who wields power, always surrounded by armed guards. And so they were filmed. Uh, most of the people, most of the treatment regimens not only consisted of drinking the bitter concoction, but being massaged while half naked, both men and women, the massages were conducted by Jame himself, and he would not only massage the half naked bodies, but he would also massage the genitalia of both men and women. So he, he wanted to bring in more people, and so he used the footage of the people that he was massaging without their consent and broadcast it on national television as a way to show that he is curing HIV. And here is a program showing our you know, gallant leader curing HIV. And so you can imagine the, number, the trauma that was suffered, the right to privacy that was violated, the right to health itself, the sexual abuse that took place, and the trauma that the, the victims went through. One of the things that Jame's declaration also did was it changed the way in which health policy and HIV uh, in the country was addressed. Uh, the UN Special Representative at, uh, at the time, Dr. Ellen Guaradzimba, you know, felt compelled to sort of correct the misconception that no, there, there is no cure. HIV remains incurable because that's what the science said. Once she said that, she was declared persona non grata and given 48 hours to leave the Gambia. And that just had a chilling effect on the entire country. Um, healthcare workers that we spoke to when we went into the country to conduct some research with colleagues, you know, just said, if she could be told to leave, who was I to tell my patients that this cure doesn't work? Who was I to advise my patients to continue their regimen of uh, HIV drugs? And who was I to, to speak out against Jame? There was a perception that he has ears everywhere. And so what then resulted is that healthcare workers are no longer giving the standard information about how to prevent HIV or how to stay uh, you know, undetectable. The other outcome and the impact was that you know, um, there was a drainage even as the HIV program that Jami was doing grew and more people came after seeing the testimonials on TV, after seeing the different people being displayed, there was a draining of the healthcare resource base within the conventional healthcare systems also because you could be better paid working in Jame's HIV cure than you could be paid working in a conventional hospital. And so Jame, I think, presents a really strong example of how state violence through political mechanisms can have terrible and damning effects on the right to health of people and their ability to enjoy their health. 
one of the things that he also mandated when you joined his program was that you stop your ARVs, that you no longer visit any of your family members. People were kept confined because this is how his treatment worked. You had to be inpatient and there were guards around and family members could not really visit you. You couldn't eat food from outside. And so there was a spread of um, other infectious diseases because now people are immunocompromised. They're not on the ARVs. People got TB and some people sadly died while in those conditions. Um, I'm, I'm remembering what we often say about the law, that the law can be both a tool of oppression and also a tool of liberation. And so when Jame finally fell, there was a desire to sort of seek justice for this situation that had occurred, a desire to ensure that you know, people living with HIV were recognized as victims. And one of the monumental things that happened was the creation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the Gambia. That commission was important because it gave the opportunity to rewrite the narrative to address this abuse of state power that impacted health and was an important uh, and significant institution because it directed that Jame and the Minister of Health who had supported him and all the institutions that he had created to push this false HIV cure should face some form of justice. It was important because in a way it allowed right to health violations to be folded within the umbrella term of crimes against humanity. What does it mean to have your dignity impaired? What does it mean to recognize that the fact that you could not enjoy health because the president was draining resources to support his own personal project? What does it mean to, to recognize that for the indignity and the harm that it is and to recognize the number of people that died uh, during that program? And so, you know, I think one of the things that I also grappled with in thinking about state violence and thinking about health dictatorships was also the role, was also thinking about the role of the international community, right? States operate at the international level and the governance that they create through international law is also important to be adhered to. What is the responsibility of international governmental organizations, institution, and frameworks to ensure that they step in when the state is using violence against its own people? What is the responsibility to ensure that there is protection and that the state isn't the only avenue for redress? Um, so moving on to the second type of manifestation of state violence through, okay, time is up, but through lawmaking and legislation, I will quickly mention the Jamaica Offenses Against the Person Act, which was from 1864, and how these colonial laws were widespread over the region of the Caribbean and other colonial institutions and what those meant for creating a culture of homophobia and fear that made it difficult for people uh, who identify as sexual minorities to be able to access the healthcare that they needed and the importance of tearing those down. And I can discuss a little bit more the work at the Inter-American Commission that went towards repealing those laws. Thank you so much. Dr. abdul you're next. Yes, thank thank you. you. Thank you so much. I guess I have to use my time very um, carefully, the 10 minutes. I'm not going to show slides, actually, no. in solidarity with <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> I'm not going to show slides. I'm just going to look at the, okay. yeah. So let me start by uh, thanking um, Magda and everyone at FXB very much uh, for inviting me to present at the first Roma conference that I ever attend. Um, I'm going to present on Palestinian refugees Half of Palestinians around the world are refugees, so we know that we focus a lot on Palestinians inside historic Palestine, but I'm going to talk about Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and in, uh, in Jordan. And the title of my talk is about the denial of rights versus the denial of identity. Uh, I'm gonna maybe mention a couple of the uh, terms or uh, build on some of the themes that have already been talked about in the previous um, panel, let me start with the word catastrophe. So, and what Palestinians, or in Arabic, is called the Nakba in 1948, where um, 750,000 Palestinians uh, became displaced 
Um, many remained in historic Palestine. 100,000 Palestinians became displaced in Lebanon and around 440,000 became displaced in Jordan. Now the idea is, or what we know is that in Lebanon, Palestinians remain stateless and deprived of rights. In Jordan, on the other hand, most but not all of Palestinians um, received citizenship. So we don't talk so much about uh, state structural violence against Palestinian refugees in Jordan. Let me just provide a couple of, uh, some information about Lebanon and Jordan. So in Lebanon, um, the political system is a, a parliamentary confessionalism. Lebanon has lived through a civil war between 1975 and 1990, um, in which Palestinians participated, uh, were um, actively involved in the war and were victims of the war. Lebanon remains at war with Israel. Now, Jordan cannot be more different than Lebanon. Uh, Jordan is a monarchy. The political system is monarchy. Um, again, um, most but not all Palestinians in Jordan received citizenship. And currently, half of, half of Jordan's, um, half of the people who live in Jordan are of Palestinian origin. In 1970, uh, there was um, a Black September, uh, which was um, basically a war and, and uh, Jordan, um, a conflict between Palestinian uh, factions and the Jordanian monarchy and um, uh, anyways, I won't say too much about that. Uh, unlike Lebanon, Jordan is, has a peace treaty with Israel. Um, in Lebanon, Palestinians remain stateless and 63% of Palestinians reside in segregated uh, refugee camps. They're excluded from, um, from uh, working in 60 professions. They're uh, denied the right to own property. And their mobility is very restricted. In Jordan, again, um, uh, Palestinians, most of Palestinians are citizen refugees. So although they are Palestinian refugees, they're in fact, they hold um, Jordanian citizenship. They were granted the citizenship. Uh, this citizenship was granted to all Palestinians who became displaced in Jordan and those who uh, remained displaced in the West Bank until 1967, because Jordan was uh, in charge of the West Bank. However, in 1988, actually, a proportion of Palestinians experienced a withdrawal of citizenship, particularly those who live uh, in the West Bank. And Palestinians in Gaza, even if they became displaced in Jordan at a later time, did not receive citizenship. So the situation is very complex. And you know, we cannot just say that Palestinians in Jordan are citizens. In fact, there are uh, subgroups of Palestinians who remain stateless uh, and who live in Jordan. But only 18% of Palestinians uh, reside inside segregated camps. The rest um, uh, live in, in different, I mean, integrated with uh, uh, in cities and towns in Jordan. Um, in Jordan, there's this uh, sort of social contract whereby um, Palestinians would receive citizenship and a large proportion actually have um, obtained social mobility. Uh, but the contract is that the Palestinian identity would be muted and, and then Palestinians would just identify as Jordanians and not express that um, identity. In fact, there have been a lot of um, uh, policies and attempts to mute Palestinian identity. For, for example, there has been this um, campaign uh, labeled Jordan First, uh, which on the surface is an economic, uh, new liberal economic plan, but in fact, under the, underneath the service, how much? <laughs> Five minutes, okay, that's not bad. But underneath the surface, it's really about muting all other identities um, uh, except, you know, identifying as a Jordanian citizen. Um, so what this has led to, uh, the different forms of violence, of state violence, so the denial of rights in Lebanon has led to actually heightening Palestinian identity and um, producing a lot of uh, work, uh, so social studies, uh, health studies on Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. On the other hand, in Jordan, um, there's this idea that, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian refugees in Jordan remain a blind spot uh, in both anthropological, social, um, and political studies, and in the public health literature. Um, 
but but this is not you know I. I'm not generalizing. There are some studies about Palestinians in Jordan, and there are some good studies, uh, critical studies. But in comparison to Lebanon, where there's a wealth of studies on Palestinian refugees, um, uh, you know, Lebanon, uh, I'm sorry, Jordan remains a place where there's very little known about Palestinian refugee um, identities and Palestinian refugee health. Uh, so what, has, what are the implications of you know, the different forms of reception in Lebanon and Jordan on the availability of data to study health and on the production of research on, on health in the two places? Um, in Lebanon, there are a lot, uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to say a lot, but a lot more um, uh, availability of data to study the health of Palestinian refugees compared to in Jordan. So in addition to the data that UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, collects and the reports that they put out, in fact, UNICEF, um, uh, which collects what's called the multi-indicator cluster surveys, uh, data on maternal and child health, UNICEF, in fact, collects data specifically on Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. And some of this data is even more uh, up to date than the data that is collected on Lebanese citizens themselves. In 2016, also, UNICEF collected data um, on all of Lebanon uh, in, that included uh, Lebanese citizens, Palestinian refugees, and uh, Syrian refugees, which allowed researchers to actually uh, carry out um, comparisons between the health outcomes of uh, Palestinians and, and uh, Lebanese. Um, also, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency um, is able to collect data on, um, on Palestinian refugees inside camps and outside, um, outside camps, and they've done that in 2010, 2015, and 2022. On the other hand, in Jordan, other than the UNRWA data that covers only the proportion of Palestinian refugees who seek services from UNRWA, and in comparison to Lebanon, this is a much smaller proportion because, um, because you know, uh, Palestinian refugees have citizenship and they can go to public or private um, healthcare providers. Um, in, in Jordan, uh, UNICEF does not collect data, but uh, USAID collects demographic and health survey data. In 2009, 2012, 2017, uh, there was no mention at all of Palestinian refugees in, in this data that was collected on Jordan. Um, in fact, the only mention is uh, where, where an, um, an individual seeks um, health services, and UNRWA was listed, uh, was listed as uh, as one of the um, health providers. And UNRWA, in fact, the name of UNRWA was written inaccurately uh, as the United Nations Refugee Welfare uh, Agency, whereas it's the UN Relief and Works Agency. Um, there's actually a lot more on uh, Syrian refugees, a lot more knowledge about the public health um, outcomes of Syrian refugees in Jordan and Syrian or Palestinian refugees from Syria and Jordan than there is about uh, Palestinian refugees um, in Jordan. Um, I know my time is up. The only thing I want to finish with is that this, this, you know, the state policies that trickles down to the availability of data on, on social and health outcomes um, in fact, translates to the knowledge that is produced about the health of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon versus in Jordan. So this is um, this is a very quick scoping that I've done. I'm very familiar with the literature on uh, Palestinian refugees in, in Lebanon, but a very quick scoping that I did on research on Jordan shows that, uh, in fact, the, the articles and the research that's done on, on Lebanon uh, evokes or focuses on the social conditions, the social determinants, and the structural um, violence or the policies in Lebanon and how those impact um, health in, uh, of Palestinian refugees. On the other hand, a cursory look, a very quick scoping of uh, the articles that have been produced since 2015 on, uh, in Jordan shows you know, that there are some um, small-scale studies um, on Palestinian refugees in Jordan that focus more on um, um, access to healthcare, um, uh, I'm sorry, not access to healthcare, but medication um, adherence, smoking, uh, studies that focus a lot more on the behaviors and, um, uh, and do not evoke any, any structural or social determinants uh, of health. So I'll, I'll end here. And 
Thank you. So our next panelist, um, <coughs> Sebastian Fajula. I think we're live. Okay. We're ready when you are. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Happy Roma Day. I'm, I'm very happy to be able to share this space with you, at least uh, online. I thank my sister Magda Mataki for the invitation and the Roma program in Harvard. Okay, so let me start immediately because I know time is uh, short. So for me, as a Romani woman, it is inevitable to start with the recent dehumanizing obstetric violence that one of our Roma sisters um, called Malica Mihailovic in Ser Serbia suffered at the hands of a brutal doctor and that led to the death of her baby, which is yet another case of an institutional violence against Romani women in Europe and it's just one more death for the Roma people. The 27-year-old mom's ordeal began on January 11, 2024, when she was admitted to the General Hospital because she was a week overdue. Until then, everything had been fine and normal with the pregnancy. It was decided to induce the, the birth, and when nothing happened after an hour, it became apparent that she could not deliver naturally and that a C-section would be necessary. When the gynecologist or obstetrician in chief named Dr. Marko Maksimovic turned up after some hours later, Marita recounted that, I'm quoting, the nurses tell him that nothing is happening, that I, can, I can't open up, but he insisted that everything continues as it should. And after hours of agony, she described her shocking ordeal. He puts his hands over my mouth, twisted my hands, threatened to knock out my teeth. He also insulted me based on my nationality, and he also told me that he would hit me and that I would have two skulls. I begged and begged for doctor's help to deliver me by C-section, to save my child, where at that time he hits me and squeezes my jaw, threatening that he will hit me. Then, as reported by Republika Serbian a journal, the doctor jumped onto her stomach and tried to push the baby out, but it got uh, stuck in the birth canal. Maritza told the reporter, at that moment, I lost consciousness and I was receiving oxygen, but the baby remained stuck. My rib was broken from the pressure and the baby inhalated mechanism. She could breathe in but could not breathe out and her heart stopped at 11.05 p.m. The infant was resuscitated and rushed to a hospital in Novi Sad. The next day at 6 a.m. Marita received a phone call informing her that her baby passed away. Another case, the December 2020 death of a Romani woman named Anna in the official Roma camp in Napoli, for example, received almost no media attention. According to the Italian Roma rights group Movimento Ketane, Anna started to feel unwell shortly after she returned to the camp for Roma nearby hospital where she had given birth via C-section. The camp had, be, ha, had been declared a red zone, meaning no one was allowed to leave after many of its uh, inhabitants tested positive for, for COVID-19. Anna's sisters tried to assist her out of the camp to seek her treatment every day for a week while her condition worsened, but they were denied exit by the two police officers guarding the gates. On the last day after the officers once again refused to let them out, Anna collapsed the gates lifeless. Movimiento Ketane and other Roma activists have been, have been attempting to draw attention to the case, but only a few local newspapers covered it. While I do not think to discuss the cases of the case of Maritza and Anna in details, rather I bring them into today's discussion. Uh, to argue that these cases are not isolated ones and instead they form part of a continual structural violence. It is the violence that many Romani women share in silence because the institutional violence against us has been normalized for too long. So to be able to denounce this violence, to demand racial justice and to create a collective process of healing, we must situate and discuss violence against Romani women within the global structural violence. The health institutions and the, and the inequalities within are, are not unrelated to, to the global racist systems. The question is how do we, under, how do we understand, how do we argue in regard to the ra uh, structural racism toward Romani women seeking health care and the right to live in a dignified life? Life. It is as alarming the data collected in 2021 
by the European Agency for Fundamental Rights across the European countries, revealing a stark reality. Romani women face a life expectancy on average 11 years shorter than women in the majority population. As alarming is the data, so is the absolute silence in policy approaches, political and academic discussions in regard to that uh, data, including the silence in women's and social movements. It is this current political scenario of continual normalized structural violence against uh, Roma and, and, and Romani uh, women and, and their everyday encounters with uh, racist um, hate speech and, and abuses and violence. So for, for me, for us, uh, it's it's crucial to situate these racial experiences on the global structural racism in order to fully understand the interconnectedness of the system. In fact, such normalization of the anti-Roma violence against Romani women exists precisely because their racial experiences have been either neglected or whitened by the white agendas in the debates and policy making. So the question to ask is why aren't Romani women's life worth to protect and preserve? The experiences of denying Roma lives have shown that unfortunately they are not worth to, 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 to be preserved, as we saw it in many cases in, in Europe, in the case of Stanislav Tomas, in the case of Little Olga from, from, from Greece, in the case of Anna from Italy, in the case of, of Maritza, and unfortunately the list came go on and on. When the question of health in relation to Romani women had been addressed, it was mainly from a white perspective and with a white agenda and that had a civilizatory mission. Many reports, workshops dedicated on addressing how many children Romani women have, how many abortions, how to teach Romani women to wash their hands while forcing them and placing them to live in slums, in ghettos, in the most dehumanized conditions with no access to clean water. Water, while all these structural conditions are being ignored in all those analyses, reports, workshops, and so on. And so, on. so in, short, in, in short, such programs, uh, reports, workshops, and, and, and so on, have civilizatory uh, aim, uh, whose ideology is to humanize Roma, to teach them how to, to act and behave as responsible uh, citizens. All these results with creating a social and moral panic in the relation to Roma as bodies to be afraid of, the barbarians that bring disorder within the white imaginary European order. Blaming the Roma once again for their situation, while state violence, health inequalities, Roma deaths produced by the racial systems remain outside from the debates and state and institutions and their institutions are not held uh, accountable. This is the political scenario we are looking at the, at the past two de decades in relation to the so-called Roma integration policies that have contributed to the exclusion of Roma people's historical narratives that expose their racial antagonism embedded in the formation of modern societies mm -hmm. and therefore have also depol depoliticized the Roma struggle, excluding anti-racism as a project of liberation. The structural form of racism and their relation relationship to the health health inequalities remain under study in relation to Roma people. Given that anti-Roma racism shapes the lives of Roma, it seems not only reasonable but necessary to study the hypothesis that everyday exposure to hate speech, persecution, exclusion, and anti-Roma violence influences Roma health. There must be an investigation how residential school mm -hmm. segregation affects mm -hmm. Roma lives. Uh, how ghettos, place, placements to live in, in into ghettos, police persecution affects Roma Roma uh, Roma health, and uh, that's it for now. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to be here. My presentation is titled uh, Romani Settlements, Environmental Racism and Disinvestment. And uh, what do I mean by Romani Settlements? I'll tell you in a bit, but mainly they are um, slums, shanty towns, ghettos, squats, uh, dwellers um, that are existing all across uh, Europe. And I really want to thank Sebi for kind of setting the, the scene uh, about the situation in the camps, in Italy, in, in other places as well, but also the effects that this type of settlements have for the Roma uh, in general, but also to Caetano for um, pointing out some of the uh, police brutality ca the case, uh, cases that are happening in these uh, camps, but also to Chelsea for showing the, the pictures with uh, the Roma communities in Albania. So um, I felt that it's important to emphasize and shed light on, on the um, situation of, of these informal settlements. I think this is something that we should not accept in Europe. Uh, this is happening, and uh, this is not something that it's representative, of course, for all the Roma communities. But uh, the situation that the Roma are living there, it's, uh, it's, it shouldn't be acceptable. Um, so um, there has been some research on the ghettoization of, of these uh, informal Roma settlements, and they have been uh, subject to various scholarly works. Um, or, uh, looking at all sorts of um, segregation mechanisms, uh, the um, uh, governmentality used by certain European countries to control the Roma population. But um, there were also studies conducted by many non-Roma anthropologists, um, many studies that blame the Roma, blame the victim, for the situation these communities are in. And many of these studies are failing to look at the issue of discrimination and exclusion and how the society is actually uh, pushing the Roma to, to live in such uh, spaces. And I would like to do a, a kind of a pulling because I know it's, it's a bit difficult to stay in, a, in two panels with a lot of uh, heavy emotional um, content. I want to do a bit of pulling and I want to ask you what comes to your mind when you hear uh, the toponyms such as Dallas, Mexico, uh, Shanghai? What comes to your mind? Exactly, but this is not uh, what's happening when we are looking at what do we mean in our countries. I'm from Romania. We have a Dallas community in Romania, but this is actually an ironic um, a way to, to denote many of the Roma settlements that we have. So we have Shanghai in Serbia. Again, it's a Roma settlement. So this is, these are names given by the non-Roma to show, you know, in an ironic way, uh, where are the Roma living. So there are many more such settlements across uh, across Europe, as I said, um, and um, even the um, some some of the um, international organizations have been focusing on this. The United Nations come with some criteria that um, um, show us how they define substandard settlements. It's mainly about inadequate access to drinking water, to sanitation, and infrastructure. Uh, poor quality housing units, uh, overcrowding, but also, most importantly, the illegality of the buildings, but also the construction sites. But uh, when it comes to the specific situation of Roma settlements, uh, there are some specific aspects that we should keep in mind. So generally, they are located uh, near urban areas, out of sight, they're like not visible to the general public most of the times in the proximity of environmentally hazardous environments, degrading environments, in a stage of urban decay. This is what Fanon was um, um, expressing in terms of set, setting boundaries of, um, and internal frontiers epitomized by barracks and police stations. Yeah? So here residents um, mainly, re mainly rely on um, scavenged resources such as metal, pa paper, plastic, as well as other discarded items such as clothes, furniture, home appliances. And given the high level of poverty in these um, uh, settlements, many times these materials are used personally or sold at, at informal markets. But in many cases, even the discarded, discarded food is collected and consumed by the residents. So these dwellings are constructed from cardboard, plywood, and uh, wooden boards, are conti uh, continuously threatened by force removals, 
And um, many of, of those settlements have brick houses indeed. Uh, and many people constructed their house from waste materials, as I said. But uh, the residents don't see it as a practical solution to invest in building uh, good houses because these houses are most probably going to be um, um, teared down. So um, these this settlements have brought the attention of um, uh, Roma activists, civil society organizations, community members, uh, becoming those trying to become subjects to advocate for significant policy changes. Uh, but in the same time, um, they also attract the attention of the non-Roma population, especially because uh, there are some incidents of violence, of theft, of scandals. Uh, and in policy studies, we have the so-called issue attention uh, cycle, uh, which shows us that sometimes social problems that, was, that were once elevated at um, the rank of priority might uh, recapture public interest, but uh, many times um, the the capacity of the public to, to put these issues on the agenda becomes uh, very low, um, and many times um, these this, uh, are fading out. So life and death in these settlements seems to have no consequence on a wider society, except when large-scale tragedy happens, as uh, some of the speakers have mentioned, when the settlement becomes um, used for a short period of time. So what's happening inside these settlements? I have compiled in this presentation um, some um, photos. I have to illustrate, I try to illustrate the settlement and other inhabitants. Um, and the first one, it's uh, very close to my, ho my home. It's the very famous um, case of uh, environmental racism from Cluj Napoca, Patarit. So these people were um, placed here uh, since 2010 when they were forcibly, forcibly evicted from the city center, and they have been living here, uh, more than uh, 2,000 people, out of which I think 10% of them have been relocated nowadays. How many? That's what How many have been relocated? Yes. About 10%. Um, yeah, so uh, as I said, um, the situation in, in these uh, neighborhoods, it's, it's, uh, especially the infrastructure, it's, it's quite poor. Um, the houses are, are not legalized, there's no infrastructure, and um, a lot of people do not have a regulated civil status. Uh, this affects, of course, access to education for children, job opportunities, uh, but also all sorts of um, um, key public services. The next case, it's from, uh, yeah, this is also from Patarit. This is a recent photo. Um, another, another case uh, from uh, North Macedonia. I'm living now in North Macedonia. Um, they, uh, have, there, ha there was a research conducted last year which shows that uh, there are about 15 uh, substandard settlements and five of them are located near the capital city. Again, this one, uh, Vardarište, has about 800 to 1,200 inhabitants, and many of them um, are engaged in um, collection of uh, plastic and uh, uh, raw materials, uh, but they are also engaged in all sorts of trade works, uh, public communal hygiene, but also constructions. So being a waste collector uh, pushes the population into a new uh, living space, a new profession, gives them an identity as uh, settlement dwellers or as, as trash pickers. And trash collecting means being constantly surrounded by it, living it, uh, breeding it, consuming it. Uh, trash attract rats. There were many incidents when children were beaten by rats. Therefore, infections, uh, widespread of, of um, um, exposure to, to certain health risks. Um, another example. Uh, Faculteta, again a very ironic case from Bulgaria. Um, um, here I, I, I already spoke about the lack of, of, um, of identity and uh, uh, um, documentation, but here I, maybe I would like to focus on the issue of policing, uh, because m in many of these neighborhoods uh, there's a constant presence of police uh, trying to um, kind of um, cr criminalize the, the Roma uh, living there. And this has been um, also uh, an issue because 
as we have seen, um, policing this type of settlements shifts the attention away from uh, the slow violence uh, of the state. Thank you. Um, and in the same time, it, 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 uh, it trains the gaze into the moral failings of the Roma inhabitants themselves. So dispossessing those who are already dispossessed by the slow violence of the state, um, criminalization, therefore, is experienced as a cumulative racialized uh, violence of dehumanization. There are many other cases, well, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Istanbul, in, in Turkey, in France, and most of these Roma settlements are uh, exposed to a constant threat of being removed and now, especially because the land that um, these um, settlements have been uh, placed on become, becomes very attractive to investors. So uh, many of the local authorities are finding ways to kind of reassess uh, or re re relocate the Roma population. So it's a constant, constant struggle. Um, I would like to, to close here, but I look forward for, for your questions. Thank you. And our last presentation is from uh, Professor Dragomir. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you very much to Magda, to Naringa, and to Claire for organizing this. It's been an honor to, to be a part of this panel and to be a part of the conversations. So uh, my uh, talk is titled Voices Unheard, Exploring the Intersection of Climate Change and Injustice in Romania and India, and I think it follows um, very well what um, Simona was sharing with us. And I'm going to share with you a different side of environmental racism. Um, the question that I am addressing is how do environmental racism and the intersecting burdens of climate and economic precarity exacerbate the challenges faced by racialized communities? To answer this question, my work is um, multi-site granular research with Romania and Adivasi communities and also interrogates elites in Romania and India. I explore the complex dynamics, including the differential impacts of climate change and environmental disasters on marginalized people, the role of state policies and governance structures play, and the interconnectedness of environmental and social factors in shaping vulnerability and resilience. So um, in what follows, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, briefly outline the research project that I have been engaged in, and then give you glimpses into the situation or catastrophe, as we were told earlier, um, of the Roma people um, of the Roya community in Romania, um, giving you as such a, um, an overview of my analytical approach. So in both Romania and India, marginalized communities bear the brunt of climate change, enduring harsh consequences of environmental disasters which are also associated with economic and social burdens. While interconnected on the ground, in my work I analytically distinguish between the integrated layers of injustice, grounded in historical marginalization and perpetuated by hierarchies of power that reinforce structural racism, often upheld and enforced by the state, contributing to a marginalizing status quo. This analysis aims to uncover the intersecting form of injustice at play, creating a paradigm where people, infrastructure, animals, and the environment fall victim of, to continuous and cruel exploitation practices. It presents narratives of historically marginalized communities in Romania and India, struggling once again to thrive amidst the complexities of environmental injustice. This is a work in progress, and the field um, research was conducted since 2022 in Romania and India with Roma and Adivasi communities, as I mentioned. In Romania is the village of Daroia, in Roșia Montana, a region that was hit by extreme floods, causing landslides, habitat destruction, and forced displacement since 2021. In India, I work in multiple sites, but the focus is on the island of Goramora, which only between 2001 and 2009 has lost about 14% of its land. And it's losing, scientists say, about one centimeter um, a night, so 365 centimeters a year. Um, and it's the home of um, 
Adivasi and a very diverse community that um, is still struggling to survive within the region. My, um, the, result, um, the resulting increase in sea level heightened salinity and stress in soil, rendering it favorable for agriculture and lead, uh, leading to livelihood losses and forced mobility. My preliminary analysis found that in both sides, women are disproportionately affected, often left behind to carry the intersecting burdens of climate and economic precarity. I would say that um, my dog keeps time more than any other uh, <laughs> form, so she really likes uh, when she doesn't like when I speak um, when I speak too much. Um, so, uh, so next I will talk to you about um, about um, Roșia Montan. In the picturesque landscape of the Apusen Mountains in Romania lies the historic region of Roșia Montana, a place that is steeped with ancient tradition of mining, dating back to the times of the Romans, especially um, was done during communism. However, the fall of the communist regime in 1999 brought a new era for this region, one marked by economic struggle and social upheaval. Despite, the, despite being rich in minerals and gold, and just to give you an understanding of how rich the area is, um, the estimates is that if mining continues in the region, it would lead to the price of gold globally. So this is an extremely rich um, area. Um, and uh, despite being rich in minerals and gold, the closure of the mines led to widespread unemployment and poverty, particularly affecting certain areas and, of course, certain communities in the decades of 1990s to 2000. The region was bestowed by UNESCO as World Heritage um, status in 2021, signifying its cultural and historical significance on the global scale. And you would see what role that actually plays for the Roma community within the region. Um, however, this newfold recognition also shed light to the structural inequalities and vulnerabilities present within the community. Despite the rich heritage and resources, Roshia Montana faced significant structural challenges, especially in the community of Daroya. Upon entering the village, visitors see a small railroad. This is the, the entry to the village. And this is a, a design that was done by one of the, one of the social workers there. Upon entering the village, visitors see a small railroad that is actually owned by an Austrian company, dividing the village into two parts. On one side, you can see the steep hill. I know it's in Romanian, but you can see it. And on the other side is the river. When floods came, the river overflew its bay, and the hillsides slided down on the houses of the people, making the Raya the crater of death. These challenges came to the front in the summer of 2021 when environmental forces hit Roshia Montana, devastating floods and landslides ravaging the area. In particular, the village of Daroya, which is the home of a close-knit Roma community for over a century, found itself in the eye of the storm. The floods threatened not only their homes, but also their way of life, laying bare the deep-seated injustices and systemic neglect that had plagued the community for generations. To understand the plight of, of the people of the Raya um, is to unravel a long historical discrimination a com of community displacement and environmental exploitation. So in the very little time that I have remaining, I will discuss the seven layers of injustice that I see that are interconnected within the area. So the first one is land ownership and lack of documentation. So the first thing that we did when we, when we were talking to, to the community members was um, to see how many people were affected and what we got with a shrug. We don't know, and why we don't know? Because we do not know how many people live in the Raya. Mm -hmm. And why is this? Because there is not an acknowledgement of the state of the actual people. Many people in the region do not own documentation, do not own IDs, and do not own land deeds to, to their houses. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, when the state is trying to intervene, um, locally, um, regionally, and nationally as well, there is not that knowledge of like who are the people, what is the community, to say the least, about the needs of the community and the diversified needs of the community, considering women and children and the elderly in the community. The next level of injustice is um, the legacy of the injustice that really needs to be taken into account. And why is this? This is because um, the Roma population, as I said earlier, has been living on this territory 
for a hundred years. They were moved by the communist regime in need of labor in the mines. So when the communist regime was laboring, um, the Roma were actually highly thought after as really, um, as really skilled workers to work in the mines. And for, the, for some time, it was a prosperous community. But the communist regime did not give land to anybody, but allowed people to build the houses in which they were living in. However, in, um, they never got the land rights to the land that they have been living for a hundred years. So when the communist regime ended in the 90s, um, uh, in 1989, a lot of the people uh, got their land back. And this is the era that we can talk much further on about like the neoliberal policies of Romania of, of giving back the land and encouraging people to make use at an individual level. So what happened that the surrounding communities from um, Romania and also from, um, from Romania and also from, sorry, I just realized my time is up. Um, uh, from, um, Romanians and Hungarians in the region actually got land uh, back, but the Roma never received any land back. And the way the Romanians and the Hungarians used the land, not only from their houses, but also from the forest, was through this very problematic uh, deforestation practices that led to um, a tremendous soil erosion in the region. So when you see the land sliding, it's not only because the environment or the floods, but it's also because of the tremendous deforestation that takes place, and that takes place in the uh, Roma community above the Roma, about the Roma fault. There are very many other levels that I, I would love to discuss with you. Hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit further during Q&A, but what I will also tell you is that the community was moved right across the river um, into containers um, that were uh, provided by um, the, the state, by the Romanian government, but also by the by the, uh, with the help of the Roma party. And the containers were not able to, to host the people. But what I want to draw your attention to is that the land on which the containers were, which was very much across the, the community, was actually where the former mines were. And the mining in the region took place with cyanide. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, the land is heavily contaminated by heavy metals. So as a result of it, and, and, uh, and I just was in contact with the people from the community even early this morning, mm -hmm. they are still there. Um, and the containers are still present there. And these are children who are being uh, moved across and living within, within those areas. Um, during the time, we really tried to get in touch with international organizations to have the recognition of the Roma community. Um, and to, to have the mechanism that are in dire need internationally to intervene. I spoke directly with the IDMC and I'll call them there. The community is too small for us to put it on the map. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we were at a, at a crossroads of uh, what to do and there are so many blockades on the way but I will not take more of my colleagues' time and I'm happy to talk about it further. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, now we'll hear from Dr. Mary Bassett, who will provide commentary on the panelists' presentations, highlighting similarities between the forms of oppression and health inequalities. Thank, thanks very much, Marie. Uh, uh, you know, we've had quite a day and uh, so many rich conversations coming from all the panelists. I can't help uh, but observe that th this is a panel where the majority of panelists have spoken actually directly about Roma communities. And uh, so I, I really do hope that we have uh, some time um, to have questions. I've set my timer, I think. Uh, well, somebody will tell me. Uh, but I thought I would first um, start out by remembering that we start out the day by talking about ungrievable, uh, ungrievable deaths and the idea that some people's lives are worth more than others. Um, and in public health, which is my field, I'm a medical doctor by training with additional training in public health, uh, we really see uh, the injustices of our societies, the lack of rights of uh, communities and individuals as written on their bodies, that the person's life expectancy, uh, their risk of dying too young, and their risk of having uh, 
their lives affected by preventable disease, uh, are all outcomes that tell us that we do not have justice. And to do that, you have to be able to count people. And I think that one of the themes that came out across all of the conversations, except the one about the lunatic president, um, who, and I, and I do have to um, just uh, make, say a little, you know, his political um, position as a controller of information meant that he could have a truly devastating impact on his country, but Thabo Mbeki, somebody who mm -hmm. we all otherwise greatly admired, had his own odd ideas about HIV. And of course, uh, former President Trump had his ideas about not just ivermectin, but bleach, yeah. if people <laughs> remember the bleach. Yeah. Uh, but in any case, that, was a, that, that um, insult um, was a little different, mm -hmm. but still had an impact mm -hmm. on the ability of people to live. But if we cannot identify communities, often a problem when those communities uh, lack legal status mm -hmm. and uh, don't have a, a, a clear right to identity or citizenship, um, it can be very difficult to, count, to account for the injury, to make a statement about how, how much life has been lost, uh, how much illness has occurred. Um, so that was one of the things that really struck me as we were talking, is who, who counts, who gets measured, what, what do we learn? Uh, but beyond that, um, that's taking a very physical view of health, and obviously uh, that's important. It has a big uh, impact on how long we live. Uh, but there's also, and we've heard about this throughout the day, um, the psychic harm of assaults on identity. Uh, and that, those may not be as readily measured. Uh, public health is just now beginning to get around to figuring out how to take into account trauma um, and mental health. Uh, but certainly we've heard across the panel um, of what it means to be a person without legal status, without citizenship, without papers. And several of you talked about that. Um, we heard from Sosan, uh, and, and here you had more data than in many settings, but still, I can't help but observe uh, the disinterest of the Israeli state of taking into account the health of, uh, of its non-citizens. Uh, and th this is often a problem, um, that, uh, that informal settlements uh, which we heard about. I don't know if these are considered informal set settlements, and I'm not going to remember the name of the village, mm -hmm. uh, or in the many informal settlements throughout throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. um, th these aren't often considered legal settlements. Mm -hmm. So the government declares that it has no obligation to provide services because the people there don't have legal s uh, status. But beyond there, that there's what happens to people when they haven't been able to achieve a, a legal identity in terms of their own, um, their own psychic health. Um, so I wondered if you as a group could respond to my rather concrete idea uh, of how we interact with the notion of structural violence, a concept that came to public health actually mainly through Paul Farmer. I don't know if if the anthropologist, and he was also an anthropologist actually, um, who defined the idea as structural um, because it had to do with the structure of society and violence because it had an impact on how long people lived. Um, but how that crosswalks with the ability to tell who's who, who are the, uh, the Roma people in a community, who are the you know, Jordanian Palestinians? How can we distinguish them so that we can measure the impact of the various classifications on their well-being? So that is, is the, I guess that's the overarching theme, although I, I don't know quite what to say 
uh, about how to bring in your observations um, at, at, at the beginning of our panel, um, uh, Sarah. The, you know, the, the, the fact that everybody has to have access um, uh, the uh, the speak the the um, comments that we got uh, from Sebijan. I, I'm mispronouncing. Uh, have I got the right person? Yes. Is, who's on the Who's on the video? Sebi. Sebi. Okay. She was really talking about um, about something that Marie works a lot on is. Uh, totally biased treatment uh, of people who are considered less than human by the healthcare system. And uh, so there are questions about access, either because you have an authoritarian regime that determines what we should consider as viable health alternatives, or because you have a biased healthcare system that doesn't give people access to care. Um, but within all of this, is our ability to tell the story if we can't identify uh, who is being harmed in, uh, in a way that is consistent. So that really is my question to the entire panel. Um, you didn't get to talk about Jamaica, and I haven't said much about the crosswalk between climate, environmental degradation, um, uh, uh, the whole um, experience of environmental racism that uh, plagues all informal settlements. Um, so I hope that all that will come up in the question and answer, and I think I've probably returned some time to you, about two and a half minutes. <laughs> so let me just uh, start with my first question. In public health, uh, we pay a lot of attention to the idea that if we can't identify a population, um, and make a statement about their health. You may know some of you, for example, in the census this year, for the first time, Middle Eastern people are gonna be able to identify their descent. They were previously told that they are white. Uh, but of course, most people in the United States who are of Middle Eastern descent didn't identify as white. Now there, this has been requested for a long time, now there'll be a census category. But if nobody counts you, if nobody identifies you, uh, then we have a, a limited ability to, um, to tell the story, if you could just comment on that reservation in any order you choose. Maybe, okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I finished my presentation by um, showing a, a slide uh, in which uh, this substandard Romani settlements have been mapped by different countries. I was about to, yes. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes it's UN agencies that are involved, like UNDP, sometimes it's the National Statistics Office, uh, sometimes it's the World Bank, especially in Romania, but also NGOs. So there is some data, some information about these settlements, what's happening, what's the level of education, what's the occupation of the people, access to services and so on. So that kind of makes it... Um, even more relevant for the, the whole discussion of this investment, that we know what's happening, the state knows, and it's not that the community is invisible, but it's mm. invisible by default. It's a willingness to make the community uh, invisible. So, um, and, yeah, so that's one part. And the second one, I just wanted to emphasize a bit uh, the agency of the people from the community. Like, in many cases, again, I go to the Romanian case, the, the people from the community started having a radio show, a podcast, showing what's happening, uh, raising awareness, trying to bring uh, all sorts of um, uh, advocates together to do something. So it's not that you know, they are there and subject to all this uh, uh, violence that's hap that they are subject to, but uh, taking, taking a lead. But also uh, other civil society organizations uh, have been trying, especially in Macedonia, because I know a bit better the context they said I'm living there, they have started to kind of map all sorts of um, stages of these <coughs> neighborhoods. Yeah, like from very informal, no pavement, nothing to, I don't know, having so solar panels, for example. And um, this these uh, NGOs are even starting with an integrated approach, like starting to model uh, some sort of a projects or programs in which you have um, uh, all sorts of. Um, um, like starting with access to documentation, 
going having uh, ADN, um, DNA tests for, for the children, for the parents, just to make sure that uh, you know, generations can, can have their, their documentation to access to schooling uh, and, and so on. So there is um, something going on, uh, but uh, as I said, this is slow and it's not because, uh, because, because the state is willing to do something, but it's mainly because of the people from the community and the Roma civil society organizations that are willing to work in such settlements. Uh, obviously, uh, I think this topic is not so popular because the, the problems in these uh, neighborhoods are so complex that you as a NGO, you cannot come with, um, with something that can solve the issues or maybe address the education part or uh, the, the gender part, like uh, having a gene gynecologist in the community, uh, in the mobile unit and so on. But it's, it's the fear that how you can approach, you know, all these interconnected um, issues that the community is facing. I can continue if you would like on this. I think that uh, my colleague Simona did a really um, a good job in pointing something that I also wanted to point out. And thank you for that question. I think it's a, the truth of, of uh, injustice, right? Like where you don't see the people. But just um, to put what Simona said further into the paradigm that Dr. West gave us earlier, if it's possible, I think it actually shows the paradoxes of our life, because on one hand, you do see this uh, obliviousness of the state towards the communities, that it's actually not duplicated at the level of everyday population. Quite the contrary, at the level of population, people are visible and sometimes brought to the fore and pushed to the fore. But at the same time, the state does not decide mm. to do this. So I think that that's where we see institutionalized racism working where it's not that you don't see the, the people, that you don't know that communities like the Ruaya or Patarut exist. We do know them. People know very, very well. They probably take another road to not go into that, into to those uh, areas. And at the same time, the state does not acknowledge them. So I think that that's the paradox and the cruise, and the cruise of it. Of with uh, with um, respect to the chair, may I ask a one more. Yeah. Um, the, 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 something that came up on an earlier panel was this, what somebody described as a schizophrenic mm -hmm. state. Yeah. Um, now, of course, in public health, we really believe, I believe in any case, that, that, um, that health is the responsibility of the state. Uh, there's no other entity that can guarantee our air, our water, mm -hmm. our housing standards. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have particularly in the last decades an increasingly militarized state, um, including in the United States, uh, so that you have this dichotomy uh, between the state as a threat and the state as, a, as the rightful responsible party uh, for population well-being. If you could just comment on how you've experienced in your work um, this, I'm not sure schizophrenia is quite the right word, but it certainly is uh, a dual and, and conflicting role uh, of the state. Any, anyone? I mean, I, I've worked, I spent a lot of time working in government um, in the United States where I felt um, that I had an obligation to ensure the delivery of, of, uh, of not only health services, but the protection of people's lives in the ways that people need in order to have a, a, a decent, healthy life. Um, but we also, of course, have governments um, that at the same time are a source of violence uh, to their population. Um, I wanted to actually go back a little bit to your question about structural discrimination and kind of if nobody counts or identifies you, how do we tell your story in public health? And I think the case of Jamaica and other post-colonial post -colonial mm -hmm. countries that retained uh, homophobic laws and what, that, what those laws meant was a criminalizing of, a, of people. So because you identified or you were a member of the LGBTQI community, you were illegal, just your existence. And so what that meant in the case of Jamaica for Health was 
you, if you went to a healthcare provider, you know, you, you want to provide all your history, you weren't going to provide your sexual history. You know, I am someone who has uh, sex with men or I'm in a same-sex relationship because immediately you were criminalized and that compromised your access to health. And understanding the importance of the laws that states make that either make some people deserving, criminalize other people and therefore exclude them from access to services, but also how laws then create this culture that permeates all of public service delivery. So it's justified for a healthcare worker to be homophobic towards you because the law says you're a criminal. It's justifiable for them to display negative attitudes towards you because the law allows them or legalizes their ability to do that. And laws are, are really important in creating structures that are either inclusive or exclude other people and discriminate other against other people and other identities. And so I think that also goes across to immigration as well. If we think about if I'm legal or termed illegal as a person, I'm criminalizing my identity. What does that do to how public health uh, policy making is even done? In Jamaica, you can talk about the existence of LGBTQI community. So you couldn't even create a policy, an HIV policy that address well, what should we be telling men who have sex with men? What should we be telling people that are in same-sex relationships about how to stay safe? And so I think that's to your point of structural discrimination and what it does if you're counted or not identified to the delivery of public health. I mean, I saw her, yeah. I don't know whether you have the mic, but please. Uh, yeah, can please. I go? Okay, okay. yes. Um, I think that in the case of Roma, it is really more than urgent to situate the state and its institution as the main organizers of Roma lives. Why? Because of the um, entire political framework that Cayetano previously has been talking about, which is the focus has been placed on Roma, you know, all this idea of Roma are the problem, so we need to fix them. and. Um, the focus was never the state and, and its institutions and, 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 and the racist system itself. So we must shift the focus back to the, back to the main perpetrator uh, that denies Roma lives, that don't allow us to exist as Roma, right? So, and to, and to, to, to place the state as the main uh, organizers of our uh, lives. This allow, would allow us to break with so many excuses that have been placed into the political debate, such as this um, idea that we live in those uh, isolated neighborhoods because we decide to, because it is in our culture to be isolated, because it is our own choice, not because the state has forced us to, to, to be there. So, and many other excuses uh, that allow the justifications of the anti-Roma system to, to continue for, for, for too many years. I think that in, in this debate, the crucial point would be the lack of access to data. Me and some, some many others have been arguing for too long the need to, to have census in, in some countries. I mean, we are not interested to know how many we are and where we are but we want to have access to data because we know that institutions, do the, they do have data, they just don't make it public because in some countries it is illegally to have this, um, to collect ethnic data while they, they do it because there is racial profiling. They know people by, by, by surnames, by, by, by the neighborhoods they, they live in and so on. And why do we need this data precisely to illustrate the persecution of the system to illustrate the inequalities in the health system to to illustrate the hypercriminalization that exists of Roma people. We know that because we speak with the people in the communities because we know that there are many people in the prisons. Unfortunately, there is not much done on, on that topic, but we know there are many people, uh, many Roma people in the in the prisons that are mainly not judged for the crime, crime they did, but they are ju judged for for who they are, no, because the Roma culture is, is being criminalized. So we need to have this access to data in order to, to illustrate how the system is the one that constantly persecute, criminalize, 
and uh, pro uh, produce uh, health inequalities within within the system. Otherwise, we cannot prove it, unfortunately. Thank you, Seb. Um, now we're going to open it up for yeah. the audience. Can oh, so sorry. Comment, uh, very quickly about this. So somebody used the term paradox. Um, and I think um, if, if I think about the, the position of the Lebanese state towards Palestinians, there's a paradox of, um, of really Palestinians are hyper visible as a problem in Lebanon, yet the Lebanese state does not take any responsibility towards them. So they completely ignore them when it comes to the, the responsibility of the state towards uh, the population. Um, with respect to Jordan, on the other hand, as I mentioned, there's sort of like this agreement that in order for Palestinians to exist and to, um, to uh, basically work and live and, you know, they just need to acquiesce and, uh, and uh, you know, deny their identity. Um, any any um, manifestations of Palestinian identity are cracked down immediately. Um, I mean, even in the last few days, in the last couple of weeks, there have been large protests um, in front of the Israeli uh, Israeli um, embassy in Jordan, where Palestinians are carrying the the Palestinian flag uh, and protesting, and that has been um, uh, cracked down on because it really threatens the existence of the uh, of the state, and it threatens this social contract that you know we gave you rights and citizenship so that you would just deny your identity. And if you, if you express your identity uh, openly, then that would have negative consequences on, on your rights. So just, yeah. Thank you. Um, this has been a really great discussion. Now it's time to open up to the audience. We have about 10 minutes. So does anybody have a question? Hi, um, thank you for your discussions. I, um, I guess I want to ask something that I think Sebi already spoke to in that last response, but just curious for everyone's responses. Um, basically on, on the question of um, getting the data to be able to identify these populations, it's, it's kind of, as Sebi was saying, it's my impression that it's not that it doesn't exist, it's just that it's in the wrong hands. And, and I think about, for example, um, you know, in, in the behavioral sciences, there's, uh, the, the, the field kind of suffers from uh, data that doesn't necessarily represent an entire population or, or just uh, can't, yeah, can't capture the entire population, yet tech companies, social media companies, uh, you know, have this extravagant amount and, and can do such incredible predictive modeling with it, um, or I, I read, and I, I don't know how accurate this is entirely, but I, I had read that um, in Israel-Palestine, Israel actually has pretty thorough documentation on, on the entire Gazan population. And, and so despite their contesting of the proportion of women and children, uh, they, they actually probably likely know very well exactly who, who is uh, dying in these assaults. So, so I guess my question is, to, to, what, is it, to what extent um, is it that we uh, don't have the data versus it's, it's in the wrong hands or just in the wrong institutions? And, and then how do, we, how, do we get the, how do we get it back? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, would anybody like to answer? OK, we can collect all together. And then, no, we can collect. This way it's efficient. <laughs> um, the, you know, in Hungary, I went to one of the Roma settlements, and uh, it, it was away from, it was Mishkolch, and then from there you go somewhere else. So basically, I took the train, and from train, there was another train, which was uh, old school era train, and then from there, we had to take a bus to go to the settlement. So I mean, so that kind of reaching point was so uh, made of unease. And when I went to the, uh, I, I could only compare that to slum. 
it was absolutely inhabitable. I mean, people, I mean, it was just, and, uh, and it was almost like one of the photos, the mountains were there and the kids were there and, you know, they were just accessing social media. They were keen on, you know, following football and, and that reminded me of where I grew up. And there was one photograph which was like the gutter water everywhere. I mean, that's like basically my neighborhood, right? And now then if you show these photographs to, let's say, people where I come from, I mean, they would mistake that to, you know, it could be anywhere from us. And I think this speaks to so much of what happens, you know, in societies uh, who are... Now, those houses look like they are not part of the city, like some of these will look like outskirts. But I'm wondering if there is something like similar which is part of the city in the sense of, you know, the, uh, you know the, the absolute slum, the squalors that people live in. And I'm kind of curious if you can tell more about that and how people, I mean, you told about rats biting and, you know, diseases and, and all of that. Uh, one of the ways the state don't pay attention to it is, is because they don't politically benefit in the sense that we have a tendency, at least in India, if they are not going to give us votes, and they are not significant enough, we don't care about it. That happens to Dalits, that happens to Muslims uh, uh, in, 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 in context. So I'm, I'm just curious to hear your response. Thank you. Can I, can I provide just a very quick answer um, to the data uh, question? In the context of Lebanon, uh, there's a central administration or administration of statistics that refuses to share data with, uh, with researchers. Um, and what, what ended, ends up happening is that because Palestinians are excluded from sort of like the national consensus, then they, they would, you know, UNRWA or other institutions would collect data on Palestinians. And then the problem becomes that, um, that there's little data on the Lebanese to actually com compare to. In the, in the context of Jordan, um, uh, Jordan does not allow the collection of identity indicators, you know, whether it's religion or uh, or Palestinian versus Jordanian. And I understand that there was one study um, that was carried out, and the report was written, and then um, uh, it was prevented from being uh, published because it actually showed how people identified, and and um, uh, and it showed that people in Jordan identified more with religion rather than with with nationality as, as uh, Jordanian. Um, and just very quickly about the, um, you know, the, uh, the slums. Uh, so uh, refugee camps in Jordan and, and to a large extent in Jordan, uh, in Lebanon and to a large extent in Jordan, they are not, you know, they don't look like refugee camps. They look like urban slums. So because, you know, the fact that these are protracted um, resident, you know, geographic areas that have um, received refugees and they've been there for 76 plus years. Can I please respond to the last uh, yes. question? Yes. I mean, if someone else can go, that's perfectly fine because I cannot see very well from here. <laughs> you can go, Sab. Yeah, okay. I, I, I just wanted to say that I do not fully agree that um, the state doesn't do anything because it doesn't benefit uh, politically. In contrary, uh, there is a huge political benefit from the dehumanization of, of, of Roma and placing them in those ghetto. The first one is the economical exploitation they are doing out of, uh, out of, out of Roma. And those slums, ghettos in Europe, I define them as the 21st uh, century prisons with no walls, where whose principal aim of those ghettos is to control Roma lives in order to secure and safeguard white lives. Who controls Roma lives in those ghettos? Police, mm -hmm. social services, educational services, they all had the same purpose to control Roma lives. So social services are the first one to take Roma children out of their family because they are labeled as an inadequate, inadequate, inadequate parents. So they all serve their role on those ghettos. So those ghettos exist with a precise aim, which is to control Roma lives, to not allow them 
to go outside of the ghetto, to go to the city, to not get, to not give the bad image about the city, while at the same time, it's a way of securing and protecting white bodies, because let's not forget that Roma bodies are created, framed, and treated as bodies to be afraid of. The criminal body that is there to contagious us, to, to steal from us, to bring disorder within what Europe thinks there is a white order. Thank you. Thank you, Seb. Did you have anything to say? I can continue just a little bit further to just problematize it actually a bit further about data collection. And I think that has to do with modes of collection as well and who is doing the collection. Um, because it's not that easy when you have somebody from outside to come and number you. And I think that that's really important for people to understand, like, to understand, and that actually points out, I think, to the complexity of the understanding of the state, the necessity of state, but also the role, the policing role that the state also has. So when I was working for my previous project in, in other Roma communities, and I asked quite similar question, one question that really touched my heart was, we are not even two generations away from the Holocaust. Why is this data collected? Who is collecting it and for what purpose? Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to be mindful of this complexity of how people understand the states, the historiosity, historical mm -hmm. uh, ways in which data was collected and was yeah. used, mm -hmm. and how, how is this to, to be understood by, by the people uh, who, who are being mm -hmm. counted? I mean, some people argue that collecting race, ethnicity, uh, mm -hmm. data perpetuates mm -hmm. divisions. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's the way that we can identify mm -hmm. um, whether equity has mm -hmm. been achieved. Um, but that's an important observation. Yeah. Um, so that is the conclusion of our panel. Does anybody have any <laughs> lasting thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Germany and France, they don't collect these data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's against the law. Yeah, they don't have money. Right. Yeah. 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 They know, so they can strike. They exactly. don't have race, only French. racism, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> when, you know, there's All right. huge disparities. So this is the conclusion of panel two. And before we go into our Thank book talk, I would like to um, welcome Dr. Natalia Linos to the podium. Um, she is the executive director of FXB. She's also a social epidemiologist um, who has over 15 years of experience. But before I walk away, um, Natalia has been with FXB for five years. And she's a super vital um, member of our team. And so the Roma team and group would like to present her. With a bouquet of flowers. Okay. Let me scoot myself. The team gave me flowers because it is my last week next week at FXB, and I think it is their way. So I've, I've uh, been asked by Magda to, and I'll, I'll be going to UNDP, so the person who shouted out UNDP for, uh, for data analysis, it would be interesting to do. So I've been asked to try and summarize in 10 minutes, and obviously that's impossible. It's impossible because of the richness of today. But I did want to start with, by acknowledging that I'm, I'm Greek. I'm someone who grew up being told to be afraid, not by my family, direct family, but by, by the community. And something I feel the most proud of as having been executive director over the five years is getting to know Magda and getting to really uh, support this program. This program is so important. And every time I speak to Greek politicians now, they still push back and they still say, uh, no, no, it's their culture. It's, so this is real. The racism is explicit. I've spoken to, you know, when my mother was at the Ministry of Education, 
um, they were trying to integrate a school, the Greek parents refused to send their kids there. Like the minute they were, you know, this is real, it's happening today. So I'm delighted and, and saddened that, you know, Greece is still doing this. Um, so yes, so summarizing a day that was so rich with lawyers and public health experts and philosophers and, uh, you know, is difficult. And as Jackie Baba said, the title, Confronting State Violence Across the Globe, was pretty ambitious. So I kind of want to focus on a few of the words in what I heard um, today. So we were challenged by Professor West that this would be a day of paradox, a day of trying to talk about, you know, extend boundaries to talk about tensions. And the first tension comes in the word state. We heard tension, even among our speakers, around what is the role of the state? Are they the monopoly of, of violence, uh, the murder state, the state that you know, harms? Or as Mary Bassett said, are they the state that provides for the public health and the well-being? Are they the state that the poor have to turn to? Is it a state that if you are stateless or if you are minoritized, you can claim as your own? You know, who defines the state is a big, a big one. And you know, the structuring of power in our constitutions, um, you know, do you do it through collaboration, through civil disobedience? There is violence in those state negotiations. But even the term violence was also one of paradoxes. You know, we spoke about direct violence, the direct violence in terms of political violence, police violence, which resonates with what we see in the United States, what we heard from, from Spain. We heard about violence from healthcare practitioners, and then we heard about structural violence in the ways that people have been, um, you know, the systemic neglect of communities, forced displacement and evictions, uh, polluted land and, you know, displacement. And, you know, in the, in the Samaritans, which I learned today about Samaritans, uh, even violence, psychic violence, and, and even something that could be portrayed as, as peaceful, as integration, as welcoming, as violence. So, you know, it forces us to question what we consider violence. And then we talked about the globe, across the globe, and I love that we had so many case examples, and I loved the, the presentation from Albania, from the Al anthropology from the Albania, and, and your question was, you know, how is a racialized global process that is shaped locally, like what does that mean? And, you know, we've struggled with that, and I know Sausan, you've struggled in sort of thinking about racializing of groups that may look the same, and, you know, Albanians and Greeks are definitely oppressed, and, but they are racially, you know, different from sort of the Roma in Greece or Palestinians in Lebanon. So this concept of, of a global conversation, the case, you know, that we're trying to confront state violence across the globe, but we use different definitions, does make it more difficult. So today has been difficult because the topics have been difficult, because our current events are difficult, but there has also been hope. And, you know, I do want to switch to that. As Magda said, the tools of oppression are similar, but also tools of resistance. And we have heard about some of those tools. And, and there is this dialectics, right? The tools of oppression include narrative, it include, uh, you know, dehumanizing people and erasure, making people invisible, but that's also what people can reclaim in their narratives. It is uh, a desire, and, and I'm so grateful to all the speakers. We, you know, Magda, you have been fantastic in ensuring that the voices of people most affected are at the table, and I think Siraj sort of pointed that out. Um, you know, reclaiming narratives is a tool of resistance. But then there's data. As, you know, for those of us who are in research, the data is a tool of oppression, and it can be. Uh, we know in places that people are, are afraid to collect data because if you're, for example, undocumented and your health department has data and then there's a request for information and then you have a list of people who are undocumented, you know, there is risk in data, but also reclaiming data is important. And, and there are creative ways that we can think about it, whether it's spatial data that doesn't identify people, whether it's, um, you know, new ways of, of thinking and using technology. But I want to end with the metaphor of the band, which for me too was really powerful. And you know, I think the call today is for solidarity. And I think, you know, Magda hasn't said it explicitly, but I think it's to remember the Roma in the global struggle on anti-racism. The Roma are really, you know, unique that they are across so many continents and yet often completely invisible in our global solidarity. And I am so you know, grateful for those who are showing solidarity today, wearing a kefia. You know, there is this desire for solidarity, and I think what Magda is calling on us, not 
she hasn't called on it, but this is what I will call on you, is to when you are thinking about groups that are oppressed, remember the Roma. The Roma are a group that are forgotten, oppressed, intentionally um, sort of not discussed. So that is one kind of call to the audience is to remember the, the Roma in your band. And then um, I think it was, you know, this notion of imagination that we actually, uh, it can feel pretty deflating having these conversations, but in fact, an imagination, a creativity that basically the catastrophe and the suffocation that you talked about, making it difficult to think about new systems, that that isn't uh, impossible. And through solidarity, through sharing of stories, through, through connections, through networks, through having this conference every year for 12 years, you build those movements of resistance and imagination and collaboration. And so I want to sort of say thank you to Magda and thank you to all of you who stayed from, you know, it's, it's late in the evening and we do have a book talk coming up to just say this work is necessary, important, and thank you all for doing it. So to um, close out our conference, we have a book talk with, um, where are my names? Arid um, Joskowitz and Aidan McGarry. Um, we also have the chair of this talk, which is Maria Bogdan. Um, Dr. Maria is a media scholar and cultural theorist with extensive research, interest in themes such as the media representation of Roma, racism, cultural memory, and cultural trauma. Currently, she serves as a Fortinoff uh, Research Fellow at the Vienna Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies. Dr. Bogdan earned her PhD from the esteemed Film, Media, and Culture Theory Doctoral Program at, at Vos Lorraine University in Budapest. Um, and we also have a discussant, uh, Maria Atanasova. So I welcome you all to the <laughs> for the panel to the front of the room, um, and I will. Yes, I will. Here we go. Oh, how are you? There we go. Thank you. Yes, I'm tall. So has to go up. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation and for the, the wonderful challenge to speak about a book that I worked on for 10 years in, in 10 minutes. Um, it's going to be a minute per year. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, OK. I won't, you, really, you won't stop? No. <laughs> I won't push it. I will, I, will, I will do my very best to stay in the, in the time uh, allotted to me so we can have more time to discuss uh, our books uh, together. Um, so we, 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 we heard a lot about what we heard about solidarity, violence, uh, solidarity, um, questions of, of, of overlaps, similarities um, of state violence. And, and my talk will, will reflect some of this as well. But it's even more about the entanglement we see in the documentation of violence and the attempts to overcome violence. So my talk, as, you, as the title already suggests, brings us back first to the era when a lot of the concepts that we have been using here have been developed, wartime and immediate post-war years. Um, and uh, what I will do is I will give you a very brief, as I said, very brief glimpse of a work that uh, is trying to <laughs> bring a uh, so bring us back to the Holocaust, to the interactions that Jews and Roma had with each other, limited knowledge of each other, and actually also limited interactions, and take us from there all the way to the present, uh, and to understand the ways that both groups have had entangled efforts to think about that, the, the violence, document the violence, um, and, and historicize it. Um, in, when, we, when we have two groups who are subject of, of a genocide, I think um, one, one, one thing that tends to come up, which isn't, you know, doesn't come up here, but, but is certainly how many people will think about it, is in terms of a competition of memory. 
Solidarity is one of the one of the frameworks that we have out there, and then there is a competitive framework as well. Um, and I think if we think about Jews and Roma, and this will become clearer as I go along, there are certainly very clear asymmetries in the resources they have to address the injustices committed against them. But what is even more striking, I would say, is how entangled they are. And I will just give you one example that comes from knowledge production. If you are interested in the Romani genocide and uh, you heeded the call that we, uh, well, that we heard it in the, in the, the conference, but that I think Aiden will also address the question of voice. You want to hear the voice of the victims. You would likely go to audiovisual testimony, which is, is the place uh, where we would, would find testimonies, the voices of those who suffered. If you wanted to do that, um, you would likely end up with the Shoah Foundation archive. It's a, the biggest of the audiovisual archives dealing with the Holocaust, over 50,000 interviews with uh, Jews, uh, Jewish survivors, and 406 interviews with Romani survivors. And these numbers and that fact already tell you something. It tells you that this is a very small part of the effort to collect testimonies. But at the same time, all of this makes it the biggest testimony archive of the Romani genocide, the biggest audiovisual testimony archive. Um, so you, we have a paradox here already, right? The, 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 a question of, of how it is integrated, a question of the dimensions, and also, I mean, very bluntly, we can see here how one minority or an archive dedicated to one minority owns the memories of, of another group. So the question is how we deal with that, how we deal with something that comes out of, out of an entanglement. Now, when I say entanglement, uh, I also want to advocate for something that somebody else actually brought up earlier in the conference, and that is how we deal with comparisons versus other modes of thinking about different groups who were persecuted. Um, I think comparisons do are unavoidable to some degree. Um, I think it's how we make sense of the world. In fact, it's how uh, the victims of the Romani and the Jewish Holocaust made sense of the world as well. When they were looking across the metaphorical or very real barbed wire fence, they were trying to gauge where they're at and what will happen to them. So I, th I think there is, there, there is an element that is unavoidable, but when it comes to grand comparisons, there is also something deeply problematic about them. Um, and I'll, I'll illustrate some of what that problem is with, with, with a small example. Um, it's an example that brings me to uh, well, my, where, the country where I grew up, Austria. If you were to look at victim numbers, how would you explain what happened? And one way you could explain what happened is to say that in Austria, um, 9,000 Roma approximately uh, were murdered by the Nazis and 64,000 Jews. This is one of the common framings. And you can see a, a symmetry in the dimensions there. Or, of course, I could tell you that 80% of the Roma were murdered and 30% of the Jewish population, which changes things. And this is how comparisons tend to work. And as I say this, um, and this is something, whenever, whenever I actually start speaking about it in those terms, I myself start to sort of feel deeply uncomfortable. Because it's something that you might feel when you hear me here say that there is something deeply demeaning about precisely thinking about it in these number games. If I just imagined that my grandparents who were camp survivors, if I had given them these statistics, I think they would have glared at me with no comprehension of what are you trying to say? Is there a point <laughs> to any of this? So I think there is a deep problem with comparisons that A, we cannot actually adjudicate which comparisons make most sense, and two, they tend to actually demean the suffering of all involved in, in these comparisons. And then finally, when it comes to comparing the Romani genocide to the Jewish genocide, there's also a fairly bad history of courts doing that with the attempt to exclude Roma from compensation payments. So the track record of these, compensation, of, of, of these comparisons is also pretty bad. So what is the alternative? How can one speak about these two genocides together? It is to speak about people and their interactions. It is a relational history. So my book and this talk focus precisely on that relationship. And because I don't have much 
time, what I want to do is just give you basically, I'll give you one, one example that illustrates how wartime interactions, post-war history, and these entanglements all work together. And I'll do this by taking you back to the earliest moment that one can speak of in this relationship that has all these three terms involved. And it's actually the pre-Holocaust, technically pre-Holocaust moment. It's the era 1933 to 1939. So this is when the Nazis are already in power. There are no genocidal policies yet. This is before World War II. There are persecution policies in place, but not policies to murder either Jews or Roma systematically. If we were just to focus on this period, and we look at what, how Jews and Roma are relating to each other, we would not, you would not see much evidence that they, are, see, that they see each other as, as, as having a shared fate. There are very few Romani sources. If you looked at the Jewish sources in this case, which have sort of printed sources, newspapers, censored ones in Germany, non-censored ones uh, outside of Germany, you would not know, for example, from these Jewish newspapers that Roma faced internment in so-called gypsy camps established by municipalities starting in 1935 and then in an accelerated uh, level uh, in 1936 at the time of the Berlin Olympics when you know, multiple German cities ended up with these camps. And these were really the first places where a racialized group was systematically interned in Germany. Why would you not know it from these sources? Absence is, of course, difficult. They, people don't explain why they don't care about things. But I would argue that it is be because they, well, A, they rightly understand that they won't end up in these camps. This is not the trajectory they would take. It will be the trajectory that would explain also deportations of Roma then to concentration camps. But it is not the history of Jews, indeed. And they likely understood this much like their neighbors did, much like many Roma, I presume, understood persecution of Jews, much like their neighbors did. Um, so uh, they had it coming, and many Jews probably thought of this as an extension of policies they've seen all along. It was just business as usual. Populations deemed un unpopular by the state, deemed problematic by the state, deemed um, you know, especially problematic if you want to show your cleaned up city to you know, international visitors for, the, for Olympic Games. Um, we know this from many other Olympic Games, of course, as well. It seemed like, yes, this is, you know, there were internment camps in World War I. There's, there, there's police operations against these populations, however defined. And most Jews likely understood it as not revolutionary. So basically understood the boycott of Jewish stores, say on April 1st, 1933, as a revolutionary act, but not these types of persecutions. The result of this is that when the first set of survivor historians started to write the history of Nazi racial persecution, these things did not come up. It was not part of their experience, simply. They didn't experience it at the time, and it was not something that would be on their mind afterwards. The same was true for non-Jewish historians and Jewish historians who were not there, but who used the sources we were taught to use. After all, we were taught to use the voices of the victims. Now, if the victims are decide, you know, if, if you then look at the, the majority of these sources, if you look at what they wrote, these camps do not come up again. So the result of this is that these Roma camps are not part of a chronology of racial persecution. I can assure you if you go, you know, not just, if you go into the museums, and I presume in any college course on, on, on the Holocaust, um, this is not part of the regular chronology. These camps will not be there. It's also an interesting warning, I believe, when we think about voice and use the singular, because it turns out going to the voice of the victims does not solve your problem here. It actually just you know, you just repeat a blind spot because it's in plural. It is ultimately, there are multiple voices and multiple victims. Now I should say two things. One is from this, from what I just told you, this is the story of the earlier period of persecution, 1939 to 1945. We see a very different type of entanglement of their history, very physically entangled 
Um, maybe I'll just mention one, one of the moments where you can really see this. I mean, it, it has all the senses involved of seeing each other being murdered, hearing each other being murdered, smelling each other being murdered, being tactile, being forced to bury each other's dead. And one, one place where this, this is, sort of comes back to me always is this, this is the first message that the Warsaw Ghetto gets of mass murders in the Chelmno concentration camp or extermination camp. Um, is actually about the murder of the Roma, of, of Austrian Roma from the Lodge Ghetto. And it's a report that mentions how these Jewish grave diggers are forced to dig the graves of the Roma, how they put on their clothes in a cold January and are then shot on top of the people they just buried. So the, in, in the most visible way, you can see their fates entangled the two victims, one victim group wearing the clothes of the other being shot on top of Roma. I should also say that many Jews who, come out, came, out, who came out of these experiences of this second period um, were essential for building up the archives and ask, starting being the first ones to really ask about what happened to Roma in a story that would eventually precisely get us to the Shoah Foundation. So it's Jewish institutions that would be, would be crucial here. Um, I know, did I end up with slides? Yes. Um, I will skip this fascinating document of some of the earliest evidence of, of, of Roma really connecting to Jewish communities, being registered with Jewish communities in 1946. Um, I will just mention uh, here uh, some of the first institutions to collect Romani testimony was uh, the Wiener Library in London, which was uh, a Jewish institution founded uh, during the war already, one of the earliest to collect testimony. And it is an institution uh, that, well, where somebody made the explicit decision in the late 1950s to actually collect Romani testimonies. Um, and I wanted to show you this slide and mention this example, um, because for the, here I know how much the library actually paid for the testimony. And this is a central point of my book. It might seem cynical. Who cares? We might think of the voice when we hear, I think, the words memory, and we hear the words voice as well, actually. It sounds like it comes for free. We can remember things for free. And saying things is hard, and we know it's hard for the subaltern to speak. But there's also a price to actually recording the speech of the subaltern. Um, because the reason that I had access to this testimony, which is crucial, actually, because it involves somebody who ended up, was originally on this list. Um, so that I was able to reconstruct like, multiple dimensions of Romani lives is because there was somebody who was willing to pay for somebody else in a different city to be trained, interview somebody, to, then to, to bring it to an institution where it was indexed, to, so, and, and most importantly, an institution that survived that might seem trivial, but many of these institutions were nearly bankrupt in the 50s. Um, they, uh, the, the fact that it, it had to survive, it, you needed a sustainable infrastructure. And that means a lot of things. There were four indexers. It's, it takes thousands of dollars to get us something that seems particularly trivial. And it's essential for what allows us to hear the voices, indeed, of these victims. Now let me let me really fast forward all the way till today, so I can I can so I can conclude <laughs> in, in 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 the allotted time. Um, when I think so, what you can he see here is you can see asymmetries. You can see there is a paradox in these asymmetries and what the effects are, how they how they both give voice and at the same time give voice in a very strange way um, and, and in in a way that that is also no, asymmetrical. Simply, um, those things don't go away. And they haven't gone away till today. What has transformed since this earliest period, if you think of what I told you about 1933 to 1939, is really that there is a conversation where one can speak about the asymmetries. There's a place for these things. And there are indeed efforts to speak together and have to show the solidarity that people have mentioned here at, at the conference. I'll give you one example that also happens to be connected to healthcare. Um, and the COVID uh, crisis and health and unequal access to healthcare during the COVID crisis, when uh, the European uh, uh, 
European Union of Jewish Students and Vera Namenka together um, wrote to various institutions of the European Union, um, you know, ending their letter advocating for equal access to healthcare with Roma rights, uh, Jewish rights are Roma rights, and Roma rights are, are Jewish rights. And it comes really out of not just, this is not just a theoretical solidarity, it comes out of interactions, deep, deep interactions. So, so to conclude, um, I, um, I think there is actually a hopeful message, as, as paradoxical as this is, from if, if you think of the trajectory that I tried to describe. Um, my own book is part of a dialogue I would say that that I was allowed to participate in with with um, with many people here. <laughs> I feel as as well, um, and it's an ongoing learning experience uh, for me, and that's which makes it even more important for me to you know, continue to learn here, uh, as I have. Um, ultimately, rewriting history is an act of speaking to each other. I would say, um, uh, and I I'm I'm happy to speak more about about the very particular alliances that that have emerged here. Um, I also have been thinking a lot about how they have been transformed since October 7th, I should say. And I'm happy to, to talk about that, because why not walk into a minefield? Um, uh, so what I ultimately hope uh, all of this does is it makes us, helps us think about some of the topics of this, of this, this conference in terms of the entanglement of violence, documentation, and importantly, when we think of solidarity, of unequal alliances. Because I, I do believe that there are no other alliances to be had. Thank you. Shall I introduce you? So, I'm the chair. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> There are two Marias here. My name is Maria Bogdan. I am the chair, and Maria Atanasova is the discussant. And thank you for this amazing uh, summary and introduction of your book, uh, your very complex and very thoughtful book in such a short period of time, Ari. Although I gave you an extra 10 minutes, I hope nobody recognized it. And uh, now uh, the, our next uh, um, book presentation is from uh, Aidan McGarry. And I would like to find his, um, uh, yeah, really? OK, sorry, I missed that. Uh, so then I think it's yours, right? So yeah. the floor is yours. and. I will be very generous uh, with time with you I'll again. I'll try to be, I'll <laughs> Don't try to, 12 minutes, like 10 minutes. Let's see how I go. So it was 20 in the end? I'm sorry, it's in time. Oh no. Well, it's good. <laughs> uh, I only saw I the five it. minutes, so I didn't plan <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I realize it's been a, a long uh, few sessions, so I'm going to try and keep it as um, on time as possible. I'm Eden McGuire. I'm a um, professor of um, international politics, so I'm a political scientist, um, so please do not hold that against me. Um, I'm kidding, you can of course hold that against me. Um, but uh, I've been working with Roma communities for about 20 years and I've written uh, several books on the topic. One looked at uh, Who Speaks for Roma and the, another is called uh, Romaphobia, the last acceptable form of racism. Um, and today I'm gonna talk about um, my new book which is called Political Voice, um, Protest Democracy and, and Marginalized Groups which is gonna come out in, um, in about two months time with OUP. Um, and the book looks at the relationship between protests, social movements, and democracy, and, and the particular agency of, of different marginalized groups. And in it, I develop a theory of voice, um, and I explain what voice is. And, and voice, when you think about voice, you, you think it's a sound. It is, and of course it is that. It is um, the, the compression of air through a larynx, and, and that is what a, a noise emits. But what I look at is something which is much more kind of symbolic and, and collective in, in its orientation. Um, and I apply this to two particular case studies. One is um, kind of queer activism in India. Um, and the other is Roma mobilization in Central and Eastern Europe, which is where most of my research has been um, in the past. Um, so just to begin, I mean, the, the book starts from the observation that democracy is in crisis, which nobody will be kind of shocked about. You know, we have rising voter apathy, rising authoritarianism around the world, increasing societal polarization. But the main problem with democracy is that um, people just do not feel that it works. 
people do not feel that they are able to be represented, that, that they are not really participate, able to participate, and that they do not have um, a kind of meaningful agency um, in their lives. And a big part of the problem with democracy is that it is built on utilitarian principles, which means a kind of a, the, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. And this means that some groups are actively marginalized and excluded, including Roma, but other um, groups and communities um, too. And this is a form of, of state violence. Um, I argue that the articulation of political voice, and the political voice is not just something that exists, it has to be articulated, it has to be expressed. It is a performance which enacts particular worldviews, revealing silenced uh, kind of knowledge and experiences and positionalities um, and, and meanings um, and ideas. Um, and a lot of what I look at is, is the kind of the spectrum of, of political voice and its various actions, it's, but it's always collective and it's always um, public. So it could include demonstrations and, and graffiti and, and sit-in and boycotts, but also cultural artifacts and, and artistic expressions, symbols, gestures, um, and so on. But Political voice is a rupture to the existing political order. It is um, a challenge. It is a refusal to accept the status quo. And it's, um, this is what I ultimately am looking at. Um, one of the main uh, inspirations for this book is the, the writing of Audre Lorde. Um, and she argues that, you know, or she argued that if, you do, if we do not speak up, then there is a tacit acceptance in the status quo. Um, and she said, I have come to believe over and over again that what is most important to me must be spoken, made verbal and shared, even at the risk of having it bruised or misunderstood, that the speaking profits me beyond any other effect. So this is the kind of the realization of the human condition. What it means to be human is to speak up and also to refuse um, any form of injustice or disrespect. She warns against staying silent as inaction nurtures fear, and she says it's ultimately a betrayal to oneself. And she said, what I regretted most were my silences. My silences had not protected me. Your silence um, had not, will not protect you. Um, and she, she basically makes the argument that, that we must speak up no matter what the consequences. And she gives different examples. Like, you know, by speaking up and speaking out, you could be denied, you could be silenced, you could be humiliated, you could be held in contempt, you could be erased, you could be put in jail. Um, but it must be done. It is something that is our, it our, is our duty. And she also talks about this kind of paradox of visibility. And we heard about different examples of hyper-visibility, which sometimes uh, Roma communities um, endure a hyper-visibility in media and, and in politics sometimes. But the, this visibility um, is about kind of controlling the narrative of that visibility and controlling the kind of content of that particular narrative um, um, in order to kind of, yeah, to, to kind of challenge uh, different forms of injustice. So what I spend a lot of time doing in the book is defining um, what, I'm, what I mean by political voice, and I reduce it to kind of these three core elements, autonomy, representation, and constitution. Um, and these are not uh, kind of, this is not a zero-sum game between these different elements. More autonomy does not mean less constitution, but they're always in dialogue, they're always um, being contested. Um, but these fundamental elements are always there with political voice. Um, and so autonomy is the freedom to articulate, to express opinions, and also to make demands. It does not necessarily mean that those demands will be met or will um, be addressed, but it is, it is about kind of seizing the reins and, uh, and, and writing and rewriting the script, and it is ultimately the realization of agency. Um, representation is visibility and presence in public life. It has a, a more of an external orientation. It communicates particular demands. Um, but the most important thing with representation is that it requires interaction and reaction of exogenous actors. So basically, it means that there has to be some sort of recognition or response from other actors, be they you know, mainstream political parties or media or the majority or the state itself. And finally, constitution refers to creation and existence of a group. And this is when actors collectively speak themselves into being and not that doesn't mean that they didn't exist before, but they speak themselves into being as political subjects and as political formations. Um, and this has much more of an internal orientation. So it's about the groups kind of defining who are we, what are we about, um, and, um, and it's kind of more of an in, yeah, internal orientation um, that it is based on. 
Um, so uh, now I'm just going to very briefly look at each autonomy, representation, and constitution in the case of Roma. Uh, first of all, uh, autonomy. Um, in Europe, um, Roma are frequently the target of right-wing populist and nationalist, I would actually say more nativist um, discourse, where they are frequently constructed as an unwanted presence who do not kind of belong in and to the dominant nation. There was a series of um, far-right attacks in 2018 in Ukraine. Um, uh, this was when neo-Nazis attacked Roma housing um, and settlements, resulting in, in deaths, as well as in Italy. Um, and this was um, under Matteo uh, Salvini, um, who wanted a, a census and a deportation of Roma groups. Um, Salvini at the time was the interior minister and deputy um, prime minister, which he still is. Um, so in response to both of these, and there was a series of, of protests um, in nine different countries. Um, and the largest was in, in Bucharest, in Romania. And this is the, the example that you see here um, in the photograph. And uh, Cipria Nicola, who some of you will know in this, in this room, um, he was one of the organizers, co-organizers of this. Um, and in an interview I did with him, he told me that the, the primary objective was, um, of these protests was about visibility and to show that through collective action that the government's inaction or failure to adequately condemn racism was in and of itself um, racist. Um, but the purpose was visibility. And in terms of their kind of action repertoires, they engaged in this march with kind of banners, and you can kind of see there's a reclaiming of public space, which is really important for different marginalized groups to, to do. Um, and with the kind of reclaiming of public space, you gather the, the materiality of the city, you gather, you occupy space, you take up space, and you confront others the majority of your existence and you demand a response because of it but it's very powerful um, and they you know they other action repertoires in, in engaging in chants the lane of flowers symbolic flowers as well as a, a minute's um, silence in terms of representation um, this is an example on the the photograph that you see is uh, from 1971 this is the very first um, um, World Romani um, Congress, where the flag and the Roma anthem were, were created. This is in London. Um, and when we think about representation, there are examples of representation through political parties, but it's quite narrow and it's harder to find. But civil society is the most obvious place to find this. Um, it offers probably the best opportunity to, to be heard, um, to articulate particular demands around, say, access to health or, or housing or to combat Roma phobia. Um, and the international political community has been crucial um, in this regard to help to provide a platform um, to amplify voice, primarily through civil society, for example, um, Irgo in, in, um, in Brussels. Um, but, of course, they can always be ignored. And this is the kind of part of the problem with civil society is that um, with all kind of minority and subaltern um, people, um, you know, and this, this quote from Ishmael Cortez, who is a former um, MP from Spain, um, basically makes the argument that um, it's all well and good to articulate a voice, but if you're not at the table, if you're not at the policy-making table in a kind of local and, and national context, then you can ultimately um, be ignored. And one of the, the issues that I look at, uh, that I focus on in terms of representation is that a lot of uh, Roma civil society are in, engaged in service provision because they're providing services that the state should be providing. Um, and this means that that energy and that time is taken up doing that rather than mobilizing and organizing in other ways. And, and finally, um, constitution. So constitution is to create, to establish. As I mentioned, it is the realization um, of agency. Um, so it's the, the, the creation of, of a, a Roma collective identity, affirming who Roma are, but also acknowledging that this is sometimes difficult um, with Roma communities because of geography, because of heterogeneity. Roma are not a homogenous block of kind of 10 to 12 million people. There is, you know, they are, um, you know, across, um, across Europe, all over the world, um, different languages and religions and, and so on, and, and different experiences, whether in a, in a, uh, under communist regimes or, in, uh, or elsewhere. Um, and all of this makes it much more uh, of a challenge to, um, to build a collective agency. Um, there have been efforts to do this, of course, um, some more successful than others. There was the Declaration of the Roman Nation um, at the fifth meeting of the World um, Romany Congress in, in Prague. And issues around kind of victimhood come up, um, you know, sort of kind of past victimhood and present victimhood, and also how to negotiate and, and overcome this is a persistent challenge, also relating to, um, to the Holocaust. Um, 
And, and yeah, I have a few quotes from, from different act activists um, and public intellectuals who kind of talked about, um, you know, we know that we are incredibly diverse and this is the source of our, our richness, according to, to Anna Mirga. Um, and she says that, you know, our identities um, are, are fluid, they are not fixed. And this is a, a source of strength. Um, and Jelko Jovanovic from OSF said, we need to resolve this disunity amongst Roma communities to organize a significant and potent political voice with political structure and an impact. And I think that mass self-organization or, um, is ultimately a necessity. Um, okay, and so just to conclude, um, for me, political voice is a rupture to the, exist, to the, to the status quo. It is an act um, with consequences. Um, it also impacts on internal identity processes and, and solidarity. So it's about the ability to make demands as well as to, to realize um, autonomy and, and collective agency. And just to pull in some of the broader kind of thinking around the articulation of voice, I think that it's really about um, you know, a realization of kind of the human condition. According to um, Adriana Carrero, she says that it's a voice is about being an irritable self, about giving um, to speak of one's existence. Um, and according to Judith Butler, it is to give an account of oneself. So it's kind of fundamental to, to kind of speak up and speak out. Um, and the content of that is, is kind of part of it, but it's, it's more the kind of the, the agency that underpins it, which is really crucial. And to bring this back to, to democracy, you know, I think ultimately um, struggle, resistance, mobilization, uh, and prote protest, they're fundamental principles of a healthy democratic society. You can have a democratic society uh, without these things, but it will not be a healthy uh, democratic um, society. And marginalized groups who are actively excluded um, need to be a part of that. Um, and finally, political voice reveals meaning, knowledge, experiences, and positions which would remain um, hidden or, or silenced um, otherwise. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Aidan. It was just 15 minutes, so. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, uh, I, I, I think I stopped joking, uh, and I would like to invite uh, Maria Atanasova um, to give uh, your insight about uh, these two books, or the topics of these books. Um, can I just... You can, oh, yeah, I'll of I'll course. Suggest, yeah, I just enjoy <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Okay. Um, is it on? Okay. Um, so, thank you. Ah, thank you. Yeah. So hello, uh, hello everyone. Um, I firstly want to thank you, uh, Magda, for the invitation, and to our uh, speakers for uh, both of presenting both of the books. Um, this is this is such an honor for me. I'm really really happy um, to get to know more about um, the books and and the conference because the topic itself it's um, I'm very interested in it but um, also it's very close um, at heart. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, before going into more um, academic and scholarly work, I, I worked as a midwife in Bulgaria and Eastern Europe. And earlier today, um, our panelists already talked about uh, racialized violence in hospitals. So my first encounter with state violence and um, Romania, actually, uh, people experiencing violence was in Eastern European state hospitals. And that was one of the reasons that led me to ask further more political questions rather than clinical ones. So this is why I'm, I'm here today. And um, so I was able back then to conceptualize, to understand actually violence and to see it before even being able to grasp the concept of it as state violence. So that is why it's, it's super personal and I'm really happy um, to be here. Um, also in remarks, in, in regard to today's um, topic, um, I'm glad to see the two dimensions. One of it is the contemporary violence and the other one like the historical ones. Um, because as we've already seen um, the multiple examples um, from the contemporary, I would like to thank Ari for the wonderful um, presentation and the book. I'm quite familiar with uh, both of our presenters um, uh, scholarly work. And because Ari's book is bringing us back to the unrecognized and untold stories of um, the Romani sufferings during the Holocaust, 
Um, and that's, I learned it again way later in my life um, that Roma people were part of the genocide. And not being able to, to know gr growing up and graduating and then you learn that your ancestors were uh, persecuted and they were part of a genocide. So that comes as a, as a culture of shock. And um, yeah, so like my own um, the devoting time of learning and studying uh, within the um, uh, violence experienced by racialized community, it's my own exploration of um, and my own personal healing to, to, to this um, topic. So thank you uh, again for, for, for the wonderful um, uh, book. Um, so two dimensions, historical and contem contemporary one. Um, going back to the historical one, uh, it's very important to give this visibility and understanding, um, acknowledgement um, of Romani sufferings but then contemporarily as well, to be able to express the political voice, to be able to have this agency to talk about, um, as this conference is doing today, um, discussing exactly both, both dimensions. Um, it is very crucial, not only because it does justice historically, but also I believe that with, if you're not recognizing and just passing through it, we are doing more injustice to the topic and to and the Romani communities. Um, I would, yeah, I think I will conclude and rather um, ask more questions and give more space um, for the discussion. Um, so I have a couple of question, um, questions. So my first one is, what role do um, the shared experiences of persecutions play in shaping current anti-racist and solidarity efforts uh, among racialized communities. Um, and second one, how can we ensure um, equitable recognition of and memorization uh, of marginalized communities, especially those um, that we consider um, ungrievable? Yeah, thank you. Can, can you repeat the last one? Sorry. Yes, um, how can we ensure that communities, sure. yeah, um, equitably um, memorialized and, and, and acknowledged and their sufferings. Um, yeah, so when it, when it comes to, so I mean, I, I, I've, I've been, I had been thinking about, a lot about, about the, the ways different, different, different um, communities also, um, well, have have been overlapping in, in in their in their interest in what made Jews and Roma actually come 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 together, and and ultimately well, the, the, I, I drew conclusions based on the alliances they can have otherwise, um, uh, and the spaces they have for these alliances. And this is an amazing space for alliances that that don't exist everywhere. However, I would say, um, and uh, and so I I I think I can speak more about that. I, I, I also think when if we think about the way I actually have conceptualized it is that the, the, I mean I understand why in this context the liberal state is is the enemy often um, and, and or can be redeemed uh, in, in, in in both cases, but but my sense has been that that alliances so solidarity between especially for Jews and Roma alliances seem to work best where um, where there's a sense that the liberal state is actually falling apart and that that it's um, you know. I'm saying hungry, <laughs> um, uh, where and and the, a shared understanding. Um, how to um, how to ensure that things are that that that, that suffering is equitably uh, r remembered. So in a, in a way, um, I, I believe to be so, so. One thing I try to do is is to to think in honest ways about resources. Um, because I feel that's that's a topic we don't we don't address. It's in a sense we well, we don't often address it when we have the microphone in front of us, but we spend our days writing grant proposals. Um, so we do it. We both do it all the time. <laughs> um, 
but then because we are completely aware <laughs> of the fact that that um, you know you either need need funds or need to self exploit, which ultimately is also a form of of, of, <laughs> of resources <laughs> that are being used. Um, but however you you spin it, so both hyper aware and and at the same time not aware. So I think the creation of be, being very active, um, and I guess this comes to the constitution part actually that, that Aidan mentioned as well. Constitution, not just of an abstract group, but of institutions. I, I, I sort of, as I was writing this this book, I, I think I became more more aware. I became, I became more of a fan of institutions, which again can be an easy enemy. And institutions are messy and and and, and etc. But if, I, if if I look at, at recent Romani efforts, um, you you can see the role that 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 very traditional state-funded institutions, in fact, have in Germany. The Central Council. Of, of, of Sinti and Roma, of German Sinti and Roma, um, which now houses some projects that started out with project funding, um, we can like Rom archive, um, so to, you know we're, we had, had had everything you would imagine to be both sort of temporary, first activist based, uh, diverse in their background, but ultimately it gets bound back to survive, to to a place where. Uh, you know, where, where there's permanent some some, per, some permanence of funding, um, and I, th I I feel actually one one of the, the tricky things that I haven't he heard here as much, which is good, is is there this sort of I, th I think perhaps the the romanticism with the internet and democracy has gone away because there is an I think there is one reason that people have been thinking too little about funding is the illusion that uh, the internet is free, and well you know. I can just put the voice of these people on the internet <laughs> and it'll be there forever. A, that's not. You do still need to curate and, uh, and, and retain websites, as some of you might know from websites that still existed when I started working on the book and don't anymore. I mean, it's just, it's just, they just don't stay around. Um, and, and the second is that we, we become the, the voice of the, so often the voice of the the voice of the subaltern is mediated through an algorithm, um, and uh, and I think that that is is tricky too. And, and traditional institutions, at least, have rules we can discuss and criticize. At least you can protest, <laughs> which which is mu much harder um, for uh, you know the, the algorithm that lets you use it, you use use the services for free. Uh, yeah, well, I want to. I'll just uh, take on the. The question about the, the shared experiences of uh, of persecution um, in shaping solidarity efforts, I think that um, persecution is often um, it's an expression of, of power. It's um, and it fulfills a very particular um, function. But usually, um, persecution comes from a kind of a common actor or agent. Um, usually, the state, but but not always. Um, and so I think different, um, there's always the opportunity for solidarity because it's usually a common enemy, which is, or a common kind of um, power holder, which needs to be challenged. Um, and there's strength in numbers, there's strength in kind of building alliances with other groups. Um, and not only across kind of racial lines, but in, in, I think across intersectional lines as well. So kind of feminist struggles and, and homophobia and, and, and so on, you know, um, that kind of language and discourse, um, I think, um, creates stronger kind of communities. And then you support one another, I think, in those very, those very same endeavors, because it's, it's ultimately the same kind of challenge that, the, that these um, various groups um, are playing. But yeah, I think that the I think as long as we kind of focus on the the cross cutting um, commonalities, then there's always that potential, you know. Um, and, and it has worked um, at different times as well, particularly for Roma. Um, thank you for both of you. Um, um, I'm not sure if we have time that if I if I can contribute to this discussion, but maybe just one <laughs> thought. Um, when it comes to representation and the gentle criticism about uh, social media that we got from Arioshkovic. And I think it's very important to keep it in mind uh, that representation is constitutive, as uh, our great uh, teacher Stuart Hall once said, uh, and that means that uh, when a discourse is uh, constructed that you are doing now with your book and here we doing now, 
uh, it's very important to pay attention that it's going to be challenged. And uh, then we have to be prepared for, uh, for this uh, process uh, to become uh, a process again. And then uh, another discourse will be constructed and then it's going to be challenged. And this is our word. This is how we, we are uh, getting deeper in our understanding of our life. Thank you so much. We have 10 minutes for Q&A. So I'm going to uh, stop now. <laughs> Uh, but we could go on and on with this discussion. And I just wanted to really interfere here because I don't want to, the, especially our young students, to think uh, so negatively about the power of social media, especially in Roma context, because uh, that's where we are basically fighting our war most of the time. And now I open our Q&A session, which uh, we have uh, 10 minutes uh, only for that, so here the floor is for the audience. Yeah, one, yeah. <laughs> two, maybe two is enough. All right, thank you so much. This has been such an amazing panel and an amazing day of, of speakers. Um, so I have a question that could actually go to, to either uh, principal speaker, but um, it has to do with the construction of the political voice and the mediation of the political voice. And so I'm thinking of the fact that it is very often assumed, first of all, that voice equals agency, mm -hmm. and that this is, just, this is just something that circulates a lot in, in the media and political discourse. And then secondly, that the voice that is, that, that voice is coterminous with the source of the emitter. And I'm thinking in terms of how, how voices get taken up and reproduced and circulated, often beyond the context of their original enunciation. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a lot of problems that arise with this kind of thinking, um, especially when we think about how, how voices do get plucked out of context and used for, to different ends, and that people's voices are made to represent certain things. So I'm wondering how each of you are considering the mediation of voices um, and both the, the potential problems that can arise with this kind of mediation, as well as the possibilities that that, that can engender as well. Okay, I think we collect and then, mm -hmm. so second question and then, okay, that's too much. So we're going to have <laughs> maybe three questions for this session and then it's going to be okay. Okay, so the, here, okay. Yeah, you were, you were the second one, yeah. Um, Ari, I think you, you, I think you started to talk with, you said competing memories, if that's the, and, and I love that framing <coughs> and then you, gave the description of that and then talked about the grave diggers of the, the Jewish grave diggers and, and you kind of connected to the dead bodies and, and the kind of sharing of that. Uh, that was very graphic and very poignant. I would like you to kind of go a little bit much more deeper or, or just tell more that because I think the kind of affinity or solidarity or sharedness and here we are seeing one dead and the next about to be dead. This kind of near end, almost at the life, there is this light, but I don't know if it's gonna spark, it's gonna end at some point. I just want you to reflect on that. Okay, we have the gentleman uh, in the back and then you, Anita, and then I think we should uh, close <laughs> the questions, I'm sorry. <laughs> You can take up afterwards as well. You can take up afterwards. Yeah, yeah, well. yeah, we can, yeah, there. Oh, oh, okay, so this is a question for Aidan McGarry. Mm -hmm. You're talking about voice and demands. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out that when you make demands, mm -hmm. the, the impl th there is an implicit threat behind the demands. Mm -hmm. And that inspires backlash and anger, mm -hmm. as, opposed, as opposed to making, you know, uh, uh, something short of a demand that, that is a uh, request, uh, you know, I, I understand that, I mean, and, and so that's a difficulty with, with voice because, I mean, I, I, was, I was involved in some of the student occupations during the Vietnam War, mm. and, and we, they, we, I was partly in, partly out, they, they were saying, these are our demands, and that, that infuriated the police, and it, infuri it inspired a, a huge backlash. And we've been experiencing that backlash for probably the last 50 or 60 years. So I, I mean, with all due respect, 
maybe you might want to change the, 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 I mean, voice doesn't always have to include demand. Or, or if, you, if so, then you need to indicate what the consequences of uh, failure to, to, to enact a demand would, would be as far as you're concerned. That would be bargaining as opposed to leaving, leaving it open. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. And then you, Anita, and then I close the question session and you can continue <laughs> in the bar. Uh, Thank you, Maria. Um, don't worry about it. Is it? No? Okay. Um, I hesitate to even intervene because, of course, mine is going to be a comment, not a question. But I'm just thinking about, um, you know, we're talking a lot about, like, the infrastructures of knowledge production. I know, Ari, that's, like, something you've been thinking a lot about in this book. Um, and it's just, you know, reflecting on the whole day and, and participating and listening to everybody talk a lot about sort of the invisibility of Roma and the silences about um, Romani history and needing to sort of give voice um, to Romani history and, and, and in this kind of counter hegemonic way um, against these sort of, you know, mainstream or hegemonic histories. Um, and I just wanted to like think a little bit about like Corn Dr. Cornell West's idea of the band in relationship to um, historical narrative and think about the fact that injecting Romani history into hegemonic history is not simply about like giving voice to the subaltern, but it's actually like allowing the whole, the whole music to play. Because if we don't have like the drummer in the band, the, sound, the song doesn't sound the same way. And I just wanted to kind of mention that because I think a lot of the time, um, the way that we consist consistently sort of like um, other and make um, sort of fetishize the alterity of these um, subaltern histories doesn't sort of um, demonstrate that really what we're doing is giving a more complete version of history. Um, so I just wanted to put that out in the room. And then I have a very nitty gritty question for Aiden that you can choose not to answer if you don't want to. But um, this quote from Jellico, where he's talking about this need to um, to almost like erase the disunity of, of the Roma in order to like have a cohesive, sort of internally cohesive political unit um, on the basis of which you can make sort of demands of um, you know the European Union or other sort of governmental. How do you negotiate that, or do you talk about that in your book and problematize it in the sense of like, again, with what Dr. Cornell West was talking about and how this sort of insidious nature of nationalism and then how that's being sort of replicated in some of the um, strategies that uh, marginalized communities use in order to appeal to the state with its own logics? Um, if that's something that you think about, I'd be curious what thoughts you have. Thank you. Okay, uh, I give you. So we have, I'll, I'll we have five <laughs> minutes, guys, and then we have to okay. close. Okay. Uh, I'll do the, the the last one first because I, I can remember it. So I think um, social movements throughout history have always been heterogeneous, heterogeneous and it's been. Uh, you know, if you look at kind of women's movements and, and others, you know, there's always been that kind of complexity, that heterogeneity, and to expect it from Roma, I mean, why, you know, in a way, kind of, why would you? Um, I do think that there is a danger there because, you know, the organisations like the European Union and others um, want to make uh, a, a group of people more legible, like, like James Scott kind of argues. Um, and I just, I don't really think that it works. It works in kind of policy making, but, but that's, it's very functional. And I don't think that is, that isn't the, the reality. So I understand the need to kind of do that, but I, you know, I think there's a lot of resistance um, to that as well. Some, you know, it's like a lot of policy making is quite box ticking anyway. It's like, oh, well we consulted, but then they just do whatever they want anyway. So um, I would be a bit more kind of skeptical um, about that, but I, I understand, oh, I shall, shall go um, made the call. Um, regarding, demands and and so on i mean i would say that just because the police are upset about it i mean okay like really i don't think that that's a bad thing you know it's to make to make demands um is is to make an uh, an assertion and to make uh i mean you could call it it could be a a request or it could be a claim but i don't think that that's necessarily um a bad thing and and as i mentioned you know uh, a voice the articulation of voice is a, is an act with consequences it should be um 
And again, if you look at kind of other social movements um, that have succeeded and failed, like Occupy, for example, Occupy was um, it made no demands, and uh, and that was also kind of part of their their kind of strategy. With Roma, there are very clear demands, um, and and there and there needs to be. Um, so I don't think that um, even if there is a potential backlash or anger, you know, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, and finally, on the construction of voice, yeah, I mean, on the, sorry, the mediation of voice, yes, I think uh, I actually have a section in the book which talks about the authentic voice and the, the fallacy of the, the, the authentic voice and where this, uh, where this comes from, because even if you look at particular organisations, it's still, well, how do you really know, you know, what does that mean? to be represented and to, to represent others. Like if you look at the work of Hannah Pitkin, you know that it doesn't ever kind of work. But the notion of voice and how it's kind of picked up and distorted, especially on social media, there's a cacophony of voices. And I think that the, the voice of Roma is also picked up and used against, um, like with other groups as well, you know, picked up particularly right by the far right. Um, but the, again, I don't think that that's a, anything that it's just a reality. There's nothing really that can be done about that. So yeah. Hey. Thank you, that was very fast. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, and uh, in the meantime, somebody take a photo of us. This is legendary here. Okay. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask uh, Ari Yoshkovic to respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, 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 I'll do my best too, to end us on a, on a sad note. Um, so um, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll take up the, the, the question of, uh, so you, you said just more of this, this interaction you'd hear, which probably gives me a, a chance to also answer your question, or, or the original question about shared experiences uh, in a better way. Um, because, uh, so I, I, I am, it's, you might have sort of grasped that already from the, the things I did describe, that I'm, that I'm not as optimistic about shared experiences and intersectionality as, as others are. When it comes to, um, to, to the other interactions during the period of genocide, there is a paradox that I noticed. So there are people who are witnesses at a distance. That includes eyes, so hearing, smelling, but especially, so it's seeing, seeing, which is dominant in every testimony that is judicial, because they need that. Smelling, which is in a, stronger in memory, and sound. And sound is actually one of the dominant ones. Um, hearing the other scream and indistinct screams. And those are like, the, the, I've, I've, so many of these testimonies, especially as, as, as the perpetrators are trying to obscure what is happening. It is, sound is the only thing that will, will travel sometimes. But what you can hear here already, well, what, can you, what you can guess when you hear that all you hear are indistinct screams is you don't know anything about these people. The fact that you, so th there are strong expressions of solidarity that come after the war from people who experience things that they cannot interpret well and just shock them deeply. But they don't know the names of the people they, who were killed. They don't even know which language they spoke. They're guessing. Um, they have crazy theories sometimes about who was dying, in fact. Um, so the people who, but there are others who are interacting with each other. But when they are interacting with each other, it's on the Nazis' terms. It's because one group is forced to manage the other group. So you get the paradox that the people who actually have overlapping experiences are the ones who often have more ambivalent, deeply complicated memories sometimes of those were the types of people who would hit, hit me. Um, so um, yes, the experiences are there, but it's never straightforward. It becomes much clearer in the work done afterwards, but not simply the experience of, of, of persecution, even when it's really so clearly next to each other, I would say. Um, so, um, I'll get to the to, to Sif's qu question, which was I thought it was such an amazing precision also in how you how you put it. Voice is not agency. I mean, you asked this as a question, which suggests it is not. And I, I thought that was very nicely done, and it actually allows me to respond to your need to the, to the comment part, and to pick up the, the wonderful metaphor about the band, <laughs> um, because I, I think it's right. So it is mediated, 
Um, I am generally been interested in, uh, in, in interviewing interviewers more than interviewing victims. Uh, I uh, would say that what we sometimes perceive as testimony is in reality a dialogue, even if the person asking questions and initiating the dialogue is not visible in the camera. And indeed, there is an invisibility. And my level of thinking about the band has been not so much about what music is being played, because I feel we've had a good amount of analysis of the music. I want to know who, put up the, who, who arranged the venue, who's the sound engineer, and who's cleaning up later. Um, so uh, it's the invisible people, like the wonderful people back there, actually, who are <laughs> helping us, right, to, who remain invisible so that we can be visible in a way. And so, uh, so thank you also. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so because that is the institution, right? That this is, this is what, what is in the background and who has access to that. And, and yes, that's all, if, and we, we speak so much about the invisibility in voice, but, but what is also really invisible is often the context, the system that makes it visible. Um, even though, again, it, it, once you write about it, I feel, given how much we understand the need of resources, et cetera, it becomes, it becomes unclear actually why, <laughs> why it is so, so invisible to us often. Thank you for your response, Ari. And well, we could go on. I also have some comments now, but um, I think let's continue in the bar. And, and I thank you so much for witnessing this panel. This is our first time here, right, Maria? And um, I hope we, we're going to see you again sometime soon. And this was an amazing day. And thank you, Cornel West, for sitting here with us and listening to us. And, uh, and thank you for your wisdom. And also, um, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna just make it short and sweet. Thank you um, to everyone who, all of our panelists, our keynote speaker, our team, and all of you for coming here today because just by showing up, you are engaging in conversation. And on that note, we can continue our conversations. So you go out the door and you just take a right and our reception, um, everyone is welcome to food and drink and merriment. Food means life, so let's celebrate that. And tomorrow, Saturday, April 6th, um, Ralph Yusuf, there's a concert um, at BU. So if you go back to our event page, you can get all of the details. The pre-concert lecture and interview is at 7 p.m. and then the actual concert is at 8 p.m. and you're welcome and they would love to see you there. Thank you so much and have a wonderful spring. Bye. Even though the sun's not out. <laughs> <laughs>